The Cinders of Dezu Written and read by Oliver Tonic Listen and come with me on this odyssey. It's a new journey to find out old secrets buried in the world of a tyrant king, a missing girl, and a powerful yet oppressed people. Dezu is a place that can turn you into a legend, but it's haunted by a story that turns legends into ashes. Individual chapters or episodes of this same story can be found on my channel, Tonic Torrents, along with a playlist. This is the entirety of those episodes in one video for those of you who want to hear it uninterrupted from beginning to end. If you enjoy it, please like and subscribe. Also, you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Tonic Torrents. I'm trying something new by releasing my audiobook works for free, just so the stories can be out there and enjoyed unencumbered by paywalls. But if you feel so inclined to pay for this as you would a regular book, you can support this story and my continued writing through Patreon or Buy Me a Coffee. It helps me out immensely in the writing and performing of my work. The details are in the description. But if not, I appreciate you just coming to visit my little world. Your listening ear is priceless to me. So now, without further ado, please enjoy The Cinders of Dezu. Chapter Zero Glass Root Elixir The night was descending quickly. The man tried to scribble something heartfelt on the piece of paper he had laid awkwardly on the wooden box in his lap. He wasn't always good with words. At least, he wasn't good at the kinds of words that said what was on his heart. He was plenty good at the words he needed to sell. It was probably because of how his own father had been. Cold, distant, hardly there. He had promised himself he would never be that way. So as he sat now atop his wagon that he had just ridden out of town, he struggled to put his feelings on the page. He had to. His horses waited patiently as he worked out what exactly he wanted to say. He had spent all day thinking about it and still couldn't come up with more than the few words he had had in his head. And now it was getting too dark to write much more before he went home with his gift. He finally jotted down something quickly and then tucked his pencil in his overcoat. He didn't know if it was good enough, but at least it was something. And sometimes it's all that mattered. He lifted the lid of the box just enough to slip the note inside and close it up. He put it on the seat next to him and clapped his hands together. He cupped them over his face to warm them through his fingerless gloves before he grabbed the reins of his horses. He then stopped. Just ahead on the road was the figure of a man. The figure was tall, with a cloak draped over his shoulders. He wore a breastplate with intricate markings that he couldn't quite make out in the lighting. Flashes of red material were highlighted in his vision as he continued to squint to make him out. His breeches were black with the same highlights of red. He was facing him, standing totally still. The man on the wagon wondered how long he had been there. As he started to make out the shape of his face, the man spoke. Micah. The voice had youth in it. It was soft, but deep, and almost kind. He knew it all too well. My king. The man in the cloak approached. Micah shifted and dropped his reins, not knowing what stance he should take while sitting in a wagon. Please, came the king's voice again. No need to be anxious, I've come to you. As he drew closer, Micah could see his well-trimmed goatee and mustache, a signature known well throughout the kingdom. My lord, I'm completely at a loss, said Micah. I was just leaving town and had no idea you'd be in the area. The king cocked his head in the direction of the village. I just had some business in the local township that needed my attention. The day got away from me. Of course, said Micah, nodding. You're out late yourself, said the king. I hope you have a torch on that cart of yours. It's getting dark. Uh, absolutely. Micah quickly grabbed the box beside him and slipped it into a compartment behind his seat. He began rummaging around. He quickly located a torch and pulled it out. The king smiled and lifted his hand to gesture for Micah to hand it to him as he drew closer. 
Micah lowered the torch down, and the king took it and turned away. With his back to him, Micah could only see the glow of the torch manifest away from his gaze before the king turned back around and handed it back. A light for a ride? the king said. Ha! <laughs> said Micah. By all means, sir, please. He gestured to his seat. In the new light of the torch, a droplet of sweat was glistening as it ran down his cheek. The king swung himself up to the passenger's side as Micah placed his torch in the holster on the side of the wagon near the driver. He flicked the reins and set his horses off. Where to? There's a sanctuary not terribly far ahead. Even I don't like to be alone at this hour of the night, he said, scratching his chin. Speaking of which, what's your reason for risking it out this late? Micah cleared his throat and gave a nervous chuckle. Oh, you know, inventory. I get caught up checking things at the end of the day. What did you say? The day gets away from you? Mm-hmm. So is the life of a traveling peddler, I would imagine. Micah cleared his throat again. I'm surprised you remember me so well, sir. I wouldn't expect for the savior King Orion to know my name. He smiled and put his hand on his shoulder. How could I forget the famous Micah Tafferty? Charismatic peddler to the masses. Many know your name, I'm just another fan. Micah gave a stilted laugh. Please, your highness, I... No, no, you deserve the praise. You have goods no one else has, with a reach no one else possesses. I'd be a fool not to know who you are. Micah was giving a bashful smile, looking at the road. Well, I... Thank you, sir. I'm flattered. I mean, aren't you the one who makes that glass root elixir? It cures all kinds of things. Gives you a spring in your step? They say it makes an old man feel like a young man half his age. Micah smiled. Sure do. My slogan is, it makes 40 feel like 20 and 20 feel like 10. Take it too much younger and you'll be in the playpen. Orion chuckled as he reached for something in his pocket. He pulled out a bottle marked Tafferty's Glass Root Elixir. Micah's eyes widened as he watched him turn it over in his hands. Yeah, this stuff. I'm pretty sure no one else sells it. The king stared at it a while in silence. Micah kept his eyes on the road. He felt his ears growing hot. You know, it's probably because it's so hard to come by glass root, the king said. I've looked around and the only place within my borders to get it is high up in the Shimitai Mountains. Orion looked directly at his driver, who still had his eyes on the road. And frankly, I'm not sure how anyone would get up there without a serious trek with no small amount of dangerous and strenuous climbing. Micah's face was like stone. The king looked back at the bottle. And the sheer amount of it that would need to be brought down regularly? It just doesn't seem economically viable. They were both quiet with just the sound of the horses clomping and the rumbling of the carriage between them. The king laughed. <laughs> you must have some impressive distributors, huh? Micah found his muscles had tensed and began to release when the king gave him a hearty smack on the side of his arm. And loyal, too, the king said. Letting you corner the market like that? Turn right here. He pointed to a path not as well traveled. Micah blinked quickly and nodded with a solemn expression. Uh, yes, very loyal distributors. It wasn't long before the sanctuary was in sight. They were approaching it quickly when the king began to speak again. For such a popular fellow, you sure do lead a private life. When I ask around, no one seems to know if you have a business partner or some loved ones who help you out. Do you have a big family that you come from? A father trying to get you to pay off the wider family's debt? A demanding wife and kids? Micah was slowing down now. They came up to the entrance of the building and he shook his head. No, sir. No family to speak of. The king nodded and hopped down from the seat. A single man with single-minded ambition. I can appreciate that. He turned around to pat one of his horses. Lord knows I could have learned from your school of thought. The forest was quiet aside from the chirping of the birds in the trees. Even they were dying down as the dark continued its descent. The king kept stroking the horse while Micah continued watching him in silence. 
Well, he said, giving the horse one more pat. Enjoy your night, Micah. Happy peddling. He turned with a smile and headed into the stone sanctuary. Micah watched as he entered and closed the door behind him. Back on the main road, Micah was left with his thoughts. As the horse's trot and the padded dirt filled his ears, he considered his options. He could already hear the scurrying of predator and prey in some of the grasses nearby. His torch offered protection from the night, but he knew it wouldn't hold off the more aggressive things in the dark. He was gradually coming upon the familiar glow of a camp. It was off the road a bit into the trees, but it was surrounded by torches so he could see it clearly as he rode by. He knew he was far enough away that he could see them, but no one there could spot him in the dark beyond the light of the flames. He found his hands gripping the reins tight. He didn't want to keep going. His heart was sinking. He felt tears roll down his face. He swallowed hard as he clenched his jaw. He kept his pace, trying hard to keep his head facing straight forward. His eyes strained as they tried to catch as much of a glimpse as they could before the camp disappeared. By chance, a young man walked out from the tent and smiled in the direction of his mother, who was a bit obscured by a tarp. But he could still see she was clearly hunched over a bucket of water, working hard as she always was. Soon they were out of his peripheral vision and the glow began to fade. All that was left was the light of his torch again. He kept going. He didn't know how far he would take the wagon. Just farther down the road? He came upon a route to the left, so he took a hard turn. His horses huffed in frustration. Slowly the business in the trees grew more and more tumultuous. Leaves were being ruffled, scratches were made in the dirt, a whimper was heard, a twig snapped. Micah's eyes darted about trying to make out anything beyond the light of his torch. All he could see was the path ahead and first row of trees on either side. The branches seemed to be closing in on him as though the path was bottlenecking. He could feel his ears getting hot. Sweat droplets were beating on his receding hairline. His breathing was slow. He yanked hard on his reins, attempting to make the horses stop abruptly. They turned sharply into the trees and clipped the side of the wagon. Micah heard a loud snap of breaking wood at the same time as he found himself falling quickly toward the ground. He landed on his side and rolled a bit. He lifted his head just in time to see his horses running off into the darkness, dragging their broken hitch in tow. His eyes needed time to adjust. As they did, he realized his torch was out. It must have fallen and rolled through the dirt somewhere. He didn't feel any pain despite the ugliness of the crash. He could see the outline of his wagon wedged up against the tree he'd hit. He scrambled under the fractured vehicle and tried to slow his breathing. He sat in the dark, peering out into the trees. He hoped he could see something, anything, that would give him the signal to move if he had to. He prayed nothing would be on top of him before he could see its approach. His vision settled in the dark and the hair raised on the back of his neck. He got his wish. In the faintest of glows, he was able to make out two glowing eyes. Judging by their height off the ground and how close together they were, he knew he wasn't dealing with any four-legged beast. The creature stood erect. As Micah looked on, he could see the glow was smoldering like coals at the bottom of a campfire. The eyes hadn't found him yet. It was time to go. As quietly as he could, he slipped swiftly out from under the wagon. He realized he had hovered a bit as he did. The eyes were searching. Micah, on his feet now, lost visual with the glow as he was now eye-level with his broken wagon. He backed up slowly. First step was quiet, just soft dirt beneath his toes. The second step back encountered dead leaves. Not much sound. The third step broke a twig. Why was he doing this? He was caught now anyway. At this point, if he was going to make a break for it, he might as well pull out all the stops. Micah's feet both left the ground, and he levitated. He was inches above the earth beneath him. This would be totally silent. If he was caught on his feet or off of them, he was dead anyway. This way, he would at least have a fighting chance. He hovered backwards slowly. He held his hands behind him, trying to grab for something to get his bearings. Flying in the woods was always easier above the trees, and at night it was particularly troublesome. His fingers touched a tree trunk and he slipped himself past it deeper into the woods. He hovered over the dirt road and into the trees on the other side. 
He was putting distance between himself and the eyes, but he didn't dare move too much to the right or to the left. He figured he would stay out of the fiery line of sight if he stayed behind the wagon for as long as he could. That is, until it burst into flames. The forest lit up with the light of the blast. The wagon burned in a fury. Micah began gliding faster into the trees and decided now would be a good time to turn around to see where he was going. He darted through the tree trunks, weaving in and around them. He went as fast as he could within reason. He could only react so fast as the forest came at him. He was horizontal now, gliding through branches and avoiding the brush. The farther he got from the glow of the burning wagon, the harder it was to keep this up. All at once, he was stopped. A hand gripped tightly around his neck. Micah's body lurched forward at the sudden loss of forward momentum. He gagged and his muscles tensed from the pain. His hands scrambled to release himself. It was no use. The figure held him in front of its shadowy face. The glowing coals of smoldering fire looked deep into his eyes. A light appeared in the dark that lit them both up in full view. It came from the flames sprouting from the palm of the figure's other hand. Before him was the face of the king. His eyes returned to normal but were fixed with rage on Micah, whose face was bright red with strain. Micah managed to find enough space in his throat to choke out a few words. You aren't as subtle as you think. The king sighed. I don't know how hard I was trying. Subtlety isn't a strength of mine. His grip loosened a bit, but he still held him fast. Micah could feel the warmth of the king's hand growing the longer he was held. I know you have a family, the king said, probably with some half-bred children. I left it up to you to decide if you wanted to lead me to them and get this over with, or if you wanted to take the coward's way and drag this out for them even longer. Micah's nostrils flared. His feet began lifting him off the ground. The king tightened his grip again as his own feet began to slide. No, you don't, he said through gritted teeth as his handful of fire reached for a nearby tree branch. He held them steady as Micah held his forearm, trying to get him to let go. No, the running is over. You had the chance to spare your family the added grief. A life on the run isn't easy. Doing it without a father is even harder. But it's done now. You took the selfish route. More work for me. He pulled him to the ground until he was on his knees. The king's face had an unyielding coldness to it. He lifted Micah's head and straightened him up a bit before giving him his final decree. Micah Tafferty, you have been found guilty of willful endangerment of the people of Dezu. For this crime, you have been sentenced to death. Speak your last words and do not waste them on a plea. Micah's eyes were full of tears that began streaming down his face. He wept silently, but the flicker of the king's light showed defiance in his face. Long live a world where the white wolf won. A bright light could be seen over the tops of the trees from a mile away. A light that was gone almost as soon as it appeared. Chapter 1 Glistening Red Look, there are plenty of other games we could play, he said. The little girl looked up at him with pleading eyes. Please, Kai, I know what Dad said, but that crab was rude. They're usually more nice. Kind of. I'll be more careful this time, I promise. Cairo shook his head and looked out into the trees. We can't. Your dad said he doesn't want you getting hurt again. I'm supposed to be the responsible one. Rena looked down at the band-aid on her finger. It wasn't that bad. It doesn't matter how bad it was. Your dad said no. Rena grabbed his arms and jumped up and down. But it was so much fun. Cairo looked up to the sky and shook his head. Rena pleaded again. He won't find out. I won't tell him and I won't get hurt. I promise. Cairo sighed and looked down at his feet in the sand, rubbing pieces of bark littering with his toes. You're going to get me in trouble, Fluff. He closed his eyes for a moment to think. He finally relented. Fine, I'll go get the buckets. Raina's face lit up. Yes, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you. 
She squeezed him tight with her head barely reaching up to his chest. You're the best. Kyra rolled his eyes. Yeah, yeah, just don't make me regret this. He left and quickly returned with the two buckets. He placed them on the ground. Okay, the yellow one is yours and the orange one is mine. You remember the rules, right? The grayish ones are one point and the reddish ones are two. First to fill their bucket stands by it and stops the game, and then we count up our points. In the event of a crawler, we lose a point, unless we catch it again. Yes, yes, okay, I know, she said. All right, Cairo said, taking a running stance. Raina smiled and her eyelids squinted in playful determination. He took three quick breaths. Ready, set, go. The two of them darted off in different directions, kicking up sand as they went. It wasn't shaded so close to the water, so the sand was much hotter, but as soon as they reached the sand under the canopy of palm trees, it cooled considerably. Cairo's bare feet dug into the cool sand as he went. He kept hitting little pieces of bark and sticks buried underneath. It was the only other downside of being barefoot on the beach, next to the intense temperature changes. It wasn't long before he saw one. Its little gray pincers were being held up as it scurried across the ground. Its green, protruding eyes hadn't rotated to notice him yet, which was fortunate. Cairo took his thumb and middle finger and scooped it up on its head and its bottom. Its arms and legs flailed as he dashed back to his orange bucket. When he got there, he spotted Reyna with her hands in her yellow pail, scooting it closer to the tree line. Ah, no, he said, snatching it from her with the other hand. You play by the rules. They have to stay in the same spot next to each other. You beg me to do this. The least you could do is not cheat. Raina gave him a fake growl and ran back into the trees. Cairo looked into the bucket as he moved it back and saw the little red legs scrambling against the inside. Man, I am not losing to her again, he mumbled through his teeth. He dropped his catch in the orange bucket and headed back in. This went on for about a half hour. Raina saw the little green eyes searching for food underneath a palm tree. They didn't run fast, but it was always better to sneak up on them than to chase them. He went around the back of the tree out of the field of vision of the roving eyes. She knelt down and scooped him up gently. His legs dangled and his claws raised like they were looking for something to grab onto. Raina ran towards her yellow pail and was just about to drop it in when a voice came from behind her. Raina, what have I told you? Startled, Raina almost dropped her catch in the sand. She turned around. It was her father, Devin. He leaned down, snatching the creature from her hand. Raina put her hands behind her back. She kicked her foot behind her and dug her toe into the sand. Not to play with the crabs. And why? He said. Because I could get pinched. But Dad, that one was mean. They usually- No buts. I don't want to hear it, Raina. I don't want to see you messing with these things again. Cairo ran up with his crab in hand. He spotted Devin and quickly dropped it before it was seen. He stood next to his bucket while Raina kept trying to look unsuspecting. You hear me? said Devin, still looking at Raina. Yes, sir, she said. Devin looked over at the pails in the sand. And two buckets full? Goodness, child, you were going to lose a finger. He stood up and looked at Cairo. Were you watching her close? You didn't see her with these buckets? Cairo gave a cringe smile. That's a whole lot of crabs, he said. "Mm Mm-hmm, said Devin. Keep a better eye on her. She gets into this stuff. He sighed and looked at them both. It's time for food anyway. Come on up to the house. It's all ready to go. Devin headed off in the direction of the house. Cairo and Raina lagged behind but followed. They were watching him until he got out of earshot. You almost got me in trouble again said Cairo in a hissing whisper. I told you we couldn't play the crab game. Hey, I was the one who got in trouble, said Raina. Way to let me take the fall. You didn't get in trouble. You call that getting in trouble? Plus you had to take the hit. You're his little girl. What's he going to do, disown you? I just turned 18. I'm supposed to be the adult now. Otherwise, I'm just a grown man teaching his daughter to play hazardous beach games. Nice grown uping blaming everything on a little kid she said. Cairo rolled his eyes. Oh, so now you're a little kid. Look, this is your house. He's your dad. You're not going anywhere if he gets mad at you. I'm just on vacation by the good graces of my uncle. I can get voted off this island. The least you could do is get a slap on the wrist for your dear old cousin. 
his eyebrows raised. And don't think for a second I didn't see your whole Shirley Temple routine. He stopped walking and put his hands behind his back and dug his foot in the sand. His voice went high-pitched. Aw, gee, Dad, I don't know nothing about no crabs. Who's Shirley Temple? She asked. It doesn't matter. It's a code written in all you little girls. You know how to make hearts melt so you can get your way. Raina smiled as they kept walking. They were quiet, listening to their footsteps in the sand. Raina began to skip. Then she began to sing. Animal crackers in my soup. Monkeys and rabbits loop-de-loop. Cairo shook his head. What are you? Raina's teeth shone in her smile. Then she put her nose in the air and closed her eyes as she puffed out her chest. The daughter of a thespian. I think you're a demon, Cairo said. Raina slapped her hands on her cheeks and looked at him with a comically exaggerated show of offense. Cairo reflected it back to her with a gasp. They headed up the hill, tracing a path around the trees to a stone walkway, littered with bits of sand that led up to the door of a beautiful island house. It was mostly white-walled, with black pillars holding up the entrance as they approached it. As they entered, Devin was talking with his servants while they hustled and bustled about. They went inside and made their way to the dining room and kitchen where they prepared something that smelled delicious to Cairo. "'Can you grab Julian?' said Devin. "'He's in the—' "'Oh, I know where he is,' said Cairo. It was a perfect interception followed by a three-pointer when the door burst open and washed out the white jerseys and faces of the players. Ah, dude, too bright. It's the worst time for a glare, said Julian, pausing the game. He was sitting on a large couch, turning around to look into the light of the doorway. Cairo could see his eyes squinting like he was staring directly into the sun. Did you seriously turn off Knights of Ablasia for this? said Cairo. You know... Cool people like sports games. Cairo shook his head. I'm just saying, they could easily release a free patch every year and update the player stats. Maybe a couple dollars worth of DLC for new athletes? A new full game every year is a scam. They're scamming you. You know what? I don't like what you're saying. Also, I feel judged. You're judging me. Cairo scoffed. Devin has two rules. Be safe and we eat meals together. Otherwise, we can do whatever we want. Julian turned around and flopped his butt back on the couch. Lunchtime then, huh? I'm almost done with this quarter. How far did you get on nights before I left? Said Cairo, leaning over the edge of the couch, looking at the screen above them. The screen was massive. It went all the way up the wall they were facing and covered part of the ceiling. It reflected off of Cairo and Julian's eyes as they looked up at it, the commotion of the game commencing again. Let's see, you left like an hour and a half ago, and I started playing this immediately after, so can you please get rid of that glare? Cairo turned around and shut the door. You could have come with us, you know. Yeah, I could have, but you had to. Devin didn't ask me to take her outside and play. He asked the nephew, not the friend. Julian didn't take his eyes off the screen. Cairo rolled his eyes. We have a whole private island to ourselves, you know? You could take advantage of all it has to offer. Julian scoffed. Yeah, and you know what else this private island has to offer? An entire theater room to play video games. I think I'm taking advantage. Julian dunked as the buzzer went off. The instant replay started to play in slow motion. Nice, all right, let's go. He said as he dropped the controller and hopped over the back of the couch. They both left the room and began heading toward the dining room. So, who won the crab catch? What? I said we wouldn't play it. She can't play that anymore, said Cairo. You can't say no, dude. She gets you every time. Who won? Cairo's eyelids drooped and his lips turned up in a sarcastic smile. It was a tie, if you must know. They entered the dining room where the table was being set. Raina was already sitting in her spot. She had a knife and fork in her left and right hand, respectively, pounding the table like she was a cartoon. Devin walked in and sat next to her, placing a napkin on his lap. You boys ready to dig in? He said. Sure, what's on the menu? Cairo asked, taking his seat. Julian sat next to him. Devin sighed in satisfaction as the dishes were placed on the table before them. 
We have coconut shrimp with coconut rice, jerk chicken, festival, a leafy salad and grilled veggies, sautéed with jerk seasoning. I know no island is the same, but when I think of island food, I think of Jamaica, so here we are. He rubbed his hands together. The three looked at the spread, wide-eyed. Dig in, he said. The boys in particular could not contain their enthusiasm as they ate. Uncle Def, said Cairo. This is perfection. He smiled back at him with a mouthful. No, seriously, this is one of those perfectly satisfying experiences. I'm not exaggerating. All right, all right, said Devin. This isn't the food channel. No, nah, but he's right, though, said Julian with his mouth full. I can't even handle this. Devin laughed. So, first official day on the island. No more high school ever again. <laughs> yeah, said Julian, putting his hands in the air and rocking back and forth. Devin laughed. So think of this as a graduate's paradise. Virtually no rules, no parents. He turned to Raina briefly. Except for you, young lady. Raina folded her arms and smirked at him as she looked back at the boys. And I don't want you worrying about college, work prospects, none of it. Cairo smiled wide and nodded his head at his uncle as he continued. This is just two weeks of relaxing and zoning out with a touch of tropical adventure. I really want to thank you again, Devin, for letting me come out. I never thought I'd do anything like this, said Julian. Hey, you and Kyra are like brothers. Reyna's known you all her life. Honestly, I'm sorry it hasn't happened sooner. As far as I'm concerned, you're already family. Julian was beaming and looked at his best friend, who shrugged. It's just true. The dinner was over quickly, partly due to how good the food was and partly due to excitement for the next thing on the agenda. Kyra and Julian had been really anxious to go cliff jumping on the west side of the island. The water there was particularly pretty, so it was where you wanted to be in the evening as the sun went down. Large rock faces surrounded a cove where the water got deep quickly, not more than a few feet from the beach. Devin had Raina wear a life jacket, which she deeply resented. It was embarrassing being the only one swimming with one. Everyone had brought their chairs to set up in the sand, but Devin's was quite a bit larger as he began unfolding it. It was a lounge chair. Cairo scoffed. <laughs> you planning to do some sunbathing? Shut up, man. Devin laughed and smacked him on the shoulder. White folks ain't the only ones who can relax and lay out in the sun. <laughs> yeah, right. You've been uppity for too long. <laughs> well, I'm going to really trip you out with what I'm about to do next. Devin reached into his bag and pulled out a bottle. Sunscreen. Cairo shook his head. Wow, I'm about to confiscate your black card. Devin laughed out loud and popped open the cap. He gestured for Raina to come over. She looked and felt awkward as she kind of waddled over in her life jacket. Devin began applying the lotion to her arms. Ever since I got Raina, I've had to learn about these things. She needs it, and it turns out black folks need it too. You have been assimilated, Cairo said, narrowing his eyes. You're going to get cancer, said Raina. I'm not going to get cancer. I don't need it like you do. What are you, like, Asian-ish? I'm cancer-free. So am I. Not for long. Hey, you don't get to weigh in on this. Why, is cancer a sensitive subject for you? Raina was all lathered up and walking with Cairo toward the water as they continued back and forth. Devin watched them as he rubbed the sunscreen on himself. Can I get some of that? Julian said from behind him. He had finished setting up his chair next to Devin's. Sure, said Devin. Julian took the bottle and squeezed some out. I don't know if it has instructions for Mexicans on here, but I'll join the crowd. He sat down and began covering himself as Devin laid out and got settled. They sat there quiet for a bit with nothing else but the sound of the waves and Cairo and Raina's argument that had settled to a conversation off in the distance. Devin had his eyes closed, feeling the sun on his skin. Julian then spoke up. So, I don't mean to fanboy out on you or anything. Devin cracked a smile with his eyes closed. Mm-hmm. I've just gotta know. How is she? Who? said Dev. 
Corinne Moran, man, how is she? Oh, he gave a bit of a chuckle. Yeah, she's cool, real cool, hard worker, kind of a diva, but that happens a lot, kind of comes with the territory. Really? Why? Devin laughed. I don't know if diva is the right word. Let me renege that. She just has standards for the people she works with, and she insists upon those standards. Let's put it that way. Huh. Yeah, no, that sounds diva-ish. Devin still had his eyes closed, but was smiling. No, I mean, it could turn into that, but honestly, she's cool to work with. She plays her part well. He sat up to look at him. I'm the high-strung chief of police, right? And she's this no-nonsense truth-seeker type. She came at me hard enough in some of the scenes it was hard to compete with her, if I'm honest. She just got that energy, you know? She keeps it up here, and I'm, like, reaching to contend with that. She's really good. Julian nodded. Very cool. Julian, you ready, man? Came Kyra's voice from the water. Yeah, I'm coming, he called back. The two headed up the side of the rocky hill that cradled the beach. Raina got out of the water to follow, but Devin called out to her. No, baby girl, you still aren't old enough yet. Dad, she groaned. I'm not a baby, you know I hate that. Why not? I'll be fine. Look, they just finished school and have their whole lives ahead of them, said Devin. If they want to kill themselves right before things get started, that's on them. But you are my responsibility. Raina growled and huffed as she turned around to get back in the water. Cairo and Julian reached the top of the cliff. The water below them was dark and clearly deep. Raina waded to the side of their plunging spot, bobbing up and down in the waves as she looked up at them. Cairo almost went first. He got to the edge and looked over and could see it was a safe path all the way down. He decided that it was the the all-the-way-down part that bothered him. Raina looked quite small. And even though he had been here some time ago and done this before, he still hesitated and backed up. Julian decided it was best not to overthink it. He took a quick look over the edge to make sure he wouldn't hit anything and then just took the leap. He decided halfway down that the hang time was the worst part about the fall. He was in the air longer than he wanted to be and felt that if he had had a watch, he could have checked it mid-drop. The water was forgiving when he landed, though. He sank deep into the warm tropical waters. After a moment, his head came back up to the surface with his tongue out, taunting his friend still high up on the ledge. Come on, man. I haven't even done this before. What's wrong with you? Cairo shook his head, smiling. Julian looked over at Reyna, now next to him in the water. Your cousin is a stiff. Reyna nodded, but wasn't looking at him. Yeah, I know. I'm glad you're here to help me keep it fun around here. She was looking down. She was trying to keep her face out of the salt water, but he could see she was obviously trying to see something. He was about to ask when he heard a splash and felt water hit the back of his head. He turned around to see Cairo coming up from his jump. He was squeezing the water from his eyes. Do you guys see that down there? Said Reyna. They both looked at her. See what? Said Julian. Reyna frowned. It's some kind of glowy thing? It's red. They were all looking down now. I don't see anything, said Cairo. I can grab the snorkel stuff, said Julian. He began swimming to shore. Cairo kept looking with Reyna, who was trying to point below the surface. See it? It's like a red rock, but it's shiny. Cairo didn't want to open his eyes under the salt water unless he had to. He still kept looking, though, until Julian was back shortly with the snorkeling gear for all three of them. Julian exclaimed through the snorkel when he spotted it. Reyna was right. It was glowing and red and partially covered by sand all the way down at the sea floor. Cairo resurfaced and took his snorkel off. I don't even know how you saw that. Julian lifted his head up and blew water out of his tube. I know, right? Crazy. He looked up at the cliff edge and squinted. Do you think if we dived again, we could reach it? I don't know. It's pretty far down, said Cairo. Let's get it done. Julian was already swimming toward the beach as he said it. Cairo had been right. It was a bit farther down than they had realized. The rest of the evening became a diving game for the stone. 
Once they hit the water, they had found that each time it took a bit more work than they realized to touch the bottom. It was frustratingly close. The pressure towards the bottom was intense. They would strain and run out of energy before they could reach their target. They needed a bit of a break each time they made a concerted effort and would wade for a bit and then try again. Cairo's ears started to pop when he got down too far. He was starting to get a headache. The day began to grow dark. Reyna watched with steadily growing frustration as they kept coming up empty-handed with each attempt. I could do this, she said. No fluff, said Cairo. I'm serious this time. You know what your dad said. Devin had left by this point. He had remarked that he had needed to handle some business, and in his absence, Raina had become more vocal about helping. You wouldn't even be heavy enough if you tried, said Julian. Plus, you need the floaty. It's not a floaty, and I don't need it, said Raina. The water had gotten quite a bit rockier, and they felt the sprinklings of rain at this point. Cairo wasn't going to let her take any chances. Give us just a few more tries, okay? We're running out of light. Julian said, looking out at the horizon. Come on, Cairo said, waving him over to the shore to climb up again. They made their way up the hill while Raina kept staring down at the sea floor through her goggles. Julian was right. They were running out of light and the water had gotten a lot darker. And yet Raina could still see the red glow so clearly. She floated there for a bit, being moved by the waves. Finally, the temptation grew to be too much. She began fiddling with the straps on her life vest until she found the plastic clips. She unfastened them and slipped her arms out. She held the vest out to the side of her and counted. She let go and took a deep breath. At that exact moment, a wave went over the top of her snorkel. Salt water began choking her and she began to panic. She frantically began trying to find her jacket, but it was not where she left it. She tried to look around and began thrashing. She was coughing now and began aspirating more water. Her thrashing made her goggles loosen and water started pouring in. The salt stung her eyes and she couldn't see. She heard a splash nearby. This was followed shortly after by a strong arm wrapping around her. Her head came up to the surface in time to hear Cairo's voice speaking breathlessly. I got you. Julian watched from high up as Cairo carried his step-cousin through the water. Is she okay? He called down to them. Cairo took her to shore before he yelled back to him. I'm taking her back to the house. Julian frowned. He could see she was hat coughing on her hands and knees in the sand. Poor thing. He whispered under his breath. I'll meet you inside. Cairo yelled to him. He led Reno away and walked up the path toward the house. Julian looked down at the increasingly turbulent waves below him. He knew it would mean a lot to her. He looked around him on the hill until he found a large stone. He went over to it and lifted it. It was smooth and fairly wide. He decided it seemed just light enough to carry, but just heavy enough to work. He went to the cliff's edge, carrying it in front of him. One last try, he said to himself. The fall was as long as it was before. It gave him time to think before he got to the water about how dumb it had been to take a leap with a small boulder in his arms. He realized the impact could easily cause him a head injury. He hit the water safely, though. He almost shivered at the thought of being alone in the ocean, out cold with no one around. He shook the thought from his head as the momentum from the fall slowed his plunge, and the weight from the stone continued it. He let air out as he anticipated the feel of the ocean sand on his toes. Down and down he sank into the dark, until the only light he could see was a faint glow of red. Chapter 2 A Walk in the Night Cairo, Reyna, Julian, and Devin all sat in the theater room as their movie ended. Raina was bundled up tight with a mug that had been filled with her favorite toffee-flavored hot cocoa. After her bout with the ocean, she had been all worn out when she got in. Her father had doted on her. She hated the fact that she had proven all his fears correct. The experience had certainly scared her, but her frustration rivaled her residual fear. Coco in a movie helped. All right, little one, time for bed, said Devin. 
Raina sighed and nodded as she got up. Lost all your fight against bedtime in the waves, huh? said Julian. Raina put her blanket over her shoulders and headed around the couch toward the door. Devin got up with her. Good night, Fluff, Cairo said. Raina yawned. Good night, you guys. She walked out of the room. Devin went out with her and then stopped before closing the door. Oh, Kai! He walked back in and closed the door. I forgot to tell you I have a work thing tonight. Julian turned around on the couch, wide-eyed. Oh, snap! Can you tell us about it? Devin laughed. It's a conference call. The new director I'm working with wanted me to do a reading with a few people. He's an interesting guy. Anyway, I just wanted you to know so you can cover Raina Watch for me. Yeah, of course, Cairo said. Oh, the sleepwalk thing, said Julian. Right, said Dev. So if she gets up, I'll need you to handle it tonight? No problem at all, Kai reaffirmed. We'll keep an eye out. I'm sure we'll be up. Just then, quick footsteps could be heard rushing toward the door. Raina burst in. Julian, I can't believe it! They all looked to see her holding the bright red stone out in front of her. It was a magnificent, glistening thing. It was a little bigger than the palm of Raina's hand and was a type of crystal. It could now be seen that the glow of the thing was no trick of the light. It had its own glow, even in the dark of the theater room. What on earth is that? said Devin. Cairo looked at Julian. You got it? You didn't even say anything! He smiled. Better believe it. It was on my nightstand next to my bed, said Raina. You are so cool. Thank you. She ran to him and hugged him over the couch. He gave a little grunt in response. Don't mention it, he said with a smile. The stone was still in her hand as her arms were wrapped around Julian. Cairo looked at it closely. What is that thing? Devin was looking at it too. Can I see that? Raina released Julian and handed the stone to her father. Huh, he said, turning it over. The thing had what looked like refracted light in it that seemed to sparkle like a diamond. But the light was definitely internal and not external. The stone glowed with its red glow and shone faintly on the walls of the theater room. I've never seen anything like this. Right? said Cairo. I think it was worth diving for. Well, you can use it as a nightlight, Devin said, handing it back to his daughter. Raina headed for the door and then looked at Cairo. He might be the new big brother. Cairo put his arms out. Over the one who saved your life today? Raina raised her eyebrows and shrugged as she walked out. Devin laughed and left with her. The guys both turned around and faced the big screen. Cairo scoffed. Girl's a jerk. The evening went late into the night. The guys were talking over videos they were watching online after they were temporarily burnt out on a new boss they had reached in Knights of Ablasia. I just don't know how you do it, man, Julian said. Cairo shrugged. It's really not that big of a deal, and it's rewarding, ultimately. Sure, man, but diapers? Grown folks' diapers? It's not that bad, he said. For you? I definitely could do it. Well, it's part of my curriculum for nursing, so you have to get down and dirty sooner or later. <laughs> you have too much... Julian stopped. Kyra heard it, too. Something had bumped just outside the door. They looked at each other and paused the video they had been talking over. They could hear soft footsteps. Both of them hopped over the back of the couch and opened the door. There she was, wandering around the hallway. She was gently bumping against the walls as she went. So you just follow her, right? Julian whispered. Cairo nodded. They tailed Raina down the halls until she reached the dining area. She managed not to bump the table too much or any of the chairs. She reached a sliding glass door that led outside. They watched her gently feel for the latch and unlock it. She grabbed the handle and very deliberately slid it open. Are you sure she's not awake? Whispered Julian. Cairo nodded. Dude, that is crazy. Raina headed out the door, leaving it slid open behind her as she began walking along the gray stone path. It was a pretty and winding thing with a gray that was so dark it was almost black. She followed it for a ways into the tropical forest. 
She was wearing only pajamas, but the storm had died down and all that was left was a warm night breeze. The moon shone down on her through the shadowy fingers of the palm branches. Cairo and Julian were still dressed for the day and hadn't even gotten into their night clothes after they had changed from swimming. Their shoes had been just outside the glass door, so they easily slipped them on before continuing to follow her. They had been a bit wet from being carried with their sopping swim gear. The soles had bits of wet sand lining the inside of them. Julian had noticed a bit of a soggy squeak when he walked, but Kyra was concerned for Reyna, as he had noticed she was barefoot. The path was clear, though, with only a small layer of sand sprinkled over the top of it. When she was nearing the end of the path, the boys had caught up with her and were following closely behind. I know we can't wake her, but she'd be so easy to just pick up right now, said Julian in a hushed tone. It was true. Reyna was quite small and petite, even for her age. It was hard to imagine how waking her at this point would cause any problem, even if she thrashed around. She'll lay down in a second, Cairo said, nodding his head toward the end of the paved walkway. It's just up here. There at the end, the path split and circled a large stone slab. Palm trees were lined around it, arcing their shadows over the spot. It was a smooth, flat boulder with something white and gray laid over the top of it. He could see it was a small blanket. The boulder had an engraved inscription plate attached to the front of it. Julian squinted, but couldn't make out what it said in the dark. Man, your uncle went all out, didn't he? Cairo sighed. Yeah, he did. Reyna reached her destination. She crawled over the inscription and onto the soft white and gray surface. The boulder had a bit of a concave in the middle where the blanket was, like it was made exactly for her to curl herself atop the soft surface of the smooth stone slab. The young girl looked as peaceful as could be as the two stared at her. That's something else, said Julian. Isn't it, said Cairo. Happens every night she's here. Does she sleepwalk at home, too? Sometimes. Does she go anywhere else? Nope, it's weird. Uncle Dev says she just wanders the house at home, never leaves it. But here? Every single time she comes to this spot and lays right here. And that's why he had the path built for her. Right. Before it was just the inscription. But then he wanted her to have a place to walk and then planted the trees around it. Julian shook his head. <laughs> Rich people. For real. The two headed to her resting place, and Cairo stood over her. Okie doke, little lady, he said as he leaned down to lift her. Julian was staring at the small cover that blanketed the stone. He couldn't tell what fixed it in place, but it looked natural, like it was just laying there with nothing to hold it. Even in the dark, you could see it was a bright white color with curved silver-gray stripes that accented it vertically. Huh, he said. It really is fluffy. Cairo nodded as he readjusted the young girl in his arms to carry her back. He suddenly stopped and was staring at something. What? said Julian. Um, she... It looks like she carried the stone with her. What? Julian got closer to look. There, clutched tightly in her right hand and glowing faintly, was the red crystal. I can't believe she didn't drop it said Cairo. Why did she even pick it up? The stone's glow was a bit brighter now. Cairo moved her so they could get a closer look at it. Reyna's hand clutched the stone tighter. As he held her in his arms, she pulled it close to her chest. Julian felt a swell of pride. He was happy he had gotten her something she loved so much that she was trying to keep it safe in her sleep. They turned to head back when the glow of the stone grew even brighter, bright enough for both of the boys to turn and look at it. The red light lit up Reyna's face and then both of their own. Their eyes were wide while Reyna still slept peacefully. The light got so bright it became hard to look at. Cairo began to squint and Julian started to shield his view. Before either could react, something that looked like an arcing ray of light followed nearly instantly by a web of identical structures erupted from the stone's light. It passed through them and surrounded them in a kind of spherical cage. What followed was something like a static mist that replaced the light. It dissipated quickly. In all, the event lasted about two seconds, 
just long enough for Cairo and Julian's minds to register what their eyes were seeing and not a moment more. The trees had changed. These looked more like pines. Cairo was sure he hadn't seen anything like them before on the island. Julian was suddenly trembling and shivering from the cold. What just happened? Cairo was gazing at the trees, looking at their tops and the black sky above them. He looked down. The gray stone path was gone. This isn't... we aren't... where we were. For a moment, he thought maybe he was just confused and had gotten disoriented. Reyna still slept in his arms. He looked down at her balled-up hand where the stone had been resting. He opened her fingers. It wasn't there. He rubbed her smooth palm. It was warm. Very warm. But there was no trace of the crystal. He looked down around her feet to see if it had dropped. The ground didn't look right either. It wasn't sand, and different debris littered the ground, again indicating that these trees were not the same. This place wasn't the same. They had moved, without a doubt. But where? Kai... Julian called softly. I know, he whispered. Something behind them scurried. They both whipped around to see nothing but more trees. They were in a small clearing. Cairo set Raina on the ground, standing her on her feet and began trying to rouse her. Raina, honey, I need you to wake up. Raina? Raina! He rubbed her shoulder and shook her just a little. Slowly her eyes blinked, but they wouldn't open fully. Hmm... She muttered, What did you do? Where's the stone? He said in his softest voice. He thought maybe she could remember something. Were you dreaming? W what were you just dreaming? Julian started walking around nervously. Man, I don't even think we're on the island anymore, Kai. This is some kind of weird. Did you see that light? The one from her hand? And then that smoke? And then, I mean, I don't know. Do you see it anywhere? The stone? Kyra asked him. She don't have it? Kyra was gently trying to wake Reyna. No, do you see it? I can't find it. Julian started searching the ground, circling them. He looked near them and then searched the edges of the small clearing. No, it's not here. There's, there's something here, though. Reyna started to wake up. What is it? Cairo asked him, keeping his eyes on her. Julian examined what he found. It's like a piece of metal or something, but it's kind of buried and sticking up, like... They heard a scurrying sound again, this time from behind the trees on the other side of the clearing. Julian got nervous. Let's go, man. I don't want what the... I don't know what that was. We should go. Reyna finally had her eyes open. She started to speak. What? She paused and looked around. Where are we? Cairo stood up and grabbed her by the hand. That's what we want to know. <laughs> Suddenly, a hush fell over the night. This startled Cairo. He hadn't noticed the ambiance of forest sounds that had previously surrounded them until there was an absence of them. He finally turned his attention to Julian to see his friend frozen in place. He was facing the trees. He knew to say nothing, as Julian was never this still nor this quiet. He gripped Reyna's hand tight as he slowly leaned his head over to see what it was that captivated his friend so totally. In the black, between the shadows of the trees, was a glow. It was a small, light orange glow that slowly moved through the dark. Then, with a swift motion, the one orange glow became two. A chill ran up Cairo's back as he realized they were a pair of eyes. And even before the creature came into view, he knew there was no good intent in them. With slow intensity, the figure emerged from the shadows, and a gentle soft light blanketed the creature's snout. It lit up its gleaming teeth, then its brow, and then its turned-down black ears. His large, furry, black face came into view, the edges of his hair colored with flecks of ashen gray. Its paw was lifted, and the creature's whole body was tense, poised to strike. Reyna had seen the creature by this point and was squeezing Cairo's hand. She began backing up in an all-consuming fear. Reyna loved wolves, mostly because she loved dogs. Dogs spoke to her in a way that very few other creatures did. They usually had a simple friendliness to them. But mean dogs were hard to reason with, even for her. 
but she had never had the opportunity to interact with a wolf. She was not swayed by any sort of childhood naivete. She knew better than to reason with the hunting eye of a predator. Before she knew what she was doing, she had yanked her hand from Cairo and tore off into the forest. Cairo whipped around in horror as she disappeared. Julian heard her take off, but was made more aware by the wolf creature's reaction to it. While before its eyes were trained on Julian, they shifted to see fleeing prey. Its instincts took over. It shot completely out of the darkness after her. Cairo saw this and instinctively dived toward the wolf to save his cousin, a decision he instantly reconsidered upon colliding with the ground and missing the beast entirely. He thought about what the dog would have done to him had he caught it. He then thought it best not to think too deeply about that as he scrambled to his feet. He ran after the dog's tail as it disappeared into the trees. Julian quickly went after them both. The forest was very dark, and although their eyes had acclimated to it, it was all they could do not to run into trees. They both ran as fast as they could in the dark, all the while pushing off trees to get a better sense of their surroundings and the obstacles ahead of them. Kyra could hear the shuffling of his feet as he ran. He could hear the dog growling and running up ahead, so he knew he hadn't caught up to Raina yet. They ducked under branches and around trees, but could only see clearly when the moonlight was able to pierce the thick, shadowy overcast of the pines. Raina's legs were taking her as fast as they could carry her. She was quickly realizing what a bad idea it was to try to outrun a canine, and barefoot nonetheless. She had given herself quite the head start on the wolf, but she could feel him getting closer. The rustle of the dirt beneath his feet was getting louder, and she could hear that his speed was effortless as he gained on her. Remarkably, she hadn't stepped on anything sharp or prickly yet, or perhaps she hadn't noticed due to fear. Her legs burned, but it wasn't enough. The hairs on the back of her neck raised as she felt time slow in the split second that the wolf's back legs left the ground. Silent emptiness hung in the air along with the lunging beast. Its eyes were trained on Raina's neck, its jaws agape with rows of teeth at the ready. Raina blinked her eyes shut in anticipation, but her feet kept moving in what she thought was the last moment of her life. She heard a thud like the collision of a body into another, and then a thud in quick succession like something hitting the ground. Her life didn't end. She opened her eyes. She was still running. No teeth in her. She took that moment to dash around a tree to the right and change direction. She didn't dare look back. Cairo was the one to hear it first as he came up on it. A whimper and a howl. He stopped as he came upon the dog they were chasing, pinned to the ground by another body. Another wolf creature. This one was much bigger. It had its jaws wrapped around the neck of the first one, biting it into submission. It struggled to fight back as the one doing the pinning growled. Julian came up quickly behind Cairo, who was still stopped at the scene. Where is she? He swallowed the rest of his words. His heart sank when he saw what Cairo saw. Not only was the silhouette of the wolf freakishly large as he shook the lesser dog, its eyes glowed a blood red. Cairo spoke breathlessly. Come on. Rightly deducing the direction she took, Cairo went right. He kept up his speed. He needed to find her before she ran into something else. He didn't know how long the bigger dog would be preoccupied with the other over which one of them would catch the girl as prey. Julian was right behind them. It wasn't long before they caught up to her. She was running ahead of them and Cairo called out to her at the same moment that a howl rang through the night. The larger wolf was after the claim he'd rightfully staked. Keep going, he called out to her. We're right behind you. He tried to call out and yet keep his voice down at the same time. Reyna wasn't aimless. I, I see a light, she called back. There was a soft glow that she could see through the trees and above the treetops. It was a soft orange haze. The boys could see it too. Don't stop, said Cairo in a loud whisper. <laughs> this is insane, Julian said, realizing he was almost out of breath. They could hear the growls and snarls of the beast on its way. Leaves crunched underneath their feet. They were almost there. They could see it now. It was a wall, a very tall wall. It was made of sawed-off logs. They could see the tops of them came to a point. Raina remembered seeing pictures of these types of fences when she learned about the early settlers and the Native Americans in her history lessons. She had never seen one like it before in real life. 
The wall got closer and closer, and the snarls of the wolf grew louder and louder. Finally, the trees ended, and they found themselves in a clearing between the forest and the wall. They could see how long the fence was now, and that it had erected poles outside of it with torches burning bright. They could see the entrance, a door to their far left. They ran, cutting across the clearing and passing the burning torches. They nearly slammed against the door as they reached it. It was big and made of smooth wood planks that held together by metal braces. They all began pounding on it and screaming. Let us in! Please! Don't leave us out here! Julian turned around to see their pursuer. He didn't. The clearing was... clear. There was about a hundred feet between the forest and the fence. He knew they couldn't have had that much of a head start on it. He couldn't hear the growling anymore either. But he thought he had heard another sound. A sound like trees shaking. He looked across the landscape to see to his far left the rocking of tall branches. He squinted. Reyna and Cairo were still banging and yelling when they heard the loud crack of a trunk in the distance, almost like it was being snapped in half. They turned to face what Julian was looking at. They couldn't see it, but they heard a tree fall as it broke the branches of the other pines in their view. Loud and heavy footfalls could be heard, striking the ground with soft tremors as they went. Something else was in the woods, and it wasn't the wolf. The footfalls were slow at first, then they grew in rapidity. As the new creature moved behind the trees at the edge of the clearing, they could tell by how high up the tree branches shook that this creature was very large, possibly even larger than an elephant. There was no way to see a silhouette as the light from the torches pushed the shadows away from them. They heard what they thought was scurrying from another animal. Then the footfalls got quicker. The creature was running with loud but swift stomping. Another loud crack from a broken branch and the footfalls had stopped abruptly, followed by a loud and violent whimper of the now helpless wolf. The forest was hushed for a moment as it watched the descent of Predator onto its prey. The stomps quickly resumed and then grew more and more distant along with the wolf's howls of pain. Desperate whimpers echoed as it was carried away. Its cries eventually ceased, leaving the natural noises of the night to take over once again, surrounding Reyna and the boys. They stood dumbfounded and still. The door that had previously been their singular focus creaked open behind them. Hello? came a man's voice. They turned around to see a figure holding the door. He was wearing armor. He had a black metal chest plate and gauntlets on his arms that had a red hue to them. Julian thought he looked like a modern version of a medieval soldier. Come, come, get in, he said, gesturing. They quickly came inside the walls. The man closed the door and latched it behind them. The streets of the inside of the village were fairly bright. Torches lit the streets like lamp posts. Wherever the light of one torch ended, the light of another torch began. It was as though the light radius had been measured out. Neat and small cabin homes lined the inside of the walls, row after row. They couldn't see how big it was, but there was something odd about it. Raina thought it reminded her of her history textbooks. Julian thought it looked more like a reenactment of some sort of old medieval culture. The guard came around the front of the frantic young people. They could see he was a young man looking to be somewhere in his 20s. Boy, you people are a long way from home. The nearest town isn't for miles, he said with a smile. He reached out and quickly shook each of their hands. My name's Boak, officer of the King's Guard. It's a pleasure to meet you. They stared back at him, looking frazzled, trembling with wide eyes and breathing heavily. It's always a relief to see someone make it into town and not become a victim of the night. Bless you three. You didn't lose anyone in your party, did you? He pulled out a clipboard. Cairo thought a clipboard seemed out of place with what he was wearing. Julian looked confused. In our party? It's just us. The man called Boke pulled out something to write with and started in on his clipboard. He muttered each word as he wrote it. Okay, three people, no losses. The three of them looked at each other as the man wrote. He finished before looking up and smiling at them. Come with me.
Chapter 3 The Savior King So you're from where? Salt Lake City, said Cairo. I was born in Arizona, but I was raised around him most of my life, said Julian. I'm from Hollywood, California, said Reyna with some confidence. No, you're not, Fluff, said Cairo. Reyna sighed. Whatever, it's just easier to tell people that. He smiled at the two guards. She moves all the time. Her dad is a movie star, so, you know, he moves around a lot. He's got a lot of houses and a lot of places. The two men before him stared blankly. Cairo cleared his throat in a short, awkward silence. You may have heard of him? Devin Crew. He's pretty famous. You've probably seen some of his movies. His movies? Said the guard next to Boke. Yeah, movies. He's a movie star, Cairo said. He's a star? The guard asked. Julian laughed. (laughs) Okay, you both seem real committed to this whole live-action role-play bit, he said. But can we talk about the wolves outside? I'm pretty sure those were actual wolves. For the first time ever, I just experienced running for my life from a wild animal, so, you know, what is this? Boke spoke with a face full of skepticism. Do you mean the shadow dogs? Cairo and Julian looked at each other. Boke brought his fist to his lips and loudly cleared his throat. I'm very sorry, but the rest of these questions are going to need to be answered for us. Perhaps then we can answer some of yours? Julian leaned back in his seat and sighed. Go ahead, man. The three of them sat in a room in a building the men had called the Processing Center. It matched the strange mixture of modern and old-fashioned medieval architecture. As he had led them through the cobblestone streets, they had noted that despite the lit torches that lined every corner, the town was quiet. The Processing Center was a bit larger than some of the odd-looking homes, but it still wasn't particularly big. They had been led to a room to sit facing the guards on a wooden bench. Okay, Boke said, looking at his clipboard. Second question. How did you get here? Uh, Chased here by wolves, as previously mentioned, said Julian. Uh, Before that, we don't know, Cairo interjected. We followed my cousin here. We're a little unclear on the details. Where are we? Boke scribbled on his board. Again, let me finish. Just one more. What is your business in this town? Julian leaned forward. To escape the wolves, man. And there was another thing out there. Something bigger and more. My friend and I were looking after my cousin. Something really strange happened once we found her and we ended up here. We'd really like to know what's going on. Boat kept writing, focused intently. All anyone could hear was scribbling for a moment. Then he stopped and looked over the page. The second guard looked at the clipboard over his shoulder until Boke abruptly stood up with his eyes not leaving the paper. I'll be a moment, he said. He turned and left the room. The second guard quickly followed, closing the door behind them. Julian leaned forward on the bench and laced his fingers together. Dude, what is this? Cairo looked at him just as Reyna gently grabbed his forearm. He turned to her briefly and saw her concerned face. He held her hand tight before he answered him. I don't think we're on the island anymore. Julian nodded exaggeratedly. I'm not Toto, but I think we can agree on that, Dorothy. Cairo shrugged. It sounds crazy, but I'm not ruling out dimensional displacement. Here we go, Julian said, rubbing his forehead. I knew you were going to say we fell into a comic book or something. I'm serious, man. What happened to us was way too extravagant to be a prank or whatever. Uncle Dev has money, but this... this is extra. And he probably would have told me. That's a good point, said Cairo. He might pull something elaborate on us for our visit, but he's with her all the time, so unless she's in on it. Cairo looked at Reyna, who gave him a doubtful look. I was sleeping! Yeah, that too, he said. The door to the room opened back up and Boke stepped in. The three looked up at him as he spoke. Okay, so it looks as though we will need to have the king come see to you. We've sent word to alert him. 
Julian looked at the guard and smirked. Sent word to the king, huh? Did you send a guy on horseback? Boke cocked his head slightly. No, I called him, said Boke. Julian cocked an eyebrow. How does using a phone fit into your whole Dark Ages village thing? Phone? Boke asked. Julian threw his head back with a scoff. (sighs) You guys are bad at this. Boke cleared his throat again as he pulled something from his pocket. I have something to read to you. His hands trembled as he unraveled a small, rolled-up piece of paper. It was rolled tight. He had trouble opening it and keeping it open, as it appeared it hadn't been read in some time. Welcome, dearest traveler, to Dezu. Boke swallowed hard and continued. I am sure you are deeply confused and troubled by your new surroundings. It is the duty of my men and I to guide you back to the safety of your home. Please, do not be alarmed. Trust my men with your care until I arrive. I will be at your service shortly, as your personal escort to see you off. Yours truly, King Orion. Boke finished the letter and let it quickly roll up. He tightly rolled it the rest of the way and quickly exited the room. The door closed behind him with a thud. The three sat, staring at it. Reyna put her hands on her cheeks and started alternating, rubbing them up and down, scrunching up her face. Okay, she said. So I'm starting to think I'm not dreaming. She looked over at the guys. The looks on the faces looking back at her were not comforting. For the next twenty minutes or so, they talked alone in the room about how the night went, alternating between disbelief and reconsideration of the facts. Julian's take on it was still that this was some sort of reenactment, or movie set, or maybe even a reality show. Cairo kept pointing out the wolves and the special effects needed to replicate whatever they saw beyond the tree line. Also, he couldn't get over the insurance liability that all of that would entail. None of them had signed any waivers. Reyna decided definitively that she wasn't still sleeping after pinching herself as hard as she could on her forearm. She then insisted everyone else do the same. The door handle turned, and the door creaked open again. The three stopped talking and gave it their attention. In walked a reasonably tall figure, draped in a large black cloak at the shoulders. He wore a silver breastplate with intricate markings carved into it. Kaiwa recognized them to be the face of some sort of animal, with metal detail work around it. The face looked something like a bull, but had two sets of horns one on the top and one set protruding from where the nostrils should be. He walked in, followed closely behind by Boke and another attendant. He had a clean-cut, soft brown mustache and goatee, with a quiet smile decorating his lips. He looked to be, perhaps in his late forties, and yet the days of his youth adorned his face. He approached them with a soft step in his silky black pants highlighted in red. Hello and welcome he said as he approached each of them to shake their hands. My name is Orion, and I wanted to offer you my sincerest apologies for any inconveniences you may have experienced. He went down the line, starting with Julian. Julian stood and extended his hand. Orion clasped both his hands around it firmly and shook. He did the same with Cairo, who also stood. Everyone has a different story of how they stumbled onto this place. I trust yours is equally puzzling. He reached Reyna in his line of greetings. She stood and looked up at him. Orion looked at her and paused for a moment. His soft smile stayed, but his hand hesitated before shaking hers. Hello, young lady. What's your name? Reyna, she said. Reyna, he repeated. He took her small hand gently in his. He looked into her eyes a moment and then looked back at the boys. The important thing is that we get you all home as quickly as we can. He slipped his hand into his pocket and pulled something out. He held it in front of them, and they all circled around it. It was another crystal. This one was a deep, vibrant purple. It had a wildly oscillating light inside that almost looked like an electric current. Orion looked back at the guards, but kept his hand out, letting the three get a closer look. You men can step out. Go ahead and take this chair and bench with you. The men obeyed, going around the four of them and taking the seats out of the room. Cairo spoke up. This looks like... You saw a red one, right? Similar flickering glow to it? 
Yeah, Raina said. Julian got it for me. Yours is really pretty. Orion smiled. <laughs> Thank you. But it's more than just pretty. It's your ticket home. The door behind them closed as the men left with the wooden furniture. Orion's eyebrows lifted up. Are you ready? His tones sounded like they were about to play a game. Before any of them could respond, the purple stone lit up bright. This time, because they were looking directly at it, Cairo and Julian closed their eyes. When they opened them, the processing center was gone. They saw the shimmering purple stone still in the king's hand as he slipped it neatly back in his pocket. Julian spun around and saw that the room they were now in was round with no corners. It seemed to be lit only by a single torch hung on the wall, bathing the room in a dim and flickering orange light. The walls and ceiling were made up of a soft orange stone. Julian felt like he was out of breath. We... what? What the what? Raina saw under her bare feet that they all stood on a large red and yellow stone insignia of a flame that was carved into the floor. She looked around the room. She noticed two open-air windows that revealed a bit of the night sky. The sounds of the chirping creatures of the dark reached her ears. She then noticed two doors, one on either side of the room. One looked wooden and old-fashioned, like the doors of the processing center. The other, on the opposite side, looked heavy and made of metal. Cairo's eyes were on Orion as he walked towards it. This isn't home, he said. No, it's not, Orion said as he opened the door with a heavy, scraping noise. Home is this way. He waved them over without looking at them. Come. Cairo and Reyna began approaching him in the open door. Beyond it was pitch black. It clearly went to another room and not outside as it lacked anything resembling a night sky. Nuh-uh, said Julian, staying in place. I need answers, bruh. I'm not going anywhere until I know what's happening right now. Cairo stopped and looked back at his friend. Orion smiled and shook his head. I understand your concern. The king pulled the door closed again. He gently dragged his fingers across the orange stone wall at the side of the door until he touched an indentation. He pulled a rectangular stone piece of the wall out of place and then stepped aside so they could see. This building is called a crossover sanctuary, and the room beyond this door is called a transportation chamber, the king said. People usually cross from your world to this one and land where you are standing now, or at one of the many other crossover sanctuaries in my kingdom. For reasons I'll soon be looking into, it didn't quite work out that way for you. He reached into his pocket and pulled out his glowing purple crystal. This violet gem allows me to send you home. You simply walk through this door, and I place it in this compartment that leads to the same room. When it lights up again, you'll be back where you belong, and you'll have quite the peculiar story to tell your friends and family. Julian's eyebrow raised. No, no, no. I want to know what this place is. Where are we? I don't see what's so hard about that question. Orion sighed. You've had it answered. You just weren't listening. This place is called Dezu, as I mentioned in the letter the guard must have read to you. I'm Orion, the king of this place. I'm sending you home now. No, but... Julian started. Cairo cleared his throat. I think what he's trying to say is, where is Dezu? What is Dezu? How did we get here? Orion rubbed the side of his face. Rena kept quiet as she looked up at him. She was closest to him in the line for the door. Look, I don't know exactly how all the science works, said the king, but how it's been explained to me is that this is another dimension, or another world. It's not Earth. You are impossibly far from home. Cairo shot a quick glance at Julian with raised eyebrows. Julian rolled his eyes. Now, I know that may excite you, the king continued perhaps making your curiosity run wild. But instead, you should be very concerned. Concerned that you took an unexpected trip to an unexpected and, might I add, fairly dangerous place. I set up this service so that when people like you get caught here, they can get back to their normal everyday lives as quickly as possible. So if you please... Orion turned around and put the rectangular stone back inside the hole in the wall. 
As he did, a figure suddenly appeared in the peripheral of Julian's vision. It was only for a split second, but Julian recognized it as a man. He was looking straight at him and had his finger up to his lips in a gesture that clearly meant to keep quiet. Julian's eyebrows raised as this figure vanished as quickly as he appeared. Orion reached the heavy metal door and began dragging it open with a screeching noise. As Julian looked on at the king with his friend just ahead of him, he experienced a new sensation of the surreal. In a silent instant, he watched Cairo disappear from sight. Julian's eyes widened. He heard some kind of shuffling of feet and then felt a tap on his shoulder. Then, the feeling of a hand over his mouth. He tried to scream, but it was muffled by a palm pressing tightly against his lips. He was being pulled backwards. He felt the sensation of falling. He had a brief second to look down at himself as he lost his footing. Then he realized there was nothing for him to look at. His own body had disappeared. He was about to panic when he felt a sharp prick on his shoulder. Orion finished opening the heavy scraping door and turned back around. Come, right? His head darted in all directions, looking for the boys. Reyna was still looking up at him. As she turned around to see what he was looking for, she felt the king's hand grab her arm firmly. Breach! Orion's voice boomed through the sanctuary. Reyna cringed and tried to drop to her knees, but Orion held her up. She shut her eyes tight. A powerful boom with a crack of wood echoed in her ears. When she looked up, she saw the door on the other side of the room was shattered and smoldering with flames. Just beyond the opening, she could see the outside of the outline of two men huddled on the other side of the wall. Get in here! Orion yelled. The men fumbled with their spears as they stepped carefully over the flaming leftover pieces of the door. They looked at him bewildered and then looked around the room. No, block the door, block it! He said, his hand still firmly around Reyna's bicep. The men crossed their spears and backed up to cover the entrance as instructed. They stood there for a moment, looking at their king for further instruction. Orion shook his head. No, get out, go! Reyna was breathing quickly and trembling. Kai! She called out. Orion walked with her to the door, holding her firmly but not tugging her too much. The guards at the entrance hadn't moved when he reached them. Take her and step out, he said, now in a softer tone. The men nodded, and one of them took her by the other hand. As Orion released her, he caught the fear in the little girl's eyes. Keep her safe, he said, still looking at her. The men left the room and took Reyna outside. They stood a few meters away and looked back at the king's cloak blocking the doorway. From her vantage point, Reyna could see him stretch his arms into the room. The open-air windows lit up. She and the guards backed up as they felt heat pouring out from the building. A fire surged and swirled around the inside of the sanctuary, bellowing loudly through the forest around them. Reyna felt tears run down her face as she tried again to fall to her knees. This time, the guard next to her let her fall, but still held her hand. She began to sob. Cairo! She cried out. She kept saying his name over and over. The sound of the flames mostly drowned her out. But slowly they died down inside the windows and the king turned his ear in her direction. All at once the flames stopped and he turned toward her and his men. Reyna kept desperately crying out the name of her cousin through her tears. Orion ran towards them. Reyna could see his chest plate was glowing red hot in the dark. She saw him rip it from his chest and toss it to the ground. When he reached her, he dropped to his knees and wrapped his arms around her. Reyna was hysterical and didn't know what to make of this sudden embrace. Orion held her tight to his very warm chest, covered in silky black material. Her ears were covered in his arms, but she could hear his muffled hushes to her cries. It's going to be all right. It's okay. Reyna felt her tears soak into his shirt. He was rubbing her back as she continued to weep. When her sobs began to slow, he pulled her from his chest and looked at her tear-stained face. Where did they go? What happened? She whimpered. He stood up and helped her to her feet. They were taken, the king whispered softly. He looked back at the stone sanctuary. By someone very bad. 
Rena's eyes began to well up again. Orion turned back to her. But we are going to find them. Chapter 4 Stolen Kyra woke up with a start. He sat up quickly and was dismayed to see another new location. This time it was a small cabin room. He was sitting up in a small bed next to Julian who was sleeping but beginning to stir. At the foot of the bed stood a man with his back to them. He was standing before a workbench in a light brown coat working on something Cairo couldn't see. The window near the bed showed the night to be nearly over as a soft blue light began to filter in from the dark night sky. Cairo began to gently shake his friend. Julian's eyes fluttered open. He locked his eyes with him, and Cairo gestured to their captor. Julian nodded and then slowly began removing the knitted blanket from off them. I'm glad you're awake, came the man's voice. They both snapped their attention to him, but he was still facing away, working on the bench. They almost weren't sure he was talking to them. Cairo started to respond. Uh, go ahead and ask your questions. We haven't got much time, the man said. He still wasn't turning around to look at them. Cairo could see now he had a bag of some kind that he was loading with things. Neither of them said anything for a moment. Julian decided to get right to the point. Who is you, and how di did we go from... get from... Julian's eyebrows furrowed as he touched his lips. It felt like his tongue was too big for his mouth. He felt a bit fuzzy, too. The man turned around. He had long hair with lots of gray in it, but clearly at some point it had been a vibrant blonde. He was thin, with cool gray eyes. This man, too, was aged, but had the face of a younger man. I'm Harper he said. He walked to the side of the bed and tapped his fingers on an unseen surface. Before their eyes, the thing appeared as if from nothing. And you traveled by wheelbarrow. He went back to the bench and began working again. The boys were looking at a large wheelbarrow that had suddenly appeared next to them. Cairo spoke up next. What? Whoa, yeah, whom, why can't I talk good? I stuck you with this. Harper held up a small needle. It's a tranquilizer, an anesthetic derived from a local flower called a semi semi. It puts you to sleep almost instantly when it's in your system, but it also has the temporary side effect of making you... loopy? I guess you could say, and not in full control of your speech patterns. The man was speaking quickly. Cairo blinked several times at the needle as Harper put it back down on the bench. You and things disappear. Right. Harper turned around. His lips were pressed together. So, you met our king? A lot of what he said to you is true. You are in another dimension. The most relevant thing to know about this world is that it's permeated by a substance known as delinium. It changes everything about this place, from the animals to the plant life. There are things here that truly boggle and baffle the mind. He looked out the window a moment, lost in thought. Then he snapped back to attention and continued. Anyway, that goes for the people here as well. He lifted his arm to show them his hand was missing. His face then faded along with the rest of his body, so that only his clothes hovered in place. The clothes leaned over and touched the foot of their bed. The bed and the blankets vanished. The two now looked as though they were reclined, yet hovering in midair. They were dumbfounded, and instinctively tried to grab at something to hold themselves up. Then, with another tap of his invisible fingers, all of it came back into view. Julian was looking down at his blankets and realized he had drooled just a little bit. He slurped his lips and asked a question. Are you, uh, sci science, science, science man? Harper smiled. Good catch, and good sentence. I am, actually, an engineer, but since I've been here, I've had the privilege of dabbling in many other scientific fields a great deal when I had the resources. Julian tapped the side of his forehead and looked at Cairo. I am on it. Cairo's eyes widened as a realization occurred to him. Rena! 
Kyra could see Harper's shoulders sag, though he was turned away. Yes, I am sorry about the girl. She was too close to him. I, I couldn't get to her before he caught on. Where? said Cairo. She's still with him, I imagine. I saw her with his men as I escaped. Is he sending her home? Without us? Cairo asked. No, said Harper, stopping what he was doing again. He turned around. That's not possible. What do you mean? said Julian. Harper sighed. I mean, that's the part he was lying to you about. He can't send you home. He can't send anyone home. Where was he taking us, then? asked Cairo. Harper rubbed the back of his neck. He told you that the violet dilinium crystal can make you cross over. It can't. I should know, because I manufactured it. The only thing it's good for is limited transport between crossover points on this side of the dimensional wall. The room he was leading you to was an incinerator. What? Cairo threw his covers off and stood up from the bed. He immediately lost his stability when he tried to walk. Harper quickly stepped to the side of the bed and caught him. Hey, hey, it's okay. We've got to go get her, Cairo said, trying to push past him. Stop, please, stop, you're in no condition. Cairo lost his footing completely and Harper held him up. You don't know, she's my cousin, but more like a sister, and she's safe, Harper said. Cairo stopped struggling. She's safe, all right? I assure you. Harper was holding him up by his shoulders now. How would you know? Julian said, irritation in his voice. Because I know him, Harper said. Or I used to. Better than most. He began helping Cairo back into bed. These packs I'm making for you, they will be your lifeline. There's a bit of food and a few other essentials to get you started, along with a guide to help you get your bearings here. It also has a bit of information about the world and what you'll need to know. Refer to it often. How do we get my cousin back? asked Cairo. Harper shook his head as he placed the cover back over him. I don't know, and I can't help you with that now. What? said Cairo. What about getting home? said Julian. The sun was starting to come up. Harper looked towards the rays trying to make their way into the room. He stood up and went to the workbench to pack a few more things. You don't. Julian opened his mouth but didn't say anything. He was still processing what was said. Harper turned around with the two packs in either hand. They were burlap with straps and a tie at the top. When you wake up, these will be in your new dwelling. Follow the guide's instructions very carefully and to a T. It will keep you safe. You are going to be put down now. This is so when you wake up, you won't know how to get here if you're interrogated. I need my home safe for anyone else that needs help. He placed the bags at the foot of the bed. The boys then realized he had a needle in his hand again. Please, no, not again. I hate needles, said Julian, putting his hand out. We don't. Cairo was looking incredulously to the side as he meditated aloud on the words Harper had just said to them. He then stared directly into his eyes. You are out of your mind, he said. There's no way I'm letting Raina... His eyes widened as Harper drew closer to the head of the bed. With a despondent expression, he vanished totally. The two looked all around the room. Suddenly, Julian jumped at a prick on his forearm. He grabbed it, and Cairo caught his reaction just as he felt a prick on his own arm. A voice spoke as they both began to fade out of consciousness again. I'm sorry, boys. This is your home now. Chapter 5 Girl in a High Tower Raina woke up to a knocking at the door. She had been tucked under the many covers of her very large bed. The previous night, after several more shimmering transfers from sanctuary to sanctuary, the king had led her on a short walk through the forest. Her eyes were swollen from crying when she laid eyes on a massive palace in the dark. The guards had quickly let them in, and he had led her through several winding corridors and up a few flights of stairs to a room where she was to sleep overnight. 
The room was large. It had to be to accommodate such a large bed. It was clearly not meant for someone as small as her. It housed a clothes cabinet and a few dressers. She was told to make herself comfortable before she was left alone in the very dark room. She cried herself to sleep on a night she thought she'd never get any rest at all. Now she found herself waking to the morning light streaming in through a window, one she hadn't paid much notice to the night before. Someone entered with a clinking sound of dishes rattling together. Reyna pulled the covers off the top of her head and looked to see who it was. It was a man, holding a tray of assorted items. He was wearing a long, navy blue, thin, and form-fitting coat that went down to his feet. He had gray boots that matched the gloves that held the tray in hand. "'Good morning, Miss Reyna," he said. "'Breakfast?' He approached and placed the tray on a nightstand near her bed, another thing she hadn't really noticed when she came in the night before. She looked at him and was taken aback for a moment. She was just waking up and realized the night before had really happened and there was no waking from her predicament. But this man's face was not helping her come to grips with her new reality. Following behind him was Orion, entering through the open door. He gave her a quick smile as he walked in. "'I see you've met Kadok.' The king said, patting the man on the shoulder. I have to call him my head servant, as that's his title. But the real truth is, he is my closest friend. Kadok smiled as he leaned over, setting up utensils on the tray. You're too kind, sir. Please, Orion said with an eye roll. Don't sir me. I've known this man my whole life. He takes good care of me, so I know he'll take good care of you. Reyna rubbed her eyes and blinked at him a few times to make sure. He's purple. The man before her really was purple, though Reyna observed he wasn't a deep purple like the king's crystal. He looked to be a kind of light purple, the kind she had colored mountains sometimes in her drawings of scenery at school. His skin was also contrasted by his white hair. Orion nodded. That he is. Kadok finished straightening up the tray and turned to her, giving a slight bow. Will that be all, miss? Reyna kept staring at him and said nothing. Her mouth was a bit open. She noticed that his eyebrows were strange, too. They each came to a bit of a point at the arc. "'That'll be all, Kadok. Thank you,' said the king. Kadok turned and left the room, with Reyna watching him go. Orion looked at her, and then looked at him walk out the door, and then back at her again. He sighed. "'Kadok is not a human.' Reyna closed her mouth and looked up at him. He's called a Nam. They're my people, the majority race in this world, certainly in my kingdom. Are they all purple? she asked. No, (laughs) he chuckled. Nam come in all sorts. They generally look like you or me. They just come in more varieties. Oh, Raina said with a slow nod. So, can you do me a favor? Yeah... Be more polite when you see him again. Reyna cleared her throat and looked down. I'm sorry. It's all right, said the king as he sat on her bed. Some of this food is going to be a little strange to you, too. I think you'll like it, though. Reyna looked at the tray. It had a fruit on it that she'd never seen before. It looked like a lemon, but it was the size of an orange. The rest was covered by lids. Do you want me to cut it for you? He asked. Yes, please. Orion grabbed a knife from her tray and began cutting the fruit in half, then into slices. Reyna noticed the meat of it was a deep sea blue. The king handed her a piece. Thank you, she said as she began to take a bite. The meat burst with juice and tanginess. The taste reminded her of bubblegum, but with a tart to it. Mmm. Reyna's eyes were closed, experiencing the flavor. Orion chuckled as he saw a drop of blue juice escape the side of her mouth. Yeah, I thought you'd like that one. It's been my favorite since I was a kid. Oh my gosh, said Reyna with a mouthful as she reached for another piece. Orion watched her eat for a moment before he began. So I just wanted to update you. We are looking into your companions now. I promise it won't be long. Also, I didn't get a chance to get their names. What were they? Reyna slurped up some juice and swallowed. 
Cairo is my cousin, but he's more like my big brother. Julian is his friend. And my friend, too. Okay, he said. Cairo and Julian. Cairo and Julian. He repeated it a few more times to himself as he committed it to memory. Raina interrupted him. Does everybody here have superpowers like you? Orion looked at her but didn't say anything. Superpowers, you know, like you shoot fire and stuff. Do all, um, Nam do that? The king clinched his jaw a bit. You need not know everything about me or this place or the people in it. You'll be going home soon, remember? Reyna was clearly excited. So, what's your origin story? Orion frowned. My what? Your origin. Superheroes all have origin stories about how they got their powers. Orion stood up. Reyna's excitement waned as she saw the look on his face. I'll let you sort out the rest of the foods Kadok brought you, he said. Without another word, he turned and left the room, closing the door behind him. After a moment, Reyna heard a click. She grew concerned. She hopped out of bed and ran to the door. She tried the door handle. It wouldn't budge. It was as she suspected. She pushed and pulled, but nothing happened. She started banging on the door. Hey! Hey! She called out for some time. There was no return of voice or even footsteps outside. She turned around and leaned her back against the door. She sank to her feet. The tears came again. Raina eventually ate her breakfast, though she spent a whole lot of time inspecting it. It was mostly made up of what she supposed were different types of fruits and veggies. The hot dish seemed like candied yams, only it had a granular quality to it. Another was a veggie that was crunchy like a carrot, but tasted something like a cross between a green apple and a stalk of celery. She was given a pitcher of water, as well as a pot of some kind of tea paired with a small bowl of sugar. The tea was very florally. She decided it tasted like how a daisy smelled, with none of the bitterness of chewing on one like she had done as a smaller child. When she was finished, she began exploring her room. She noticed a door that she had previously assumed was a closet and opened it up. Inside, she found a sink and a toilet. They were a bit different from the ones she had seen, though, as they weren't the customary white porcelain but were made of some other material. She decided to use the bathroom. The sink and toilet worked like normal with running water. The only difference was the sink there didn't seem to have a hot water option. But there was even a bar of soap next to it that didn't smell like much of anything. After a few hours had passed, she heard a knock at the door again. Raina quickly closed the dresser drawer she had been rifling through. In walked Kadok with another tray. Raina smiled. Hello. Good afternoon, miss. You can call me Raina, she said with her hands behind her back, making sure the drawer was closed. <laughs> miss Raina, he nodded as he placed the tray on the nightstand. He removed the picked-apart tray with its dirty dishes from her bed. How has your day been? she asked. Kadok paused and looked at her. It's been good. Thank you. Raina smiled. Was breakfast enjoyable? He asked. Sure, she said. Well, I hope this is even more to your liking. Kadok smiled as he walked out with the dirty tray. As he was closing the door, Raina spoke. Can I eat outside? Kadok stopped and looked at her through the cracked door. Or at like a dinner table or something? Kadok cleared his throat. Um, the king has asked that you be kept in here, uh, for, in this room, for your stay. He says it's a big castle, and he wouldn't want you to get lost while he's trying to find your relatives. Raina frowned. Oh. Kata looked at her with a blank expression, and then turned and let the door shut behind him. Raina heard the click of the lock. She turned back around to the dresser. She opened the drawer again. In it were clothes. Clothes that she found seemed to be for a girl just around her size. They were different than things she had seen before, though. None of them had any tags, which she wasn't used to. But they were also in a style she hadn't really seen in real life. They looked a lot like the kinds of clothes she had seen regular people wear in stories of knights and princesses, although she found neither a suit of armor nor a ballroom dress. 
She began laying out her favorites on the bed before checking out what Kadok had placed on her nightstand. She received another yellow fruit with the blue insides. She was excited about that. But when she lifted the lid of the largest dish on the tray, she almost jumped back. It was hard to decide what it was at first, but she decided on the thing being a kind of fish? It was headless, but had a spiked fin sticking out of the top that went all the way down its back. The fins on the other side were spiked too. The meat between them was pink and covered with a rather pungent, creamy yellow sauce. The whole thing sat in a bed of rice, something she finally recognized. Raina couldn't do it. She put the lid to the side and sat on the bed with her nose in a crinkle. She stared at it for a while and then sighed. She decided she wasn't overly hungry just yet anyway and went back to what she was doing with the outfits. She began straightening them out again and then lifted her pillow. Underneath, she had hidden all the stuff that she liked from the jewelry box as well as what she'd found in another one of the drawers from earlier. She lifted up a necklace with a pretty pink gem cradled in a droplet-shaped pendant. She held it in the light from the window and watched it sparkle. She also found some earrings she was enamored with that were made of silver but were shaped like a diamond. Carved in the center in either side were small eyes, and protruding from the bottom was a metal flourish that looked like a ribbon that held tiny little yellow and blue jewels. She found it quite bizarre, and pretty. As she continued to check out the different things she had collected, she heard the sound of clinking metal on her tray. She whipped her head around to see what it was. This time, she actually did recoil at the side of her plate. On it was a fairly large rat. It was on its hind legs, sniffing at her lunch. She screamed. The rat scurried off the tray and down her nightstand. Raina stood on top of her bed, continuing to scream as she watched the creature slip under her bed. She watched the spot where he had gone under and scanned the edges of her bed for him to come out. Nothing. Okay, 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 that was dumb, she muttered to herself. It's, it's just a rat. I love rats. Under my bed. Raina ultimately loved all animals. She wasn't particularly against any of them, except the mean ones. She'd played with rats at pet stores, but she also knew scary stories about rats from books she read in school. She didn't like the idea of something that could maybe nibble on her at night while she slept. That was a kind of consistent phobia of hers. For instance, she didn't mind spiders at all if she saw them outside. They generally didn't seem to harbor ill will at all. But in her room, she was scared they would hide somewhere and bite her on her arms and legs at night. They weren't completely above doing that. Raina jumped off the bed and knelt down on the floor. She got down on her belly to look under her bed to see if she could see him. She couldn't. The bed was dark, and she thought maybe there were a few other things down there that she hadn't discovered yet. She sighed and got up. She wandered over to the window and opened the hanging curtains all the way. The view was actually very nice. She had checked it out earlier before she started looking through the dresser drawers. She was up high and therefore could see quite a ways out. She was above the trees of the surrounding forest. They seemed busy with activity, even from here. She had seen a bird or two flying over the tops of them, but they were too far away for her to tell what kind. The window didn't open, and she was way too high up to sneak out even if it did. She whispered close to the glass, fogging it up as she did. Kai, where are you? Chapter 6 Keeping Dark Cairo sat up again with a start. He slapped his face and groaned in frustration. He hated feeling mentally foggy. He didn't like the sensation of being out of control of himself. He looked around. He was in a bed again. This one was a bit smaller. It was big enough for just him, and he was all alone in the room. It looked like he was in a cabin. The burlap bag that Harper had given them was in the corner. The door swung open. Good, you're awake. It was Julian holding a book open in his hand. Dude, this thing is full of crazy. I don't even know where to begin. He started flipping through the pages. It actually tells you how to take care of an outhouse. How to shovel it and how to fix it. There's bags of stuff under the sink for it. It's got pictures and everything. Julian brought the book to Cairo's face to show him an illustration of a simple outhouse with a breakdown of its parts and a diagram of the hole underneath, and its measurements. Julian pulled it back and started going through the pages again. 
And apparently it's incredibly important to keep lights on outside at night. There's a section on different fruits and berries to pick and jobs you can apply for in town. Cairo grabbed at the book in his hands. No, man, Julian said, pulling away. You have your own. Look. He went over to the bag in the corner and opened it. He pulled out the book Harper had shown them before they had been put back to sleep. It was clearly hand-bound, wrapped in a front and back cover of leather. It wasn't terribly large, nor was it very heavy when Julian placed it in his friend's hands. The Dezuian Survival Guide? Cairo read aloud. The title was printed on the book's cover in dark letters. Good job reading right after coming off that sleep dart stuff, said Julian. How long you woke up? Cairo said, pointing at him. <laughs> there it is. I don't know, maybe half an hour or something? My room is next door. I looked around a bit and started reading this. Cairo threw the blankets off of himself and put his feet on the floor. Julian warned him about standing up too fast because of the seamy seamy in his system. He tried to stand up anyway, and Julian had to catch him. It wasn't long before Cairo had enough stability to exit his room and look at the rest of the cabin. It wasn't big, and it was rather simple. Just outside his bedroom door was a living area with a cedarwood dining table with four chairs around it. To the right was a simple sink. Toward the other end of the room was an upholstered couch sitting in front of a fireplace. Kyra went straight for the front door, which was located on the left next to the dining table. He burst into the open air, nearly tripping down the few steps at the entrance. Before him was a dirt clearing with low grass a few meters ahead. They were surrounded by very tall and very thick trees. The branches were bursting with green as the sun tried to shine down through them. It was a sight to behold. The trees and plant life looked very well nourished and hydrated, putting their contentment on display. Rita! Cairo called out. Rita! A hand covered his mouth. It was Julian from behind him. He began pulling him back into the house. Are you nuts? How about you read some of the book before you start telling the world where we are? Julian drug him to the dining room table and sat him down. He placed the book in front of him. All right, read the beginning, let your brain come back, and after that we'll figure out the Reina thing. Cairo heaved a sigh and flipped open the leather cover. The title page listed the author as Harper Jennings. As he gradually came to more clarity, Cairo grew ever more interested in what he was reading. The book started out as a welcome and condolences for new arrivals. It instructed them about a few of the survival items that were in the bags and why. Making fire was heavily encouraged with matches, flint rocks, and torches that were already prepared to be lit. The book said it was crucial that one learned how to make fire and never be caught at night without something to produce light. Cairo got up to grab his bag. The way the guide was worded, it was beginning to feel like an interactive activity. He brought it from his room to the table and started laying its contents around Harper's pages. One by one, he placed an axe, a hunter's knife, two small torches, the fire starting materials the section had mentioned, a small sack that he discovered had some hard flat cakes inside, a small pot, three sets of clothes, shoes, some local money, several thin rungs of metal grating with other metal pieces attached, something that looked like a porous rock, and a cylindrical metal item with what appeared to be a mouthpiece at the top. The guide first addressed what to do with the fire starting materials. He was instructed to light the lamps outside and keep them lit until nightfall. Cairo was confused and headed out to see what it meant. He noticed lamps hanging around each outside corner of the house. He took a match and lit each one. They all had a small, shiny black ball of something flammable inside them that shone brightly after they were lit, even during the day. Next, he was to prioritize water and was directed to take the porous stone and the metal cylinder with him. The packet said whatever cabin they had been placed in would not be far off from water. Cairo looked over at Julian, who had brought in kindling from outside that he was placing in the fireplace. He had the axe from his own bag in hand. Did you get to the water part yet? Cairo asked. Nah, he said. I mean, I don't know, because I kind of lost interest. I mean, I was still flipping through, but it's a lot, though. You know me and homework. I know you wouldn't have done any of it if it wasn't for me, said Cairo. Julian smiled big and nodded proudly. Yeah, you remember how this works. You've got the brains, I've got the brawn, and the looks, and the cool, and the ladies, and... Uh-huh, what would I do without you? Cairo said. You'd be cold, that's what. I'm making a fire because it's camping 101. 
You just give me the cliff notes for the test, like always. Cairo got up. Let's take a hike. I think there should be a river or something nearby. There were two buckets located under the table that the book had assigned to each of them. They took them and headed out. The forest was lush and green, with a lot of sounds of various buzzing and chirps. It seemed like a lot of noise for what Kyra supposed had to be midday. The guide was correct. There was a river very close. It was only a minute's walk or two before they could hear the sound of it. When they reached it, it was more like a small stream. Cairo held up the metal cylinder. The manual says this is a kind of bottle, I guess? He twisted the top with the mouthpiece, and it slid right off. They both looked inside. Cairo took two fingers and slid a baggie out of it. It was made of a soft white material and was tied off at the top. It looks like cheesecloth, said Cairo. Julian smirked and then affected pushing up glasses as he spoke with a nasal in his voice. It looks like cheesecloth. Cairo ignored him and held it up to his ear, rattling it around. Does it feel like rocks are in there to you? Julian nodded as he felt the bag. Cairo placed it back in the bottle and knelt down to collect water from the stream. Julian followed suit with his own. Afterwards, they filled up the buckets as well, which held more than they expected. They brought it all carefully through the trees and back to the cabin. They placed them on the floor near the table and read more of the guide. It says the rock is called a gupper sponge, said Cairo. And it's alive. What? Julian grabbed the book and looked at it. He read the instructions aloud. Place the gupper sponge in the bucket and let sit for five minutes. Then remove and set aside. The water will be filtered and safe to drink? Cairo had a look of surprise. He placed the gupper sponge in the bucket with a plunk. He watched. After a moment, they could see the water change. It was very slight, but it seemed to be moving. A living water filter, Cairo said. The gupper bottle has a sack filled with smaller gupper sponges ready to clean your water of bacteria and contagions, Julian said, reading from the guide. So, yeah, I guess it works kind of the same. After the five minutes were up, he pulled the sponge out. It was now soft and squishy. Julian refused to touch it. It felt strange to just lay it on the table to dry out, but the book said the gupper sponge was able to go into a stasis when dry and can go extended periods without food or water. They opened the cabinets above the sink and found cups. As they drank, they opened up the baggie and began eating the crispy flat cakes. They were surprisingly tasty, having a bit of a garlicky flavor. Cairo leaned back in his chair. How long before we can set out for Reina? Is Harper supposed to meet up with us soon? Julian shook his head. I hate to break it to you, bruh, but I think this is it. What do you mean? I flipped ahead, and I mean, I think the book says we're not going anywhere. Cairo frowned. You mean we're supposed to stay here? Without a toilet? <laughs> the book says this is our setup. It says in town we aren't supposed to call ourselves human, but instead we're one of the locals. The people call themselves Nam. What? Cairo said, snatching the book from him. He started flipping frantically. Are you buying this? Is this all really happening? He said as bullet points and sketches of strange creatures whipped by his disbelieving face. Julian leaned back. Well, I mean, we've seen a lot already. Some ridiculous stuff. Because you're trying to justify this in your head just like me, right? Because this is... This, <laughs> this is... Julian nodded. Kai, I hate to break it to you, but I think this is legit. Cairo frowned and looked around. And this is our house, then? We live here now? Julian pressed his lips together and gave him a shrug. Cairo let air out of his lungs like his whole body was deflating. He put the book down in front of him and laid his head face down on the table. How did this happen? His words were muffled by the surface of the table. I had already enrolled with a scholarship and a major, and I had a, I don't know, a general plan for how my life was going to go. Yeah, homeownership this early wasn't in my dream for my best life either, Julian said, looking around the cabin. And no offense, but I also didn't have you in the dream. Plus, there was a big screen. Man, I'm serious. How are we getting out of this? Aren't you worried? 
Julian looked at him, confused. No, I'm not worried. You'll figure it out. Cairo looked up and gave him a disconcerted frown. What are you talking about? Julian shrugged. You figure a way out of everything. Cairo put his elbows on the table and clapped his hands together. He sighed. What on earth makes you think I can get us out of this ridiculous sci-fi movie of a predicament? Julian scoffed. Fog Norton. Cairo's eyes widened and he opened his hands in questioning. What about him? Julian readjusted his feet on the floor. Okay, remember how I always stole his mechanical pencil lead and I used to joke about how dumb he was and how he'd never find out? Cairo nodded. Yeah, and I remember you were way too small to be risking your life like that. Fogg was some kind of middle school size aberration. Also, he wasn't nice. Like, at all. Right, I was dumb, he said. But remember how you got me out of it when he found out? I paid him three dollars for missing pencil lead, which you never spotted me for, said Cairo with his eyebrows lowered. Yeah, but he still didn't let it go. And then I was walking home, and he found me, and was about to jump me. But then you were there. Dude, what does this have to do with anything? You said you knew he was going to beat me up because it didn't sit right, his reaction when you paid him. So you followed him and found out what he was going to do. You never skipped class. But this one time, you skipped your after-school workshop to walk me home instead, so I would have backup. I'm still at a loss as to why you're bringing this up. Julian put his hands out. I thought I was gonna die that day. You definitely would have. Fogg was out of his mind. His brothers were psychos. That kid did not grow up well. My point is, Julian said, I got into something stupid and you got me out of it. You've done it over and over. I'd follow you to the ends of the earth, and I'd be sure you'd get us out of anything. <sighs> If all of this is true, then we already reached the ends of the earth, Cairo said. Julian put his arms out to present himself. And here I am. Cairo faintly smiled. Then he chewed on his lip and sighed. Does it say where to find food? These crackers or whatever aren't going to last long. Julian raised an eyebrow and snatched his book off the table. He mumbled as he leafed through the pages. You were supposed to be giving me the cliff notes, but since you have some kind of existential crisis. He finally found a section marked food and scavenging. All right, have you ever foraged before? Oh, no. Done any trapping or hunting lately? Oh, that's apparently where we're at unless we go into town. But it says to follow the manifestation rule before contact with the locals. What's that? I don't know. I don't do homework, remember? He said, giving the pages a flip with his thumb. We don't have time for this. I don't care what he said. We are finding a way home. But first, I'm finding my cousin. There he is, Julian said with a smile. Is there a section in there about how to reach someone for help? Can we contact Harper again? We don't even have a phone in here. Julian started looking through the pages again. He stopped and scanned a section for a moment. In case of emergency, contact Talia the Night Huntress. Night Huntress? Kyra repeated. Julian's eyebrows slowly raised as he continued to read in silence. What is it? Kyra said. It tells you how to contact her, and it's very weird. What, man? Come on. Julian closed his eyes and shook his head. He handed Cairo the guidebook, open to the page he was reading. Cairo scanned it. Huh. Julian realized the light was beginning to fade as he latched the cage closed. They had set up both of the traps that Harper had given them just a little ways into the forest around their property. They had placed them in an area full of brush that was peppered with a kind of seed the manual had said was a local treat for small animals. The bait was a smelly paste they had carved out of a local tree. They had spent the rest of the day trying to sort out how to catch food, and this was the last of Julian's task for his trapping tutorial. He stood up and looked around. The ground was covered in a raised bed of dark green leaves, splayed out, trying to collect the last bits of sunlight. The last time he'd seen Cairo, he was headed down a hill to his right and had disappeared. Julian headed over and saw, just a bit down the hill's incline, 
his friend kneeling in front of something. Julian wandered over and looked over Cairo's shoulder. In his hand was a creature that was shaped like a small diamond. It had an exoskeleton like a grasshopper and small insect legs on the bottom edge of the diamond shape. In the center was a large eye. It was eerily human and was wide, darting around in what could clearly be interpreted as fear. Yo! Julian said, jumping back. You're touching that thing? Why are you touching it? Cairo stood up. You're going to need to, too. This is it. Watch. He turned around and held it in front of him. They both watched in silence and stayed still. The eyeballs on either side of the thing wandered around, looking at the two of them carefully. Slowly, the eyes started to relax. At the top point of the diamond, opposite the side with the insect legs, a tiny little floating ribbon began to peek out. Gradually, it revealed itself to be three translucent glowing ribbons that wafted from the diamond's point. They floated upward and began to spin and dance, creating a dazzling display of alternating color. Julian heard himself let air out of his chest as he took in the sight. Cairo lifted up his other hand, holding the hunter's cage. Julian helped him hold down the metal spring trap so he could carefully place the creature inside. It was large enough that it couldn't quite fit through the openings of the cage. It wandered around, continuing its light display. They both looked around, and gradually the forest floor began to be littered with ribbons of flashing color peeking up above the foliage. Okay, nine more to go, said Cairo. It didn't take long to collect all they needed. There was a sea of dancing rainbow lights as the little things signaled to each other. Julian had to get past his fear of the creepy crawly long enough to pick them up with the tips of his fingers. But once he did, it wasn't so bad. The bugs weren't overly concerned with self-preservation. When they were approached, their ribbons would die down a bit, and they would give the boys a bit of a chase before letting themselves be picked up. Once placed in the cage with the others, they seemed to interact with each other by using their ribbons as feelers. Julian thought he could hear them making tiny chirps to each other as well. Once they had all ten, Cairo placed the cage on the ground in front of them. Okay, you ready? Cairo said. Yeah. Several of the little creatures' expressive eyes looked up at the towering figures above them while the rest continued interacting with one another. Cairo took a deep breath. One, two, three. Both of them screamed down into the cage at the top of their lungs. The eyeballs in the cage all widened and shot in all directions. They could see them tremble in the flash before all the ribbons retracted and the cage went dark. Julian began laughing. Cairo smiled in the dark and shook his head as he leaned down to open the trap. That's messed up. Julian kept laughing as the little creatures quickly scurried past Cairo's hand and out of the cage. Hey, those are the instructions. What are you going to do? Julian said, amusement still in his voice. Cairo stood up once the cage was empty and looked around. His eyebrows drew together. Um, where did the rest go? Julian's smile fell from his face as he realized Cairo was right. The ribbons were gone. The forest floor was dark again. The sun is down. Completely. Whispered Cairo, staring into the darkness of the trees. He looked back towards their cabin. He could see the light of its lanterns glowing beyond the trees. A low hum rose from the silence. It sounded like the shuffling of feet. It sounded like a lot of feet. It was the kind of noise that felt like you shouldn't be able to hear it from far off, but the sheer abundance of pitter-patter defied its natural state. The two briefly shared a look of terror in the darkness. They took off toward the cabin as the sound began to increase. The footsteps had risen to the sound of a soft-padded stampede. It drowned out the sound of their own footsteps as they reached the bright light of the lanterns. In the night, the lanterns cut through the darkness and bathed the cabin in a light not unlike what they had seen in the first village they encountered. Each lantern created a light aura that stretched around the cabin so no shadows from the night could penetrate. They ran inside and shut the door. They sat nervously at the table in the dark. The rising sound grew so loud the cabin felt like it was beginning to shake. Finally, it reached a crescendo and held there. The sound of the stampede surrounded the whole house, now peppered with yelps, cries, and a few growls. It went on for some time. Cairo finally couldn't take it. 
He stood up. No, get down! Julian hissed. Cairo crept over to the closed window over the sink. It was covered with large wooden shutters. He undid the latches to them and opened them just enough to create a tiny crack to peek through. There, beyond the glow of the light, was a streaming flood of black fur. It was an impossible horde of black dogs. They were parted like a river, flowing around the light of the cabin. He could make out that some were fighting and biting one another as they ran. Some sniffed the air, others the ground as they combed the forest floor for food. As he kept watching to make out shadows in the dark, Cairo felt a chill run down his spine. Right at the edge of the veil of darkness, a massive quartet of paws paced over one another, back and forth. Raised an uncomfortable height off the ground was a large set of glowing eyes. A large wet nose ventured into the light and crinkled as it snapped itself back behind the veil. From the quick glimpse of its snout, Kyra could make out the outline of the creature. It was a dog with a shoulder height that looked about as tall as the doorway of the cabin. It was sniffing them out. A deep, bellowing snarl shook the ground as the gleaming teeth snapped at one of the passers-by. The smaller dog cried out as the larger caught it by the nape of its neck. It crouched and scurried away to catch up with the rest of the crowd. The larger dog quit its pacing and followed it into the furry black current. Cairo jumped as he felt a hand on his back. He heaved a sigh as he realized it was only Julian. He let him switch spots to look through the shutters. Cairo sank to the floor. He could visibly see Julian tense up as soon as he saw the sight. A sliver of light from the shutters scanned across Julian's face as he shook his head. Home sweet home. Chapter 7 Firas Fingers gingerly held the handle of the small paintbrush as he finished the deep black of the creature's eye. He was happy with the result, but it was the color of the body that he was most concerned with. He had searched high and low for the color ingredients. When he had seen the way the sunlight shimmered across the fox's fur, he knew he had to find the right mixture to do it justice. His arm looked like it was sculpted from marble as he reached over and picked up the ceramic container he had collected it in. He brought it to his nose and closed his eyes as he took in the intricate scents deep inside. He'd had to harvest a few berries to get it just right. His eyes opened and a satisfactory expression washed over his face. Hey, Ori. The king's face emerged from the dark, softly lit by a flickering light emanating from the open door and a fireplace just inside the home. The king observed the man as he sat outside on a stump, leaned over a small bench that held his painting supplies. You usually meet me halfway. Did I finally sneak up on you this time? said the king. I smelled you a mile away, the man said. When you get too close, the stench just gets distracting. It's awkward if I don't acknowledge you. You know, I am busy. Orion rolled his eyes and leaned up against the giant tree trunk that was the man's home. He looked inside. It really was remarkable how he had converted it. The fireplace was built in. It must have been handcrafted. Little painted wooden sculptures decorated the whole house. They were remarkably intricate, depicting creature after creature, large and small. They were on shelves above his bed and a few on the table. Some lined the covered windows. The windows were also well put together. They had shutters that, when closed, made the outside look indistinguishable from an average tree not to mention the door, which also appeared to have a similar camouflage effect when closed. Walking through the forest, there was a good chance you'd never know the tree was a house at all. <sighs> Faras, you truly are my shame, Orion said, smiling at his craftsmanship. What's the mark? He said, his eyes still fixed on the sleek wooden fox he was turning over in his hand. Orion squinted and turned to the back of Faras's head. Why do I keep coming back to you? When you're good, you're good, he said, taking a larger brush and dipping it inside the wide ceramic vial. And I'm the best. Orion sighed. 
He watched him as the brush came out with a shimmering blue and silver. Faras began slowly detailing the fox. You know, I hate it when you don't look at me while I'm speaking, the king said. He kept painting. The bristles of the brush wrapped around the jagged ears of the sculpture. Without taking his eyes from the figurine, he reached his brush toward the container again. A loud pop rang out in the dark. Faras looked to see his vial blown into glowing charred bits on the ground. The paint was splattered everywhere. The bench, the ground, and on him. Faras gave a very exaggerated sigh. He briefly scrunched his nose as he picked a piece of the charcoal vial off his partially painted wet fox. He set it on the bench and rotated himself on the stump. At your service, my leash, he said, looking directly into his eyes. Orion rubbed his temple. Two young men, late teens, early twenties. One is taller and black, with short black hair. Clean cut. Cairo is his name. The other is a light brown skin tone. Not where you're from, though. More like South American? Sure. He's also clean cut and black hair, but straight, not curly. He's called Julian. Faras rested his elbows on his knees and cracked his knuckles. Anything else? Running with anyone? Weapons? No weapons, no battle experience. They're fresh crossovers. I wouldn't be surprised if they still had on their clothes from the other side. Harper got to them, but I doubt they're staying with him. Faras smiled. Oh, Harper, huh? He took him right from under you. That guy is a legend. By my count, once I get these two, I still have two more marks for you. But the offer's still good to get an official payroll for just him, right? Orion smirked. It definitely couldn't hurt the prospect. But an invisible man and his telepath protector might be a bit much, even for you. Faras's grin grew wider. I see you, Ori. Gunning for the ego. Keep it up. It's working. The king gave a knowing grin. Focus on the boys. You can fry bigger fish later. <laughs> All right. Last scene. They crossed over in Taurine. He couldn't have taken them too far on foot at night. Plus, I think he drugged them. Consider it done. I'll call you at the nearest crossover. And alive, Orion said. Don't give me a repeat of the last one. It got done, didn't it? You know the rules. I see to it that it's done. I know. You'll live long if you stop micromanaging. Don't do it for me. Do it for you. Orion turned around and began to walk away from the warm glow of the tree trunk house. Firas saw him become a shadow that began fading into the dark before he stopped in his tracks. The king flipped back around. Why aren't you painting inside? It's peak hunting hours. Firas shrugged. There's nothing out here but us monsters. The king scoffed. Firas heard his footsteps resume travel deep into the woods. Orion prepared himself for the night and put on his evening clothes. It was far too late to do anything but sleep, and yet he found himself in his study trying to wind down with a book from his library. It was one on tactics that he found particularly boring, but occasionally had its useful tidbits. It was the perfect thing to combat his insomnia. A knock on the large wooden doors of his study wasn't common, especially because most of his servants were sleeping. They also knew that if he was in his study during the wee hours of the morning, he was trying to relax. But the knock came all the same. Come in, he said. The large, deep auburn doors swung open gently to reveal a light purple face. Your Highness, I'm so sorry to disturb. Kadok, please, you of all people know not to call me that. Kadok nodded. I know, but it's late, and you never disturb me for nothing. What is it? Well, thank you, he said. It's just... I caught her in the mural hall. She escaped her room. Orion's eyebrow went up. Can she walk through walls? No, it, it's... Kadok gave a heavy sigh before continuing. She said there was a rat in her room. He showed her the way out. Orion closed his book and laid it on his desk. He raised both his eyebrows now. Come again? It was a rat, sir. She said it told her where to go. Orion stared at him, his face frozen for a moment. 
Let me speak with her. Raina sat in her room on the bed with her hands folded like she was in trouble. The door opened to reveal Orion with a look on his face she couldn't quite read. He came around to the foot of the bed. He was followed quickly by Kadok, who came up behind him with a chair. The king sat down, not taking his eyes off the girl. Kadok quietly left the room, leaving the door open. Orion's countenance softened as he could see the unease on the girl's face. She shifted uncomfortably and kept her eyes averted. Orion spoke. You don't have to be afraid of me. I'm not angry. Raina looked down at her hands. Kadok told me something surprising. He paused and waited for her. Raina kept looking at her hands. Hey, he said quietly. He leaned forward. Raina looked up at him. It's all right, he said softly. Really, you don't have to worry. I just want to talk. Raina looked into his eyes. They seemed more kind than she had seen them before. She relaxed a bit. So tell me about your new friend, he said. You say he spoke to you? Raina rubbed her hands on her thighs. She spoke slowly and quietly. Sort of? Explain sort of for me, he said. Raina frowned. You believe me? Orion looked vaguely surprised. Why wouldn't I? Because no one ever believes me. Orion's expression became blank. He said nothing. Raina had looked away and seemed to be thinking. I don't usually explain it to people, except to Cairo and Dad. He believes me most of the time. He kind of has to. I don't think he wants to believe I can talk to animals. He doesn't really like me to tell people or talk about it at all. But with animals, it's not like talking with words, but we just kind of know what we mean. Orion's face changed. Raina couldn't decide what his expression meant. It seemed like concern. Can you describe that to me a bit more? What was it like? He said as he leaned back, staying attentive. I haven't really talked to that many rats before, but just like with most other animals, I just knew, you know. All animals think differently. He thinks more in smells and little squeaks, like he needed to smell to talk or, or in sounds that are kind of hard to make. The king's brow lowered. You've always been like this, even before you came to Dezu? She nodded her head and looked down at her lap again for a moment. That sounds dumb, huh? Everyone thinks I'm dumb when I talk like this. The king leaned forward in his chair a bit. No, darling, that's not dumb at all. He stood up very abruptly and cleared his throat. Thank you. We'll talk more later. As he turned to leave, Raina thought she saw that his eyes were watery. He took a step outside of the room and stopped with two fingers on the side of the door frame. Um, don't worry about the door being locked. We'll keep it open. I'm sorry about that. Just let any of my people know if you need anything. He looked at her for a moment. His knuckles grew white, pressed hard against the frame. He tapped them twice quickly against the wood and then disappeared around the corner, leaving Raina staring at the open door to the dark hallway. Raina sat suddenly cold on her bed. She couldn't imagine why what she had just said must have bothered him so much. She warmed her arms with her hands as the draft came in from the hall. She got up and walked to the doorway to peek outside. No one was in sight. She decided she wanted it closed anyway for now. She went back into her room, shutting the door behind her. Chapter 8 Manifestation Cairo's palms felt very sweaty. He rubbed them on his new pants over and over again as his legs dangled from the back of the wagon. Julian thought he was nervous. It's all right, man. We got this, he said, giving his shoulder a gentle, reassuring shake. His legs dangled off the wagon next to him. He spoke low enough that the driver couldn't hear. Cairo readjusted his open vest. 
It didn't fit too bad, all things considered. When they had changed earlier that morning, he had wondered if Harper had measured them while they slept. Julian had flipped through the Dezuian survival guide until they found the section about Talia again. Wherever they were, the book said they would be near a town. If they wanted to meet Talia after sending the signal, they had to find their way into the town the following morning. This led to a reference for another section of the book that discussed travel and city dwelling. The book said if you could make it to a main road, you could hitchhike into the nearest town on someone's wagon or selling cart. In exchange, though, it was customary to assist a seller going to market with unloading their goods. You could also work for them for a small wage as a wandering hand, a kind of freelance volunteer to the local market sellers. So the two addressed themselves in the local fashion as provided by Harper and collected their things in the burlap bags he had given them. They didn't know or much think about when they would be back, but as Cairo locked the doors with the key they had been given, he noticed for the first time that the doors of the house had holsters meant for barricades. It explained the wooden slats he had found stacked near the couch. He thought last night would have been a very good time to have known about them. He decided it didn't matter whether or not he had gotten to know all the ins and outs of the house. As he left that morning, he told himself he would never be back here again. If he could help it, once he'd retrieved Reyna, he'd make sure not to spend another night in this place called Dezu. The man who had stopped for them on the road was a light-skinned man with sandy brown hair and hazel eyes. He must have been somewhere in his late thirties with a friendly smile as he sat atop his wagon. Next to him sat what the boys had decided must have been his son. Not much more was expressed other than a gesture for the two of them to get in the back, indicating to them how common a wandering hand must have been. Cairo leaned his back up against the wooden crates and sacks bundled up behind them, still rubbing his hands on his clothes. This whole thing had been strange, and it was true that he was feeling nervous about going into the city. But the way his hands were sweating, he wasn't that nervous. He couldn't keep his palms dry for the life of him. You should make a list. You always feel better when you make lists, right? Julian said with a reassuring smile. Then he added, I mean, like, you should do it in your head because we don't have paper. They had been paying attention to the direction they were going, but the book assured them that whoever was traveling with goods on the road would be heading into the nearest town. So when the wagon stopped, it took them a moment to realize why. They turned around to see a stone wall, perhaps about 10 to 12 feet high. They were positioned in front of its entrance, a large set of open steel doors. They clearly needed two people to drag them open, as they were tall and wide enough to let caravans of various sizes through. There, two men stood at the ready with short swords holstered at their sides. A third man in the center walked up to address their wagon. He looked friendly and casually spoke to the driver about his goods with a smile. After a short discussion, he was given the go-ahead and they continued forward. As the boys passed the guards, they tried not to look out of place. They gave them a wave. The two men on either side of the doors gave them a friendly nod. Julian cocked his head as he noticed the guard on his side of the wagon had something going on with his nose. It was pointed in a way that felt very alien. He couldn't put his finger on why. Within a few minutes, they started putting things together. Both of them sat on the back of the wagon, dumbfounded as they entered the crowd within the town walls. It appeared this was a trading town because they saw little of actual homes. Instead, the streets were filled with small businesses and stands. People were calling out goods and services and forming lines. Uh, dude? Cairo nodded. Yeah, man. I'm seeing it too. The streets were filled with various types of people they hadn't seen before. Some had blue skin of different shades, others were green. Some children nearby were chasing one another and had bright neon orange and yellow skin. A girl around their age was carrying a woven basket with bright white hair that stood up like a mohawk. Her hair contrasted with her skin, which was ink black. She watched their wagon pass with crystal blue eyes. Neither of them could stop staring at her. There are plenty of skin types that they had seen before, too, but some of them had pointed ears and strange eyebrows. Julian thought they looked like a hodgepodge of things he'd seen in sci-fi movies. A large man with a booming voice was calling out some foreign word they had never heard. His nose was ribbed all the way down and his bald head had the same markings all the way to the back. They were so distracted by him that they were startled when the wagon came to a stop at an empty lot. 
Their driver got out and smiled at them as he nodded towards the goods they were leaning on. Cairo cleared his throat as they got off and began unloading. The two were silent as they tried to follow his instructions as to where he wanted each box and sack to be placed. It didn't take long to unload. Cairo leaned over to the side of the wagon to grab another sack filled with a type of potato he'd never seen. At the same time, Julian reached over to grab a small barrel of something. Well, at least our guy has normal skin, Julian whispered. Cairo smacked him on the shoulder. What? Is that racist? Dude, yes. Julian looked around until he spotted a fountain not terribly far into the crowd. It seemed to match the guidebook's description, even from where he stood. There it is, he said. Cairo looked over in the same direction and nodded. Go ahead and head over. There isn't much left to unload. Cool. Julian let go of the barrel he was starting to lift. He brushed his hands off and headed in the direction of the fountain. Cairo lifted his potato sack. The book stated it was customary to help someone unload in exchange for a ride, but payment was only given if you stayed for a half a day or a full day of selling goods and services. As long as one of them stayed to finish unloading, they would have paid their due to their driver. Cairo placed the potatoes near where the man and his son were setting up in their cart. He felt the sweatiness of his hands increase as he headed back to the wagon for another load. He looked to see Julian standing next to the fountain in the distance. Julian was leaned over the rim of the fountain looking in. It was round and made of an off-white stone. Underwater at the bottom, the stone had the same flame emblazoned in it that they had seen before in the crossover sanctuary. Julian put his hand in the pool and swished some water around. It was cool, but not too cool. Perfect for swimming, he thought. He sat on the edge of the fountain and looked around at the people doing business around him. He didn't seem to be the particular interest of anyone in the tumult of the city. He looked just like them. The clothes they wore felt like he was wearing a costume, but they were comfortable. He looked in the direction of Cairo, who looked like he was struggling with the last sack or two that he had left. He was leaned down, picking up potatoes from a sack he had dropped. He seemed to be having a hard time getting a good grip on each individual potato. Julian's eyebrows creased. His friend was starting to look rather awkward. Cairo lifted the sack and it slipped. He lifted again. It slipped once more. Julian found himself whispering to him under his breath. Dude, just pick it up. It seemed Cairo was incapable. He was now gathering the potatoes in a pile, sweeping them together awkwardly with his outstretched fingers. Julian could tell, even from a distance, that they were collecting street grime. The embarrassment was palpable as the stand owner and his son watched him. They looked rather irritated. This went on for a painfully extended period of time. Julian was so caught up in his friend's plight that he hadn't noticed the hooded figure that had now circled him in the fountain nearly three times. Cairo's leg seemed to stiffen before he fell over into the pile of potatoes he had clumsily and painstakingly mounted. They rolled all over the ground again. Julian couldn't handle it anymore. He ran back to help him. Are you okay? He said with a laugh in his throat. Cairo was on his back on a lumpy bed of raw potatoes. Yeah, Noah, man, I'm great. What does it look like? He reached his hand out and Julian took it to lift him. He immediately lost his grip. Dude, your hands are freezing, he said. Why are they slippery? He could see in Cairo's eyes that amongst the frustration, they were tinged with fear. There's something wrong with me. Julian could see little flecks of white forming on his eyelashes. He knelt down and put his arm around his shoulder to lift him up. It looked like both of his legs were stiff now. They held their position as Julian brought him to his feet. They acted like jointless prosthetics all the way up to his hips. Julian apologized to the wagon driver and his son as he carried his hobbling friend away. He made it back to the fountain through the hustle of the people. A few shot concerned glances in their direction and a couple stopped to watch. Cairo slumped to the edge of the fountain and peered in at what he could see of his reflection. Julian touched his leg. Bro, you are freezing. Your legs are hard as rocks. Cairo looked him in the eyes. He looked very scared. Julian frowned. Then he put on a brave face. He reached down into the fountain briefly to check the temperature again. Here, he said, as he grabbed Cairo's cold, slick hand and put it into the water. Cairo leaned over and put his other hand in. He began shaking and rubbing them together under the surface to rinse them. 
It didn't seem to do much. Kyra pulled his hands out and rubbed them together and then put them back in. It wasn't helping. It actually seemed to be getting worse. A strange particulate began to form in the water around his fingers. Julian started to see it too. Uh, that's not... The particulate grew and grew. It was like crystals forming in the water. Kyra felt his hands getting harder and harder to rub together. His eyes widened as he felt them completely stiffen up. They were stuck together, surrounded by something. He began lifting his hands out of the water when in a flash the water changed. It was clear to both of them now as the fountain's contents completely solidified. Ice? said Julian. Cairo's hands were now frozen mid-pull from the water, but the water didn't just have a sheet over the top of it. The entire fountain had one solid block of ice now fixed inside it. Cairo began yanking his arms back. His hands were stuck firmly inside. He pulled and pulled with grunts of desperation. J Julian? <laughs> Julian began looking around frantically for something to break the ice with. Right, right, okay, uh... A crowd began forming quickly. It wasn't long before people started shouting and calling others over. They looked at the solid clear block and Cairo stuck in it, with some touching the rock-hard surface just to check. It wasn't until the ice began slowly crawling up the young man's arms that people began shouting. He's, He's been, been carsing! He's been carsing! He's been carsing! Vin Carsey! Carsey! Vin Carsey! Gods! Gods! The gods! Don't! Vin Carsey! Vin Carsey! Julian had stopped trying to break the solid block of the fountain and moved to Cairo's arms. He was making progress and chipping away the thinner layers by pounding it with his fists, only for it to form the layer again. Cairo was making a low, fearful groan in an attempt to release some tension so he didn't panic. A few started to look back into the crowded marketplace. Some suddenly left the fountain altogether. Cairo and Julian were too distracted to notice what was going on, but the crowd's attention slowly started leaving them. Before they knew it, there was an uproar happening outside of the group crowded around the fountain. Soon, no one was looking at the steadily freezing Cairo. Their attention had turned towards the inner walls of the market. Flags were stationed there. Neither of the boys had really noticed them when they entered. They lined each wall, flapping with the insignia of a flame. Ironically, they were being consumed by a rising fire. Gradually, a panic began to make its way through the people. Carts were being loaded and stands taken down out of fear. Julian kept at his fist pounding. It was all to no avail. The ice was thickly coating Cairo's shoulders and back. I've got to grab something. I can't do this with my bare hands. I I'm sorry, I have to go look for something. Julian's voice was pleading as he faded into the panicking crowd. Cairo lost the tear-distorted figure of his friend as the ice crept up his back. He couldn't move his head. A helmet of ice slinked over the back of his cranium and inched down his forehead. A separate sheet covered his chin and began encasing his bottom lip. He resisted against the stiffness of his body and realized he was wholly unable to move now. The ice had taken all of him. For a moment, as the last bit of his nostrils were overtaken, he thought of all the times he considered his own death. He couldn't possibly have ever foreseen this. He held his breath. His eyes now peered through a sheet of ice that only allowed him to see colors, shapes, and shadows. The panic had come in waves and a new tide was coming. His life was about to end in a muffled scream. One of the shadows made him hold it back. Something completely filled his field of limited vision through the ice. The shadow turned from dark to intensely bright. Cairo squeezed his eyes shut. All at once he could breathe! He could hear. His eyes snapped open to see a face. It was a young woman. A beautiful one. He felt like he could go swimming in the eyes that peered down at him. She was kneeling over him as she pulled her hand from his nose and mouth. Cairo could feel the heat coming from it. Hey, w what are you doing to him? Her hair whipped over Cairo's face as she turned her head to the sound of Julian's voice coming out of the herd of panicked people. She then turned back and made a fist. With a single strike to Cairo's ice-covered belly, the solid shell all over his body cracked and gave way. Cairo flopped onto the ground like a fish. 
She stood over him while looking toward the congestion of wagons and patrons around the exit. Her voice came out smooth and low. You guys are idiots. Chapter 9 Talia The girl had told them to keep up as they followed her out of the market. They did for a while, and yet somehow they had lost her. They had blended into the crowd, taking the main road out of town with everyone else. No one seemed to recognize them as the ones who had just caused the scene moments earlier. Quite a few villagers had created a perimeter of onlookers as they watched from outside the walls to see if the flames were going to progress any further than the flags. A crew of men had been dispatched inside the stone walls to contain the fire inside. Using the commotion to their advantage, the boys had slipped off the road and into the trees. They went some ways without their mysterious guide before they finally stopped, not knowing where else to go. The two looked around until they were both startled by the sight of the girl up a tree. She was staring down at them, crouching on a branch with angry green eyes. You broke the manifestation rule, she said. Julian looked around. And what is that, exactly? The girl raised her eyebrows. You didn't read the manual. No, no, we did, said Cairo. Well, kind of. I, I mean, it's been a whole rough day or two. It's hard to sit down and read a whole... How did you find out about me? She asked. <laughs> so you are Talia, Cairo said with a smile. The girl scoffed. You needed to read it cover to cover, not just skim it. We thought we caught all the important parts, said Julian. Her nostrils flared as she sighed. The manifestation rule is, do not expose yourself to the public unless your delinium faculty has manifested and you have mastered control of it sufficiently enough to keep it hidden. Julian smirked. I don't even know what a delinium faculty is, so yeah, we probably broke that one. Cairo smiled at his friend. Do you get a pass if you don't understand half the rule? Talia shook her head and rolled her eyes. Well, have fun breaking the rest, she said, standing up on the branch. Hey, just for kicks and giggles, I'll give you another rule to break. Don't die. Out here, there's a lot of inventive ways to break that one. She hopped toward the trunk of the tree and kicked up off of it, disappearing into the canopy. Cairo quickly ran up to the tree base. Wait, hold up. He looked up and she was gone. There was no sign of her, not even a rustling. Julian leaned down and grabbed a handful of stones. He sorted them as he walked up beside Cairo, whose gaze was still in the tree. Julian picked a pebble and looked up, squinting. He reared his hand back and threw it up into the canopy. It bounced around the leaves before coming down. Julian looked into his hand and started to dig for another. Cairo reached out and grabbed his wrist. What are you doing? Julian looked at him blankly. I'm trying to... Just don't. Don't throw rocks at girls. You're supposed to learn that before middle school. Julian dropped his handful of rocks and brushed his hands off. He squinted up again. She's quick, huh? Cairo moved around the trunk and then onto the other trees, keeping his eyes up. He began calling out. I'm sorry, okay? We really need your help. Like, really, really. The girl came sliding down a nearby tree, not the one they had seen her disappear into. She leaned against it with her arms folded. Cairo smiled as he approached her. Thank you. Obviously you know your way around, and we don't even know up from down. I mean, like, do fountains in town just unleash freeze attack on people, or what? He said with an awkward laugh. You're a Vincarsi? She said. Julian widened his eyes. Uh, was that a slur? It means powerful one or one with power. It's in the guidebook. There's an index of terms. The boys looked at each other in silence. Cairo cleared his throat. Like superpowers? Sure. So you're saying it was me that made the fountain freeze? That's what I'm telling you. Julian spoke up. 
How did he get ice powers? Talia gritted her teeth. Okay, I'm supposed to be called in emergencies? I'm not here to emergency explain everything to you. You had a cabin and food and plenty of time to read the book. Just humor us, okay? Please, said Cairo. Talia sighed. All humans who come to Dezu become Vincarsi. You get a superpower or delinium faculty. She paused to give Julian a look. That they need to get under control so they don't draw suspicion when out in public. The boys felt slightly patronized by her tone as she continued. You don't want to draw suspicion because we are ruled by a king who wants to murder you. Therefore, you were supposed to stay in the cabin and have your little emotional crisis at home while munching on dried biscuits before going into public and announcing to the world where you are and how ill-equipped you are to handle life. The boys sat quietly for a moment. Talia maintained her stance, leaned up against the tree, and said nothing. Cairo mustered his courage to speak up again. I'm... we're sorry... We had to leave. We're in a hurry. We need to get my cousin back and get home. It's as simple as that. We don't know anything about how all this works and where to go. We need help. Talia rolled her eyes. Okay, as you can see, I'm not great at breaking people in on these things gently. Harper usually does the explaining before he gives you all your stuff. But you're not going home. This is it. This is your new home, and now you have to- Look, we've heard all that said Julian, coming up behind Cairo. But you're telling it to the wrong guy. Talia turned her gaze back to Cairo, whose eyes were pleading with her. Look, I need this. Reina's... She's a special girl. She's special to me. When my parents... He stopped. He squeezed his eyes shut and rubbed his forehead. Talia wasn't sure what was happening for a moment. Give... Give me a second, <laughs> he said, turning away. He was facing Julian now. His friend looked at him with a concerned look on his face. He placed his hand on his shoulder and looked at Talia. His uncle adopted her the same time as his parents' divorce. He's an only child. His uncle got him out of the house when things were getting ugly at home. Helping him take care of Reina was a big part of what got him through things. Cairo was squeezing the tears from his eyelids with his fingers. This isn't where he'd been trying to take this. He needed her, Julian said. And they needed each other. He collected his own family. I'm his brother, she's his sister, that's just how it is. Cairo finally collected himself and turned around. He huffed. I could never live with myself if I let anything happen to her. If you don't help us, then I'm sure I'll kill myself trying to do it alone. So please, just give us a fighting chance. Talia stared at him a while. She frowned a bit. She put her arms up, laced her fingers on her head, and groaned as she turned away. Look, even if I wanted to help you, this is more about whether or not it's possible. There's no way for me to get you home. No one goes back to Earth. So you're saying that nobody, not a one, has ever gone back? Said Julian. No, not on record, no. It just doesn't happen. How is that even possible? Said Cairo. It can't just be a one-way street. It really is, she said. You walked off a cliff and you survived the fall. There's no way back up, so just be glad you're alive. Cairo folded his arms. I just don't... I... I can't believe you. Talia shrugged. Then don't. Julian raised an eyebrow. What about off the record? What? Cairo nodded at his friend and then looked back to Talia. Right, there's gotta be like a legend or something. Someone who knows someone who said they had a friend who found a way back. Talia let out a big sigh and turned away from them. Come on, give me something he said. She shook her head, looking down at the ground. I don't have time for this. Head home, read the book, get used to it. Don't call me again. 
She took a few steps away and then started into a sprint. Wait, please! She dashed up the side of a tree with some low branches nearby and disappeared. Kyra's shoulders sank. Neither could hear any movement. She was gone. Julian frowned. I don't like her. Cairo turned around to face him as he palmed his temple and looked into the trees. He started pacing. I don't even... How do we get... Oh, rude, right? She was rude. If I wanted to go back to the cabin, which I don't, I don't even know which way to go. I don't even know how you far we are from the main road. Going on, We're she like babies been cool out here. If she's R nine one one, then I'm not calling anymore. You know, this is why people this don't trust place, the system. This place, man, guns. we can't catch up. A- they both stopped at the sound of a thump on the forest floor. They turned to look behind them. It was a man. He'd clearly fallen from the trees as the leaves wafted to the ground next to him. He had landed on his feet in a crouch and then stood up. Well, hey, he said with a nod of his head. If he had had a hat, he would have tipped it. Hello, Cairo said slowly. The man smiled and began slowly pacing in front of them. His body looked like it had been sculpted out of marble. He had a darker complexion and was tall, but not excessively. His dark eyes peered from under a lowered brow, staring them down with something unsettling in them. A dark intent was there, concealed by little to nothing in his expression. "'Who are you?' said Cairo. The man cocked his head. "'Anyone from Dezu would know exactly who I am. So if you don't, that means you're not from Dezu. And if you're not from Dezu, that means I know exactly who you are.' Cairo took a slight and instinctive step back. The man chuckled. It looks like I'll have to introduce myself, though I prefer my reputation to precede me. I am the man, the myth, the menace. The people call me Fearus the Great. I'm the hunter who never misses his mark. Oh boy, here we go. Came Julian's voice from behind Cairo. He was peeking around his friend as he watched the man pace. The man called Fearis peered around Cairo to address him. You ever been hunted before? Julian cleared his throat and spoke under his breath. Only by the ladies. Julian often joked inappropriately to himself. It was a way to self-soothe when he was uncomfortable. But his eyes widened when Fearis began to laugh. From where he was, there was no way he'd actually heard that. Hey, I like that. Rambunctious. Ferris said. It's all right. Generally, I wouldn't say being my prey is as fun as that, but fortunately for you, it'll be your first and last time. With a motion of the arm, a glint of light reflected off the surface of a blade. He had produced it seemingly from nowhere. It was a knife the size of the man's forearm with a width to it that seemed excessive. The boys took a step back. Julian opened his mouth to say something when the ruffle of tree branches was heard. Another thump struck the ground. It was Talia. She stood with her back to them, facing the man called Fearis. Despite her small stature, she stood like a formidable wall between him and the boys, staring the hunter down. Her stance said she was prepared for anything. Fearis sighed. You just couldn't stay away, could you? You know I can't stand by and watch this, she said. Fearis shrugged. You didn't have to watch. They were slowly starting to pace together in a standoff now. Their eyes were locked as they slowly stalked back and forth like lions about to fight over a kill. Fearis smiled. Come on, little lady, you sure you want to play this part again? It's just the same old song and dance. Talia shook her head. I'm not here to play, (laughs) Fidas. That's a shame. He scoffed as he stopped in his tracks. Because we're about to have some fun. A whiz and a thunk was heard. A lock of Talia's hair drifted to the ground. Her eyes hadn't left him, but his knife was no longer in his hand. She knew what had happened, but she also knew she couldn't take her eyes off him. But a noise from behind her forced her to turn around. The cry was Julian's voice, laced with surprise, fear, and a smattering of pain. Talia turned to see Julian gripping his now bleeding arm just below the shoulder. 
The knife was lodged firmly and deeply into the tree trunk behind him. Cairo turned around to react to his panicked friend. Talia whipped back around. The hunter was gone, just as she knew he would be. She cursed herself inside and turned back to run in Julian's direction. Cairo was trying to get a good look at the slice held tightly under Julian's hand. Hold pressure, hold pressure, he told him. Tolly went to the tree trunk and grabbed the hilt of the blade. She yanked and yanked, but it was stuck tight in the wood. She held on and put both legs on the trunk to pull again, this time with success. She pulled the knife out clean and handed it to Cairo, who looked at her confused. Take this, she said. He fumbled it into his hands while Talia turned around and ripped off Julian's already torn sleeve from his shirt. In moments, she had tied it firmly around Julian's arm. It's not that deep, she said. Just keep it on there and follow my lead, or he'll give you much worse. How did... Cairo began to say as he collected his thoughts. He was... Th the knife! I mean, it was... A it was like a bullet! Talia snatched the knife from Cairo's trembling grasp. Her fingers began to radiate heat as she lifted it to her left hand. She brought the edge of the knife to her palm, and the boys watched as she eased her hand across the metal, bringing the entire blade to a white-hot glow. I'm going to need you to run, she said. Stay together and don't stop moving. You're going to head directly behind me on three. Kyra whispered to Julian, Are you going to be okay? Yeah, no, I'm good he said as he examined the makeshift bandage on his arm. One. Talia's eyes were combing the tops of the trees. Two. She was studying the difference between the swing of the wind and something more substantial that could be disturbing them. The boys were still, their eyes trained on the girl. She paused for what felt like a lifetime. Cairo felt his legs beginning to tingle with anticipation. Talia's eyes caught the movement above she was searching for. Three. Chapter 10 Fearus the Great the boys took off so fast that they only caught a glimpse as Talia ran in the opposite direction and leapt into the trees after her target. Feet tore traction into the dirt ground as the two made their way through the trees with the sound of a young woman's battle cry echoing through the forest. They vaulted themselves over logs and rocks and headed up a dirt incline aided by the hand and footholds of the roots of nearby trees poking up out of the dirt. Julian's arm was stinging under the bandage, but his adrenaline kept the pain from notice. Once at the top of the hill, Cairo's head began to spin. No, it wasn't spinning. He was falling? It all happened so quickly as his vision tilted and he felt his leg lurch upward. Julian watched with his eyes wide as his friend smacked the side of his head on the ground. Cairo's teeth clattered. He was in a daze as he saw Julian's terrified face upside down. He was being hoisted up by some kind of rope that had caught his ankle. He looked at his feet, now pointed to the sky, and saw himself heading feet first up into the trees. Wooden claws snapped around him, knocking leaves from the branches surrounding him. He was in a cage. He looked down at Julian through the thick wooden threading. The contraption was just big enough to hold one person, encircling him in large wooden teeth. Go! Go! Keep going! Cairo said. I'm not leaving you! Julian called up to him. A squealing hiss came spiraling through the trees. Fire collided with the trap. As singed wood claws broke apart around him, Cairo saw himself fall rapidly back to the ground. He hit with a painful thud that knocked the air out of him. He writhed for a moment and coughed until he felt a hand on his back lift him by the shirt. Move! It was Talia. Julian started running again while Cairo hobbled to his feet. He ran after his friend while Talia turned around. She lit up her hands in a fiery dance that resulted in flaming discs rotating at the end of each fist. It was a fiery display that Ferris could see from the trees as he leapt through the branches. 
It reminded him of threat poses he had seen many times from different creatures he had hunted. Humans were no different. The boys had only been running for another minute or so when something dropped in front of them like a bag of potatoes. It was a rag doll body that flopped as it hit the ground and rolled with arms and legs flailing. They stopped and stared in horror as they realized it was Talia. Two powerful legs landed just ahead of her as her body slid a short way and came to a stop at their toes. Furious raised his eyebrows with a smirk on his face. Talia's arms came back to life and weakly began trying to lift herself back to her feet. They tried to run to their left only to see Furious was there too. They looked back where he'd been, only to see Talia still grunting and struggling to rise. Neither of them had even tracked his movement. They turned and went right this time. Had they looked at Talia again, they would have seen her try to put her hand out to stop them. As they ran, Cairo noticed a faint rumble. It didn't slow him and certainly wasn't enough to disturb his pace in any way, but it felt odd and quick. He'd experienced low-intensity earthquakes before back home and dismissed it rather quickly. A cry was heard from behind them. It was Talia again. It sounded like she had said words, but they weren't clear enough to make out. Julian felt the front of his foot catch something. It gave way so quickly he didn't even look around as he continued. Out of the corner of their eyes, they both spotted movement on each side. Two massive logs came swinging down to their position. Julian was only slightly ahead of Cairo, but he was still in the kill zone. Both of them dropped to the ground. Before the heavy collision, they heard a whistle and a snap. Simultaneously, the swinging logs dropped to the ground with a powerful thud. Dead leaves and bark jumped up from the forest floor before settling back again. Singed vines cut by fire came slumping onto the logs in a coil. Talia ran up and slid to a stop as she knelt down near the boys to check them, the massive logs laying on either side. What are you doing? She cried out to the forest trees. I know he told you not to kill them. Again, Fyrus fell from the trees, this time landing on one of the logs to their side. The boys looked up to see what had happened. I know, he said, leaning down to inspect the coil of vines. I'm so bad. He stood up with the vines in hand and brushed his thumb against the smoldering end of the perfectly cut vine. But look at you, breaking all my toys. You're getting good at this. The boys scrambled to their feet. Talia gestured for them to get behind her as she rose to face him. Talia pulled out the long knife from a belt around her waist. Her hand lit up as she heated it up again, the metal glowing a molten orange. Furious smiled. All right, Sprite, we both know you won't have that for long. He lifted his hands and showed her his palms. Let's play hands. Talia's jaw tightened as she shook her head. You're so full of it. Or... Furious jumped down and began stepping towards her. His fingers splayed out. It just drives you nuts that deep down you know these hands are stronger than any weapon you could hold in yours. Her nostrils flared as she spoke under her breath. We'll see. The girl was on him before her bewildered audience could blink. The boys watched as the orange glow painted the air in a tapestry of flurried swings. Right, left, right, and left. Furious was moving out of the way of each slice with a speed they had never seen in a person before. Talia went for his head in a sudden change-up, but he was underneath her blade. In the same motion, he had suddenly maneuvered behind her. Before she could turn around, his fist struck forcefully into her back between her shoulder blades. She stumbled forward, swinging her arms to gain her balance. Hands, he said with a smirk. Talia whipped around and roared as she swung wildly again. Fierce had a full grin as he dodged swipe after swipe. Talia grew in her fury with each desperate miss. But in her rage, she managed to shoot the boys a look before she bellowed. Run! The reaction was mixed. Their legs felt ready to move and they were both stepping away in a half turn. They just couldn't seem to move their heads to look away. 
The spectacle was too much. They were further mesmerized by the flames they began seeing wafting in and out of sight on Talia's arms and back. Ferris was again keeping his hands up as he dodged her, clearly adding to the girl's frustration. In one mistimed swing, Talia lunged too far forward and Ferris stepped to the side. Her outstretched arm holding the blade out in front of her was snatched by the elbow. Talia felt Ferris's grip like a vice. Fear shot up her spine. In a single powerful motion, Ferris swung his body in a pitch-perfect pose like he was on a baseball card. But instead of throwing at ground level, he pitched up in a perfect vertical. And instead of a ball, he was throwing a girl. With a horrifying yelp that rang in the boy's ears, Talia shot like a bullet up through the canopy. Her lingering cry quickly evaporated into the sky. Leaves sprinkled the forest floor. The boys looked up. She was nowhere to be seen. Their eyes dropped down to the hunter before them. His eyes were locked on them. He raised his eyebrows and smiled. You two don't listen very well, do you? From the branches dropped the spinning and fading glow of the knife. It landed with a thunk into the ground next to Ferris, its handle nearly at the level of his fingers. He kept his eyes unwaveringly on the boys as he plucked it from the ground. She told you to run. Cairo came to a sliding stop under a tree with its roots exposed. They had been running frantically and fruitlessly for about twenty minutes. He was out of breath and separated from his friend. Ferris had split both of them up as he toyed with them in the woods. His speed was so impossibly superior it had become clear rather quickly this was all just a game. Now, Cairo was skin-chilled and alone. He was hiding, but he couldn't be sure that it mattered. It was evident that Ferris could hear exceptionally well. He couldn't be sure how else he was tracking them. He let himself catch his breath as quietly as he could before trying to peek his head carefully around the trunk of the tree. It was quiet. He felt a chill run up his spine. Fingers were on his shoulder. <laughs> Shh! A finger was on his open mouth. He was looking back into the captivating green eyes of Talia. His voice came out in a frantic whisper. How did you- Faras never lets me hit the ground, she said. Then she shrugged. Not from that height, anyway. What's that supposed to mean? She gripped his hand tight and began lifting him to his feet. Come on, I know where your cut-up friend is. In a separate part of the forest, Julian gripped his arm tight as he reached a clearing in the trees. He was out of breath and was battling his own lonely panic. The glimpse of a medium-sized boulder in the clearing was a sight for sore eyes and sore calf muscles. One that looked almost identical sat nearby. It was about the size of a stump, just large enough to sit on. He stumbled towards it and did just so. He glanced at the bandage on his shoulder and saw it oozing more blood. He began to unravel it. He was on the verge of rewrapping and securing it when Cairo and Talia came dashing through the trees. They suddenly came to an abrupt stop as Talia lifted her arm to halt Cairo in his tracks. Julian looked up at them in relief, followed quickly by surprise. Oh my, I, I thought you were dead! Weren't you like, in the sky? Shh! Talia pressed her fingers to her lips. Her arm was held firmly in front of Cairo. He was looking at her confused. Don't move, she whispered to Julian. Her hand changed from a finger on her lips to a palm against her forehead. Her eyebrows were lifted and her eyes widened in a look that spelled disbelief. Okay, she said, staring at him. This is... Okay. She turned around briefly in the direction they had just come from, then down at the ground in front of them, and then the rest of the clearing. They could tell she was trying to puzzle something out. She looked to Cairo. You're going to climb up that down tree and up into that canopy. She told him, still in a whisper as she pointed to the fallen trunk on the edge of the clearing. You are going to back up and hug the tree line. Pretend this whole area is a pond 
and you can't get wet. Cairo's eyebrows furrowed. What are you talking about? Talia immediately put her fingers to her mouth again as her nostrils flared. Okay. Cairo backed up to the tree line and began walking along its edge until he reached the down trunk. The incline wasn't too bad. Talia spoke to Julian as Cairo was making his way up. Do not move. Julian was frozen, bandage in hand. Don't talk. Don't wrap yourself. Don't move. Do you understand? Julian nodded very, very slowly. Talia backed up and followed Cairo up the tree. He was in the canopy now, hugging the trunk of the upright tree blocked by branches and leaves, but he could still see his friend sitting on the stone, stiff as a board. Talia came up silently and crouched on the branch next to him. What's going- She shot him a look again with her fingers to her lips. He could tell her teeth were gritted through her closed mouth. He couldn't imagine what could be so wrong. It wasn't long before Fierus came through the trees. He stopped with a skid due to his superior speed, clearly caught off guard by his quarry simply sitting in front of him. Julian looked into his wary eyes but said nothing. Fierus smiled. A trap? How'd she pull that off? There was no time. He spun around as he looked up into the trees. You here, Tally? He called out. You didn't have time. It can't be very good. Julian's mind was racing. What was her plan here? He was looking around at the trees in the clearing, trying to see what she'd seemed so concerned about. He looked at the floor and saw a slight indentation right in front of him that he had not noticed yet. From the trees, Cairo watched Fierce pace. At the same moment as Julian, Cairo noticed the same indentation. From his higher vantage point, it looked like the roots of a tree, but they were different somehow. They were shaped oddly. Two were right next to each other, almost like lips. Cairo's eyes widened as he started to make out a shape on the ground that he hadn't seen before. Julian saw two thin holes in the ground. It looked like there was movement there, ever so slight. Maybe his eyes were deceiving him? Were they... widening? Fierce scoffed as he continued to look around. (laughs) You know I'm not falling for this. He spun around with a stomp of his foot as if to catch someone coming up behind him. Right, little girl? Julian slowly moved his gaze over to the other boulder to his right. It methodically began to peel... Cairo could see it from his spot in the tree. That was no boulder. Julian watched as it snapped open to reveal a veiny eyeball. It had a neon yellow iris and a deep black pupil as it rolled around like a giant wet marble. It suddenly stopped, its focus narrowly on Julian. Branches cracked as Talia emerged from the canopy, Fierce turned around and looked up to see her tightly gripping a vine with her other hand outstretched as she fell from the trees. Julian leapt to his feet as his seat transformed into another blazing yellow marble. His arm caught hers as she hoisted him up into the air. Fierce noticed too late what was happening. He looked down at his feet to see what had looked like tree roots before sprouted teeth. In an instant... Massive jaws had engulfed him in darkness. From the treetops, Cairo watched as Julian and Talia tumbled out of sight into the trees on the other side of the clearing. The massive, camouflaged beast had made quick work of Fierus, swallowing him in a single bite. The view of the creature was horrendous. It was partially emerged out of the ground with a face that was wide and flat. It almost took up the whole clearing. It had a series of small appendages systematically shoveling dirt as it pulled itself up out of the ground. Its body was long, with giant ribbed sections like an earthworm. Its massive body contorted to move its head and look around. His yellow eyes roved the trees as he exposed the rows of wet teeth previously hidden. The thing looked up into the treetops until it spotted Cairo. The hollow glow of the creature's eyes felt like they stared into his trembling heart. 
the vision of it burning into his retinas. He felt his stomach sink. Both the young man and the beast remained motionless for a quiet and still moment. Finally, the monster began to recede back into the ground. Dirt began filling up around the edges of its worm-like body, shoveled and moved by its swarm of small appendages wrapped in rings around its form. It wasn't long before his face was covered, but it still took a few minutes for the ground to settle back to a state where it appeared stable. It looked like smooth ground made up of fresh dirt when the movement finally stopped. An untrained eye would never have thought something so chaotic had occurred. After a few moments of silence, Cairo slipped down the tree trunk slowly. His feet hit the ground, his breath heavy with panic. He backed up, keeping his eyes on the spot from which the monster had emerged. I'll admit, that was... Gah! Cairo screamed as he spun around. A frightened Julian screamed in response as he stood behind Talia. She looked at both of them and nodded. Fair enough. She took a breath. I'll admit, that was a bit intense, even for me. And you guys lived, which is more than I can say for others. She pointed north. I have a safe house just up the way. You'll need secure places to stay on your way, and I know some that are scattered around. We better head out before it gets dark. She started walking in the direction she pointed to. Julian and Cairo looked at each other. Cairo looked to her back as she walked. So does this mean you're going to help us? She stopped. She heaved a big sigh without turning around. She threw her head back and looked up as she spoke. Let's not make this too much of a thing. I'm here. Let's just make the most of it. Cairo smiled and nudged Julian. See, I knew she'd come around, he said quietly. Yeah, said Julian, looking down at his bleeding arm beneath his fingers. We'll see. Chapter 11 Born of Fire and Moonlight Reyna found herself again in what Kadok had called the Mural Hall. Thus far, it was her favorite spot in the whole of the castle. In the center was a long red carpet that went from one end to the other. On either side, the walls were lined with sprawling painted works of things that made her imagination run wild. There were men and monsters like she'd never seen. Generals, warriors, kings and queens that were wielding weapons and commanding armies. There were individual portraits as well. Between each wall of murals there were sculptures, busts, and exquisitely detailed dioramas encased under glass. It was a buffet for the eyes that she could spend hours perusing. So she did. She dug into the cloth sack in her hand and popped a nut in her mouth. She couldn't remember what the kitchen girl had called them, but she found them quite tasty. She grabbed another and handed it to her new friend on her shoulder. She had named him Prince on account of him having saved her from a locked tower. The rat took the nut from her and nibbled on it happily. Prince behaved as if he had been domesticated for years, even though he had only known her a day. But their bond had been strengthened quickly with Reyna's ability to talk with him. Prince didn't say much. He mostly let her know when he wanted food or when a certain smell interested him. Other than that, he gave her signs of affection. Though she could understand him and he could understand her, a rat just didn't have much to say all the time. Full conversations weren't really their forte, but Prince knew his way around the castle better than anyone. After all, it was him that showed her the special hidden hatch under her bed. It had a hole in it that he could go in and out of, which is how he had gotten in her room when he had smelled her food in the first place. The hatch led to a series of crawl spaces and passageways that went throughout the castle. They were old, very old, and Reyna hadn't seen anyone else in them, so she wondered if maybe she was the only one who knew about them. After she had told them about talking to Prince, no one had bothered to ask her about her secret way out of her room. She decided to opt out of revealing that information. In some sections, you had to get on your hands and knees, but the passages seemed to lead to nearly all the rooms in the palace including this one. Reyna was leaning over a diorama of an army with tiny spears pointed toward the ground. 
A general was leading the charge, and they appeared to be attacking a series of lumps coming out of the sandy ground where tiny, detailed appendages and forms were rising up. She was so enthralled with the scene that it was only when she was startled by voices that she realized she had her fingers on the glass. She lifted them off and rubbed away her fingerprints before looking for where the sounds were coming from. Waging his war deep in the northern mountains where the Phylorian forces were outmatched. How did he do it? It was a child's voice. Reyna couldn't see them yet over the white sculpture of a warrior. She made her way closer. Well, the mighty Phylorians were powerful soldiers, but they are cold-blooded. It makes them much weaker in the freezing snow of the high peaks. They just couldn't manage against General Greyland's forces in that kind of cold. Reyna recognized the voice before she peeked around the sculpture to see them. It was Orion, surrounded by several kids. They looked up at him with wide-eyed interest. They were dressed fairly plainly and functionally. Some looked like they had spots on their clothes, like they'd just come from working on something. But Orion was also dressed fairly simply. Reyna had mostly seen him in something that expressed his kingship in some way, but he looked very casual. A simple cream shirt and cloth dark green pants with boots to match. He looked like some of the servants she had seen headed to work outside. The children gathered around the white statue of a man reeling back his bow with a powerful arm, his arrow at the ready and a look of determination bearing down on his unseen target. Reyna watched as the kids tried to get a look at the plaque on the base of the piece when Orion made eye contact with her. She smiled at him. He gave a slight smile in return and then turned his attention back to the other kids. It was then that a voice rang through the hall. All right, children, time's up. It's time to get back to your duties. It was a cheery voice of a lady. Reyna looked to the entrance to see a larger woman with her hands on her hips. The kids groaned. I know, I know. His majesty is lots of fun. He can show you more later. Reyna watched as the children began to shuffle out. Some lingered behind and looked to the king. He winked at them. Two of the girls ran up and hugged him before following the rest of the group. It wasn't long before the king and Reyna were alone in the hall. Orion kept looking at the marble statue. Reyna chewed the side of her cheek briefly in the silence. She made her way over to him and stood in front of the plaque. She started to read it aloud. General King Graylin, champion of the North and warrior of the people, may his legacy never be forgotten. Orion gave a thoughtful smile, still looking into Graylin's determined white marble eyes. He was a hero of mine growing up. Mom used to bring me down here and tell me all of his stories. Graylin wasn't afraid of anything. Raina smiled at him. Where's your mom now? Orion's eyebrows went up. She's gone. I miss her a lot. Raina put her hands in her pockets and looked back at the statue. I don't have a mom either. It's nice you know what it's like to have one. Orion looked at her profile as she looked at the statue. They were quiet a moment. What about your father? He's nice, Raina said with a smile. He's rich, and he takes me everywhere with him. He worries a lot, though. Orion nodded and looked back at the statue. But he's not my real dad, said Raina. He adopted me when I was a baby. Orion cocked his head as he looked at her out of the corner of his eye. It's pretty obvious if you see us together, I guess, but you've never seen him. He's probably really worried since I've been gone so long, but he's always worried. Orion felt his nose tingle. Hey, is this you? Raina said, turning her attention to a large mural nearby. It was high up and had a slant on the ceiling. Orion squeezed the moisture from his eyelids and looked up. It was a sprawling epic of a painting, depicting a shirtless young man with blazing hands. He was mid-twirl in a swirl of flames, facing off against a ferocious and massive pure white dog, bearing its blood-tipped white teeth in a bone-chilling snarl. 
the two were surrounded by black trees covered in flames. You're right, that is me. How did you know? It's been a long time since I've looked like that. Your face is the same, Reyna said. That looks really scary. <laughs> it was pretty scary, actually. What happened? She asked. Orion put his hands on his hips and heaved a big sigh with a raspberry at the end. Well, it's a bit of a story. You sure you want to hear it? Raina looked at him with her eyebrows lowered. There's no TV here, and everyone says I can't go outside or I'll get lost. Go for it. Orion laughed. Hmm. I'm not usually the person telling this one. I like to tell the stories I grew up with. But mine is... Well, it started a long time ago. I'm a bit old, you know. Raina grinned. Back then, the kingdom was different, he said. The king at the time was Erasmus. He was a good man. My mother, who took me in, was a palace servant girl. Her name was Savannah, and the king happened to love her dearly. But their love was a secret. He was supposed to marry a woman of royalty and hopefully join with another nation. But he was married a few times and never had an heir. Erasmus became restless. As it became clear he wouldn't be able to continue the royal bloodline, he couldn't see why he couldn't be with the woman who he loved in the first place. So around this time, the kingdom experienced a crisis. Village after village was being attacked by an especially rare great white shadow dog. No shadow dog is known to last in the light for very long, save for the very desperate or the particularly strong. But this creature could withstand any time of day, whether it be the dead of night or midday when the sun was highest and brightest in the sky. He tore apart town after town with great might and fury. The Nam took to calling him Moonlight for his eerie white color. I was growing up in the palace as a servant boy, helping my mother serve our caring and concerned king. He had grown to be like a father to me. He never treated me unkindly or asked me to do anything unreasonable. Often he would take me aside and ask me about my day, and even sneak me foods from the kitchen that the servants weren't allowed to have. So when the plague of moonlight made him grow desperate, I wanted to help. Over and over he sent his warriors out to fight, and over and over they came back defeated or wounded or didn't come back at all. I knew I had to do something. The Nam were my family. I had to help them. And I had to help the good king. So I did. I had used my abilities plenty before. I'd fought off creatures and sparred here and there. But mostly I used them to help keep the halls lit and warm while assisting in various duties around the palace. Usually fire-related. I had never used them for anything quite like this. I set out after him without telling anyone. Not even my mother. I wandered Dezu for days, searching villages and staying with people who were willing to help. I found him finally sizing up the defenses of a small town just outside the border of the Forest of the Forgotten. Orion looked to Reyna, who had decided to sit cross-legged on the floor. She was cupping her hands together, holding Prince. He was sniffing up in the king's direction. Orion softly chuckled. <laughs> I guess this is the part where I'm supposed to say the battle was legendary, he said as he looked back up at the mural. And I suppose it must have been, if it's in this hall with the rest. He trailed off a bit, lost in thought. Then he blinked and looked back down at Prince. Anyway, I came back Desu's new champion. The people brought me gifts from all around. King Erasmus took the opportunity to use the fervor and named me the new heir. The land loved me so much that no one protested. It also gave him an excuse to finally marry my mother and make a queen out of a servant girl. It was a beautiful time. But all I really cared about was finally getting to call someone kind my father. Raina grinned. And you all lived happily ever after? 
Orion gave a half smile. That is how it's supposed to go, isn't it? He looked back into the eyes of the statue. I just can't believe I get to be in the same room with Graylin. Right next to him, even. That's why I like to bring the servant children in here and tell them stories like my mother did me. It doesn't matter who they are. Everyone deserves to dream. Even someone as unlikely as me. Yours is a good story. It definitely belongs in here, Raina said. Orion smiled. <laughs> Thank you. He looks really scary, but he's also kind of pretty, said Raina. There's so many monsters on the walls. Are they all real? Orion chuckled. Yeah, they're all real, and there's a lot more where they came from. I would love to see them in real life. Orion rubbed his mustache and down to his goatee. You know, maybe you will. The king cleared his throat. <clears throat> Would you like to eat at the table with me tonight? Caddick is making one of my favorites. You might like it. Reyna squinted one eye. Is it weird? It's probably weird. Everything here is weird. Orion laughed. It's a little weird. Reyna smiled. Well, since you didn't lie about it, I'll try it. Orion shook his head. <laughs> All right, then. It's a deal. I'll have Kata come get you for dinner tonight. Raina nodded happily as she stood up. After Orion had left, Raina realized Prince wasn't anywhere on her person. He had scurried away at some point during their conversation. She studied the floor between art pieces until she saw movement at the bottom of a wide and dark wooden cupboard. He scurried out, holding a nut in his mouth. She headed over to him. Did I drop that? Thanks for looking out. She knelt down and picked him up. She nuzzled her nose to his. If they catch me spilling crumbs in here, they might kick me out. Come on. Prince's attention was toward the cupboard. Had Reyna looked too, she may have seen what he was looking at. There was another mural, closed off and locked behind its dark doors. It was the bright paint against a black background that had caught his eye. His rodent mind had translated it as a possible morsel. This thought was quickly followed by disinterest as he smelled only more dried paint. Even through the slit in the doors, you could still see a sliver of the piece. It depicted the king's face again. A face of pain and fury. A face from a time after, happily ever after. Chapter 12. The View from the Ashes So, let me get this straight, said Julian. He held his arms out as he spoke, like he was handling the information as he walked. Humans get superpowers in Dezu. Right, said Talia, walking ahead of him. And the king was going to burn us alive. Yes. He was going to burn us alive because of our superpowers. Pretty much. But he was going to burn us alive for our superpowers with his superpowers? Please keep your voice down, said Talia. They were walking on a flat path they had found in the forest. Next to them on their right stood rows and rows of perfectly round boulders in between the trees. So that means the king is human. Julian's face was plastered with confusion. Right. And a total nut job? Shh! But he murders all humans, right? Or people from Earth, or whatever they call us here? Said Cairo. Vincarsi. And yeah, they are usually known to come from Earth. So if someone has delinium faculties, they are from Earth, or human, generally. She said in a low tone. But how does he hate his own kind? You really need to be quiet, said Talia. Why, said Cairo, speaking lower now. Does he have eyes and ears everywhere or something? No, Talia said, pointing to the stones to her right. It's because those aren't rocks. Cairo stopped and looked at the one a few feet from him. 
It was perfectly still, not even a sign of breathing. Julian, still behind Cairo as he worked out the new information, ran into him. Come on! Talia hissed, no longer in her previously low voice. Julian gave Cairo an exaggerated, continuous push on his back while Cairo's eyes stayed on the boulders. Once Cairo had started walking again, Julian lightly jogged up to Talia, who was in front. I wouldn't yell if you weren't walking so fast, he whined as he caught up. So why is the king an earth racist? Is, is that right? Or an earth race traitor? Earth race... Talia's eyebrows furrowed and her face changed, but she was just far enough ahead for the boys not to see. Why does anyone hate a whole race of people? There's no point in figuring out that kind of brain rot. Do you know what happens to things with rot? Julian frowned. Uh, what happens to... I mean, probably... Things that have rot get buried and fertilize the ground for the rest of us. That way, at least something good can come from them. People with brain rot are just the same. Julian found his mouth slightly open, but wordless. He looked back at Cairo. Cairo pressed his lips together. They walked in awkward silence for a while. Finally, Cairo jogged past Julian so he could take the reins of the conversation. In my experience, people usually have some kind of source for their hate. Some kind of reason. I mean, no reason is ultimately a good reason to hate a race of people, but, you know, people usually point to something. Talia pursed her lips, looking straight ahead. Cairo could see the question mulling around in her head. Abuse, she said. Abuse? he asked. Yeah. What kind of abuse? Apparently the king didn't have a great life back on Earth. He was a child when he crossed over. He didn't feel the kind of love he was supposed to feel. Not until he met the Nam. They showed him kindness. His whole reign is about repaying it. Cairo raised his brow and nodded. That's... wow, that's pretty sad. Talia scowled as she turned to him. Then she raised an eyebrow. Yeah? Will you want to know how I got here? Cairo's eyes widened. Uh... Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're offered. I came here with my parents and my little brother, she said. Really? Your whole family? Are they... They're dead. Orion killed them. Talia looked straight ahead again. Her expression looked like it was poisoned with anger. Not an ounce of sadness shone through. He stopped and she kept going without a glance in his direction. Julian kept walking and passed Cairo, catching his gaze with wide eyes and raised eyebrows. He mouthed to him with a small salute. This is all you. Cairo made his jaw crooked and thought. He caught up to their guide again, keeping pace with her. I, I'm sorry. Did you kill them? No, I, then you can drop the sorry. Cairo frowned. Do you... Can I ask how it happened? Talia's expression softened. She still wouldn't look at him. We were on a road trip, she said. And then suddenly we weren't on the road anymore. We were in a forest. Did you have one of the red, I, I mean the delinium? No, it didn't happen that way for us. Sometimes the walls between universes are thin, and sometimes they make little holes that someone can enter accidentally. Harper says that's what happens sometimes to people who are reported missing on Earth. It's what happened to us. Whoa, Julian whispered. We kind of just made a life here. My whole family had delinium abilities related to fire. When he found us, the king didn't like that. I was out collecting sweet crea fruit when he found them. And at night I lost my family and he burned my home to the ground. Wow said Cairo. His hands were in his pockets. I'm so... Well, no, I'm still sorry. He's the one who needs to be sorry, she said. And he will be. I'll make sure of it. In the meantime, I make it my business to make his life just a little bit harder. 
Cairo smiled. You mean when you're not playing escort to people on quests that are doomed to fail? He said. That made her crack a smile. She nodded. So why hesitate to come with us? He said. We're going where the king lives. Why not march up to the door and give him what for? Because I'm not an idiot, she said. He's just as much a master as he is a monster. Like any great king, he has powerful forces lined up and ready to die for him. But even if you're up against just him alone, you'd need an army in your back pocket. Huh, said Cairo, rubbing the back of his neck. He then dug into his back pocket. He pulled out his fist and held it out before her, revealing his empty palm. That's right, I left mine at home. Talia's serious expression broke a moment to scoff and roll her eyes. It tried to harden up again, but it was softer now. When I finally get a chance to put him down, she said, I'll make sure it's on my terms. How are you going to pull that off? asked Julian. She looked back at him. He was looking at his toes when he asked the question. Talia didn't answer until her lack of response made him look up. She looked him in the eyes. If I knew, I promise you, he'd be dead already. She looked back ahead and they walked in silence for a while. How old were you? Cairo asked. Hmm? Talia said. When you lost your family, how old were you? Oh, uh... About ten, I think. Cairo looked at her. How did you manage surviving on your own? I didn't, she said. I had a lot of help. Julian snapped his fingers. Harper? Yeah, and his wife, Harper. No way, Harper and Harper? said Julian. I know, Talia said with a smile. They were made for each other. He's always too much in his head, and she's the one to pull him out of it. Where is she? Cairo asked. Oh, she's all over, just like him. And he's nowhere at all, just like her. She probably built your cabin. The one he set us up with? Cairo said. She builds all of them. She's how they can make so many homes for Earth refugees in so many hidden spots. It'd probably be nearly impossible without her. She's a powerful telekinetic. She builds houses with her mind, said Cairo. And the outhouses and the indoor plumbing and others, the water pumps, the brush clearing. Indoor plumbing, mumbled Julian. How did we not meet her, said Cairo. I thought we were in their house when Harper kidnapped us, said Julian. Rescued us, he said, rolling his head back to his friend. She was probably in the other room on her cot, she said. Caught, said Cairo. She can't walk or move much at all, really, at least in the natural way. The king made sure of that. Sheesh, said Julian. Even from behind him and to the side, Julian could see worry wash over Cairo's face. He'd had Reina for a while now. He couldn't imagine what he could have done. Julian gripped his shoulders and gave him a double squeeze. It'll be all right, man. Cairo shook the expression off his face and tried to toss the thoughts away. Talia said nothing. They walked quietly for a while. Julian frowned at the silence. So your power is fire, right? How does that work? Talia held out her hand. I can generate it, she said as a small flame formed in her palm and manipulate it. The flickering flame became a ring standing vertical in her hand. It rotated slowly and then broke apart, becoming like a string. Cairo watched as it wrapped around her palm. Then she rolled her fingers as it slid like a snake between each of them. Wow, it's that easy? said Cairo. With practice, sure. She flicked her fingers and the line of fire shot towards Cairo. He reacted with a reflexive swipe of his arm. There was a crackling, and the flame was gone, but his hand was encased in a thick mitten of ice. 
Talia smiled. You'll get there eventually. Kyra looked at his hand. Julian laughed. You gotta figure that out, man. Cairo tried to shake the lump of ice off. He will, Talia said. It doesn't take long after manifestation. It'll be second nature soon. Like you've been this way your whole life. With half the stuff this place has shown us, he's gonna need it, Julian said, still smiling as Cairo tried to strike his hand against a log they were stepping over. Well, at least we have you, said Cairo. You already saved us both and killed that assassin or whatever he was. We'll be all right. Psh, I know, Julian said. That was crazy. That fierce guy? I can't believe he got eaten. I've never seen someone die before. Talia scoffed. Okay, first of all, all I said was I'd get you to a safe house before the shadow dogs get you. And second, you still haven't seen someone die. Faraz is not dead. Cairo raised an eyebrow. Firas, Fir Firas? Fir... He's not? We saw him get eaten by that centipede, or Mothra baby looking... I've seen him survive a lot worse, she said. He might be a blowhard, but the Nam don't call him the Great for nothing. Chapter 13 Upping the Bounty The ground continuously shifted like it was made of water. In the unrelenting claws of the sky gazer, it might as well have been. Its ability to churn massive amounts of hard earth was nearly unmatched. Having been satisfied by its hunt earlier in the day, it was burrowing deeper and deeper toward its lair to rest. Not necessarily a thoughtful creature, the indigestion it was feeling had been growing, but it wasn't until now that it made him come to a full stop. With a solid blockade of unchurned earth in front of him, he slowly started to writhe, rubbing his face against the walls of its self-made tunnel. The writhing grew more and more violent. Skygazers were usually quiet, unless actively hunting. But the cries of the massive, thick-skinned, and blubbery beast began echoing through the underground chambers. Its writhing stopped as it laid on its back with its body contorted in an ugly arch. From the crease in its body burst forth a blade that began swiftly sawing his belly down the middle. The beast screamed and strained. Its giant, bright yellow eyes nearly bulged out of their sockets as the knife finished its work. From its open midsection, blood innards and a man poured out. The skygazer heaved its final haggard breath and relinquished its dark and dirt-filled existence. Firas stood up, but lost his slippery footing on the haggard flesh of the creature in the pitch black of the tunnel. He was covered in slimy substances he couldn't see. The smell overwhelmed him. What was it? Its odor was like digested mud and fertilizer. His nose crinkled. Fertilizer that used to be old bovine meat. This was going to be deeply irritating. How far down was he? He slid down the side of the body and became cramped for room between claw and cave walls. He slinked slowly between the surfaces until he reached the tail end of the monster. There wasn't a light in sight. He was going to have to smell his way out. He took a deep whiff. Immediately he coughed and nearly gagged. Maybe smell was a bad idea while covered in pungent worm viscera. Sound might make more sense. He started forward at a hobbling pace. A click rang out from his tongue. The sound was absorbed by much of the freshly moved dirt in the walls, but it was just enough to get the information he needed. He quickly sped up. He kept his stride clicking as he went until he found that he was going up. It was promising, and yet he was still running for some time with little to no change in the path aside from twists and turns. Finally, his clicks caught another path, a fork. The clicks told him this one was large enough that it had to be from another skygazer. He stopped. 
the path was older. It was hard to tell which way led above ground. He breathed in deeply. He decided he'd keep heading up the path he was on. He ran for quite a while. It was like navigating an old subway tunnel. He ran faster as he grew more confident about the length of the paths. Eventually, he caught a break. A click came back telling him he'd hit a network. This was a bunch of smaller crisscrossing pathways, vertically and horizontally intersecting with his own. They also sounded older on another investigative click. The Skygazer had cut a path right through them. They were clearly organized. He approached them and touched their walls. They were rough and jagged, not like the road he'd been taking. He pulled his hand back quickly as a chill ran up his spine. His thought came out as a whisper under his breath. The Underhorde. Faras took a step back and started to continue again down the Skygazer's road. He was not about to deal with them today. The air stopped him in his tracks, though. He turned around and sniffed again. Topsoil, dead leaves, and pine. It was coming from one of the horde tunnels. He thought about it for a moment. If they were nearby, he would be able to hear them, or even smell them. But all he could smell was the surface. That was a good sign. He clicked and leapt the grid vertically from tunnel to tunnel until he found the right one. He was right. Not a creature in sight. Or in clicking distance, at least. As he approached an exit, the fresh air got stronger, followed by the warm greeting of the early evening light making its way down the hole under the roots of a dead tree. Faras scrambled up its roots toward the trunk and kicked off of it. He soared high into the treetops. He landed quite precisely on a ledge and crouched in the branches, flaring his nostrils to take in the fresh air. It wasn't long before he had his bearings. This whole debacle had taken him way off course. But there was a crossover sanctuary nearby that he knew. He took a path from tree to tree until he found the hilly incline he was looking for. He jumped from the canopy and slid down it until he located an ovular boulder jutting out from the hill. He slid below it and found another smaller boulder that was wedged underneath. It looked like it propped it up, but he knew it didn't. He stuck his hand into an indentation in the rock between the top and the bottom stones. He pulled the smaller stone away. There, perfectly fitted into the space, was an oblong leather case with a strap. Fedas smiled. He took it and strapped it to his back. The path from here was nearly already etched out since he'd done it enough. He decided that probably wasn't a good thing. He went back up the hill on the opposite side of the boulder and went into the trees again to avoid further engraving the trail. He followed the trail from the canopy until he reached the spot. He slid down a trunk and looked through the foliage. There it was, the back of the crossover sanctuary, peeking above the trees just a half mile down the incline of the forested hill. He slipped the leather bag off his back and flipped it open. He pulled out a bow and quiver. He looked through the various colored feathers of the arrows until he found what he was looking for. In one sweeping motion, he pulled the red feathered arrow from the bundle and swiped it with a flip against the bark of the tree behind him. It lit up in flames with a hiss as his hand pulled the line taut. He lined up his aim. His eye focused on his tiny, distant target. His fingers released. The arrow shot over the tops of the trees until it dipped in its arc through the wooden trunks to the small, unlit metal fire basin just at the edge of the sanctuary. Firas smiled as he saw the sanctuary guards running around barking orders and searching the trees. He sighed and sat down, leaning his back against the tree. The setting sun brought with it a memory from years ago. A setting quite similar to this. He'd been on the hunt, watching the movement of prey in the trees when he'd heard a sound. The commotion was too much for his quarry, and it bounded off. He rolled his eyes and turned around to see a small pair of eyes peeking out from the brush. Now you know how I feel about little girls sneaking up on me and making me lose my lunch. The girl stepped out from the bushes and giggled. Isn't it dinner time? It is, but you aren't impressed that I followed your tracks? 
No, he said. I'm not. I taught you, and I'm a great teacher. And I wasn't hiding, so I didn't bother covering him. I could have found you anyway, she said. I'd love to see you try. Also, I'd love to know why you're playing hide-and-seek with people not in on the game. You should be at home. The sun is almost down. You can be out, I can be out, she said. Firas sighed. You can't run away from everyone, little one. Harper and Harper are going to be worried sick. I'm practicing night dwelling. You know they won't let me. He smirked. And why would you want to do that, huh? You have a safe home to go to. You don't need to be out. I want to be just like the old warriors. I can help people caught outside after dark. She put her hands out and they lit up with fire. Who better to be the light in the night than me? Night dwelling is a wartime strategy. Why would you need it? Her face turned deadly serious. It was the most serious he'd ever seen an expression on someone so young. It's probably why I remembered the moment so well. This is war. As the sun continued to abandon the valley, Firas found himself turning over the piece of wood he'd broken off in the light of the sunset. He'd carved the shape right, but it was going to be tricky detailing all the little digging appendages in the spiral shape. He brought his dagger to it again and scoffed. He spoke into the air. I've been able to smell you for a while. The wind wasn't in your favor. Orion appeared from the trees behind him. You gave my men quite the scare. You don't usually reach out unless... The king looked around. Where are they? I won't be satisfied if you kill them yourself, you know that. Firas stood up and turned to him with his hand still at his craft. I don't have them. Orion's eyebrows raised. And why? She got to him first. She's getting better. Orion's eyelids lowered. She beat you? In a fight? Firas sneered. No, come on, Ori. He stopped carving and looked at him. She... She used my zeal against me. Wasn't as observant as I usually am. Orion shook his head and rolled his eyes. You were cocky and she outsmarted you. This isn't the time to lose your edge, Firas. Not with what I'm about to put on the line. The hunter looked at him and turned his head with skepticism across his face. Freedom, Orion said. A clean ledger and a spot in the world. You can hunt, not as an outlaw, but bona fide. You can do what you do, but with my kingdom behind you. Fras's eyes widened. This is the job? You're swapping Harper for this? Orion pressed his lips together slightly and slowly nodded. The hunter looked at him under lowered eyebrows. I don't know why this one means so much to you, but you know with me it's as good as done. What's the twist? Orion cracked his knuckles with a smile. You know me. I'll keep it interesting for you. You'll have a little competition coming your way. I'm sure the general and his men wouldn't mind a fair shake at some perks. Firas gave a slight shrug. All right, let old Lunkhead and his boys give it a try. You just keep the offer you promised me open. I'm a man of my word, said the king. No, you're not, Ori, he said. Orion chuckled. I am what I need to be. Firas slipped the knife and carving into his pockets and threw the bag over his shoulder. He began making his way into the ever-settling night. A wandering mind made him take his forge trail back to his boulder hiding spot, where he slipped his bow and quiver back. He closed up the small stone compartment and found himself tightly gripping the boulder cover in frustration. The rest of that conversation he'd had all those years ago was playing over in his mind. Well, you'll have to get better at hide-and-seek, Miss Warrior, he had told her. And I'm not training you tonight, so you'll need to get home before the things in the dark eat you up. She scoffed and started back into the bushes. I won't need your help. I'll be the best night dweller the world has ever seen. And I'll be better at hide-and-seek than you, too. 
You've got a long way to go, Sprite, he said. You watch, she said as she turned around. Fierce the Great will be no match for Talia the Night Huntress. We'll see, little one, he said. We'll see. Chapter 14 Falling Cairo dipped his foot into the dark water and cringed. It was cold, and the night air wasn't helping. He turned around to see Talia smiling at him in the light of the flame in her hand. He looked over at Julian, who had removed his shoes and was trying it out for himself. He was, true to form, vocal about the discovery. Good lord! he said, jumping out quickly. That is... I hate that. Talia silently chuckled. Hey, it was you who asked for a good clean. She was right. The three of them had made it to Talia's safe house in the woods, just as the sun was going down. The cabin looked quite a bit like their own. On the way, Talia had explained some rules of travel as they became relevant including how to tend to bathroom needs, complete with which leaves were best as tried-and-true biodegradable toilet paper. Julian felt gross after hours of travel without any amenities, so he was excited for a bath when he reached the cabin. You asked at the right place. This is just the spot for a good wash, she said with a smile. She led them a ways through the trees until they had reached the lake. It was massive and shimmered under the light of the moon. Even in the dark, a large shadow of a landmass stood looming in the middle of the water. Is this how you do things around here, Jungle Girl? Has no one invented showers yet? said Julian. Talia smirked. Not for everyone, only the rich and sophisticated. So you know what a shower is, and yet you put up with this? Talia looked at Cairo. You gonna be all right? Cairo pulled the bar of soap she had given him out of his pocket. Peachy keen, he said with a fake smile. I'll give you boys some privacy. Just keep an eye out. Lake Pana has some nasty old secrets. Talia shot the fireball in her hand casually onto a log sitting on the beach. She disappeared behind the trees as it smoldered and kept a bit of the night away. Cairo and Julian looked at each other. Cairo called out to her into the trees. <clears throat> you, you don't want to clarify that statement or anything? Her voice didn't return. No? Okay, okay, we'll just get vulnerable then. It wasn't long before they had their clothes off and were lathering their personal soaps in the chilled water with their backs to each other. Cairo soon discovered it was most helpful to get the soapy lather warm so the dip under the surface to rinse wasn't as unpleasant. Yeesh, said Julian, his back still to his friend. Somehow feeling my feet sink in the mud is taking away my clean feeling. You need to learn how to rough it, man. Sometimes you gotta be a man of the wild. Yeah, well, as long as Lady of the Wild over there doesn't see me roughing it, I'm still not sure about her. But also, I'm not in top form in this cold right now, if you know what I mean. Julian's bar of soap slipped out of his hands and landed to his side with a plunk. His hands waded through the water as he groped for it. He felt his toes lift out of the mush of the lake floor. He did wide sweeps with his arms, but he still couldn't feel the slick bump of the bar. He was laid out on the surface of the lake as he did his butterfly strokes. He suddenly felt like he couldn't reach the ground with his feet. He thought maybe he'd gone out a bit farther, and the water was a little bit deeper. He tried to turn himself around. There it was, the bar. It was floating, but not on the surface. He squeezed his eyes to make sure he didn't have water in them. He blinked a few times to make sure it wasn't a trick of the light. His vision stayed the same. The bar of soap was floating, just a few inches in empty space above the surface of the lake. Julian's mouth was open, but he couldn't speak. He stretched out his hand to touch it. His fingers came close, but missed just shy of the bar. He couldn't reach it. Why couldn't he reach it? 
Talia's light on the shore went dark. He looked around in the pitch black, but he couldn't see his friend. He couldn't see anything except the blanket on his face. The blanket on his face? He wasn't in the cold water anymore. It all started to come back to him. After the bath in the lake, they had come back to the safe house. It was a two-bedroom cabin, and Talia had gone to one room while the two of them had gone to sleep in the other. Julian had worn his underwear to bed, but he couldn't stand sleeping with clothes on. He always had this issue when sleeping over someone's house. His remedy was to simply take his clothes off under the covers and slide them down to the side. Then, when he needed them to get up for a bathroom break, or just get up in the morning, he would slip them on under the covers and no one would be the wiser. Is that why he felt so drafty, he thought? Was he missing covers? Why was his nose bumping up against something? Something hard. He pulled the covers off of his face and saw wooden slats in the dark. Was this the headboard? No. The dream had really messed with his sense of orientation. Was he laying on the wooden floor? No. He wasn't really laying on anything. Had he fallen out of bed? He put his hands on the wooden surface and lifted himself up. This didn't make sense. Was this just confusion from coming out of sleep? That's when his blanket fell off, but not towards the wooden floor he was pushing against. The blanket slid from his chest and fell behind him, back onto his bed. His bed on the floor. Wait. He turned himself around. Below him, his friend slept soundly on the bed next to his own. Julian wasn't laying on the floor. He was laying on the ceiling. He started to scream and then stopped himself. He wasn't exactly presentable. Cairo had his eyes closed with his head turned to the side, slack-jawed and slightly snoring. Julian had often considered that his tendency to sleep in the buff could cause him some problems in an emergency situation like a fire or an intruder. But as he laid on the ceiling, naked as he'd come into the world, he realized this had certainly never been on his lists of reasons why it could be problematic. He started to reach towards the blanket, which was now in a bundle on top of his bed. He kept reaching until he found himself standing, standing upside down on the ceiling. What on God's green earth, he said under his breath. He thought he must be still dreaming. He had to be, until he remembered his freezing friend the day before and the whole manifestation thing Talia and the book had talked about. This must be his new thing, whatever it was. Their beds didn't have much of a base to them, so they weren't very high off the ground. This meant, for Julian, his bed was farther from his reach. The blanket had fallen in a pile, though, so he thought maybe he could reach it. He stood on his tiptoes and stretched out as far as he could. Almost there, but not quite. A quick little hop meant he was able to touch his middle finger to it. He took a breath and leapt just a bit higher. He was nearly able to pinch an edge of it now. The ceiling creaked under his weight with each successive hop. The loudest one made him stop and look over again at Cairo. He stirred a bit. His eyes were still closed, though, still asleep. One more hop and... Finally! He grabbed hold of the bed cover and snatched it up. He slinked the rest of it carefully up to him and wrapped it awkwardly around his waist. He used his hands to hold it down, or up, the lower half of his body. It did not work well for discretion. He fought with it a moment before feeling the blanket drape around him. It fell towards the ceiling, dropping to his feet and covering his body. What was this? He looked up again and saw his underwear laying halfway off the side of the bed. Okay, here we go, he whispered. First leap, no go. Second leap, no go. He stuck his tongue between his teeth and took a breath. Third leap. He swiped his arm back and forth at the peak of his jump. He must have been an inch from it. He didn't notice, but this time the house shook a bit as he landed. He leapt once more and touched it. It was just enough to make it slide off the edge of the bed and onto the floor. 
Julian decided it was time to scream in frustration. He grabbed part of the blanket and bunched it up over his mouth to let it out. Cairo didn't move. He took a deep breath and thought for a moment. Then it hit him. He unwrapped the blanket and let it fall to the ceiling. Weird. He looked up and down for a moment, still trying to figure out how this worked. Then he knelt down and bunched it under his feet. It didn't give him too much more height, but it was better than nothing. He crouched this time before springing himself up as hard as he could. Not quite. He tried again. His legs were spread and his whole body was flailing wildly to get more air. His hand caught the edge of his bed. Whoa, whoa! He loudly whispered as the bed began to lift with his weight. His hand edged up the side of the bed as he lifted it up toward him at a slant. He was breathing heavy from the strain now. He pulled himself down the length of the bed closer and closer to his unmentionables. His fingers were so close. He reached them as far as possible. He was nearly there. Then he watched as the boxers fell softly from the floor up to his hand. Julian squinted. What? The bed dropped toward the ceiling. With a crash, it burst through the top of the house and into the starlit sky, with Julian and his undies hurtling after it. He tumbled through the air with large splinters of wood whirling around him. He went up past the soft glow of the lamps around the cabin, spinning as he went. He passed the tops of the trees. Every time he made a rotating visual pass of the house below, it got smaller and smaller along with the hole in its roof. The quiet night now echoed his scream. Talia was outside, looking around, both hands on fire. She couldn't see anyone. She jumped into the air with a twirl and lit fire beneath her legs. She propelled herself to the roof of the cabin and looked around. The lights were still lit all around the house. She couldn't see predators. She looked down the hole at a bewildered Cairo. He had leapt out of bed at the sound of wood cracking, but was still not totally conscious as he looked up at the new hole in the ceiling. He saw the glowing girl on his roof. Where is he? She asked. Where's who? Julian! What? He realized he hadn't fully taken in the state of his room as he looked around. Where's his bed? He said. A loud crash was heard to the side of the house. Talia looked over to see the broken frame of Julian's bed and his mattress having burst apart. Cairo couldn't see what had happened from inside his room. What was that? Talia gazed up into the sky. She spoke softly. What goes up? Julian had been hurtling for so long that he had managed to make himself stop spinning. The higher he got, the colder he was. After the bed had stopped hurtling up with him, he had narrowly moved out of the way as it fell back down. He found himself thinking, if he was going to die, he'd at least have his dignity, so he managed to slip his underwear back on. His momentum seemed to be slowing, like he was no longer falling as much as he was just floating upwards, unable to stop. He thought about his mom and how she would never know what happened to him. He thought about his brother in prison, about how he knew he would never try to be the son to her that he had tried to be. He closed his eyes. At that moment, he stopped feeling his momentum. Then he felt the drop. His eyes fluttered open to see the forest get closer and closer. He remembered he really wanted to live. A slow scream began building as he started waving his arms wildly. The cabin was nowhere in sight, and somehow he could feel himself free-falling more and more to the left. By the time he was almost to the trees, he didn't know how far he had traveled from where he had been. He found himself rapidly approaching a treetop with branches that looked particularly unforgiving. No! 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 He was beginning to brace for impact just as he felt his momentum change again. He didn't feel as though he was being pulled to the tree, although he was still flying toward it. Gradually, his speed grew to a still frightening but relatively manageable speed as he reached the top of the tree. 
He covered his face with his arms as he entered the barrage of smacking leaves and branches. He got knocked around a bit, but somehow his descent became slow and almost gentle. It wasn't a pleasant experience when his hands, chest, and cheek smacked the side of the trunk, but it wasn't an overly brutal one either. He wrapped himself around the trunk, hugging it tight. He looked down at the shadowy forest way down below. In lieu of an alternate plan, he opted for a pitiful whimper. So, you've never seen this before? Like at all? Cairo said as he watched Talia hop around on one foot, slipping her shoes on. No, I haven't. Now lock the door behind me. Do you think he's going to be okay? You don't, you don't think he's dead, right? Talia scoffed. How would I know that? I'm sorry, I just, you know, you know this place better than me. Is there something that you know that exists that could have done something to him? There's plenty I know that could have done something to him. I don't know too many things that would come through the roof, snatch him up, and throw him and his bed into the sky. But there is stuff that does that? Look, it's probably some kind of manifestation, but if it's put him outside the house at night, he's in trouble, even if he survives the fall. Cairo's eyes widened. So you do think he's maybe flying or something? With his abilities? Could his powers kill him? Talia headed out the door. People have been killed by their own Delinium abilities. Yes, lock the door. What am I supposed to do? Go back to bed? I don't care what you do, just don't go outside. I don't need to do this twice tonight. Cairo sighed and closed the door. Through the windows, he watched as Talia went around the house and out of the lamplight toward the forest. She was silent as her dark hair flowed in the wind. She disappeared into the trees. Cairo found her movements mesmerizing. She was like a phantom or an apparition in the dark, moving like something intangible. Even if she was a bit cold to him, somehow it felt really cool to know a person so mysterious and talented and attractive and... Okay, keep it together, Kai, he said, slapping his face. Just, she's just a girl. Don't be a weirdo. You're a weirdo. Be cool. She... He heard a thump on the roof. She came back for something? He hoped she hadn't heard his neurotic self-talk. He thought he'd try to correct it with the aloof and cool approach. He cleared his throat as he went into his bedroom with a hole in the ceiling. What's up? He peered up into the hole. Nothing but an empty sky. H hello The faint sound of scratching made its way in from the cabin's living room. Kyra whipped his head around to the room's open door. That didn't sound like Talia. Kyra walked to the door and looked out. At the far end of the dark cabin, he saw a shadow. It stood erect. It was far bigger than the girl he'd just seen disappear into the night. The shadow made a move in his direction. He ran and slammed the door closed. Cairo leaned against the door with his whole body. He felt something heavy hit it from the other side. Whoever you are, you need to speak up right now. Who are you? He was speaking in the most commanding voice he could muster in the circumstances. No voice came back. Keeping his shoulders against the door, his hand felt for the doorknob. There was no lock on it. As he tried to steady his breathing, he felt a light and methodical tap against the other side. A clacking, like something hard and dense. He couldn't imagine what this was. He felt like he'd entered a horror movie. Suddenly, the tapping stopped. It was quiet. Cairo leaned his ear against the surface of the door. Boom! He felt the door push hard against him. He realized the doorknob was turned. Boom! The door snapped open, then closed. He staggered back slightly. Boom! Cairo pushed his hand against the door. His palm pressed against the edge of the door frame. He felt a strange sensation that made him look down. Something was forming on the frame. Boom! He managed to keep the door closed and pull his hand away. There, in the shape of his hand was a thin layer of ice. He looked at his hand. He slammed it against the edge of the door and then pulled away again. Another ice handprint. He kept slapping the edge of the door with his shoulder against it. Boom! 
The ice broke. Cairo took a breath. He placed his hand on the doorframe and slid it across its edge. A thick line of ice covered the frame. He did it quickly across the side and covered the top like he was caulking the door. The moment he was done sealing the crack at the bottom, the next strike came. Boom! The ice held fast. The door didn't budge. A smile spread across his face. <laughs> he said triumphantly. He backed up as the door continued to be struck with loud thumps. Light hit his face from the window of their bedroom. He hadn't closed it. He rushed to swing the shutters closed and placed the wooden barricade over it. This time he took a step back and tried to seal the edges at range, just a foot or two away from the window. He put his palm out and a stream of ice flowed from it. He coated the seams effortlessly. It all felt unreal. He didn't know how it worked or where the ice was coming from, but it just felt right. He stopped sealing the window and held his hand up to his face. Wow, he said under his breath, looking at his fingertips. He watched as remnants of tiny ice crystals broke down into little droplets on his fingers, like the first snowflakes of winter. He stepped into the light coming from the hole above him to get a better look. A dark shadow inched slowly over his frosty fingers. He looked up. His voice caught in his throat. His eyes met with a silhouetted mane of wide, jagged protrusions. Sitting deep in a face of shadow were cavernous eyes that glowed black and blue with sparkling white flecks. Their hollow gaze held him fast. Closing his eyes, Julian began to very carefully loosen his grip on the tree. Below him, he had seen a branch that he might be able to make his way down to. He thought maybe an inch-by-inch inch approach was in order. As his arms loosened, he felt a strange frustration. He wasn't sliding down. At all. He loosened them more. Nothing. Julian opened his eyes and looked at the trunk he was hugging to his face. There was no way he was holding his weight with the grip he had on it. He counted to three and let go. There he sat, arms and legs completely outstretched to his sides. And yet his chest remained on the tree. It took Julian a minute or two to get his bearings. Finally, he pushed himself off the trunk. It was like a push-up. He was weighted towards the tree. He stood up. It all felt so very surreal, and the darkness wasn't helping. But he looked around at a sideways forest, and he started to put together what was happening. He walked up and down the trunk before uttering an incredulous laugh. He hopped up and down, each time his feet came back to the side of the tree. This is gonna take some getting used to, he muttered to himself. He jumped again, and somehow this time, he just kept going. He looked up to see the side of another tree, just ahead, that he was floating towards. He looked down to the forest floor, which, from his perspective, was to his side. He knew he should have felt fear, but this was all like a dream. He felt like an astronaut floating through space. When he reached the trunk he was floating towards, he put his hands out. Feeling his weight change, he felt the sensation of briefly doing a handstand. He rolled to a sitting position. He looked up to see the tree he had left, and then looked down to see himself perched on an all-new trunk. Gravity, Julian whispered to himself. He stood up again and looked around at the shadows of trees. He contemplated. It was clear there was a level of control here that he didn't quite understand. The fear he had had was beginning to subside. He was curious. He put his hand out towards a nearby shadowy tree. His body released from the trunk and began falling toward another. It wasn't terribly far, but he felt the feeling of having jumped from a large height. He began to panic. As he gained momentum, he realized if these powers worked like he was thinking they did, he may have made a grave error. He looked around the forest for another tree, and once he'd chosen, his momentum waned. He no longer felt a pull from the tree he was heading towards. His body then began falling toward his new target. 
as his new horizontal fall also seemed to speed out of control due to him again misjudging the distance, Julian decided he wanted back on solid ground. He made his decision too late, however, and his descent to the ground was interrupted somewhat by his entering a grouping of branches on the way down. He started wildly grabbing for tree limbs as the branches knocked him about. Suddenly, he felt a hand grip around his ankle. He couldn't see much in his chaotic descent, with the shadows of the trees now blocking any light from the night sky. He didn't know the nature of the thing that caught him, but he understood the unmistakable sensation of being wrenched upwards by his foot. He found himself laying belly up on a large branch. The shadowy vision of hair and a soft voice addressed him. You two are a handful. It was Talia. Julian breathed a sigh of relief. I thought superpowers would be fun. They aren't. Not here, she said. Julian put his hand on his forehead. How did you find me? You were screaming. I was screaming? You scream like a little girl getting tossed around the treetops. No way, I was not screaming. I would have noticed if all the animals within a mile radius could hear you. You had four very hungry and very confused shadow dogs trying to track you. I think you even managed to attract a nether lurker. Julian sat up. What's a nether lurker? Stay close as we head back and you won't need to find out. It was a fair distance before they reached the cabin again. Julian was surprised at how far he'd gone. He also couldn't work out how Talia had reached him so fast and plucked him from the air. He'd hardly said a word to her on their way back for fear of disturbing her focus. She seemed to be studying the trees as they went. But when they reached the clearing for the cabin, she stopped abruptly. He nearly ran into her. That's not right, she whispered. She rushed to the cabin and disappeared inside. Julian followed her and was rounding the corner when she appeared again in the doorway. No, she said through gritted teeth. She slammed her fist against the doorframe. Unbelievable! Are you both just magnets for trouble? Julian's eyebrows lowered. Well, we found you, didn't we? Don't blame us for how ridiculous it is on your planet or dimension or whatever. Where's Kai? Talia threw something at Julian's feet. He leaned over and picked it up. What is this? It was shaped like a jagged star and made of what looked like animal bones. It was also wet. That's the call of Moslinga. Julian turned it over. Again, I ask you, what is this? Talia stepped down the stairs and snatched it from him. She walked past him and looked into the trees. It means he was taken by the guild. Taken? Julian grabbed her shoulder and whipped her around. Are they dangerous? What does that mean? At that moment, there was a short whistle in the air. Julian felt a prick on his neck. His hand instinctively went to touch it. It was still there, a needle. He pulled it out and looked at it. He was already feeling woozy. His vision was fading as he fell. He watched Talia shake her head and heave a sigh. It means I hope you know how to swim. Chapter 15 Daybreak Raina woke up early in the morning when she heard the birds chirping. She could hear them in the trees down below her window. Morning bird calls had always been a delight of hers when she was small. She was particularly sensitive to them, wherever she was. She remembered the moment she realized that not everyone could understand the conversations being held in the trees. For her, this made them an alarm clock akin to an early morning talk radio show, rather than the simple sounds of the outside. Last night had been pretty fun at dinner with Orion. She had told him about her dance class that her dad had put her in. She showed him the routine she had learned so far from her recital, and he even gave her a round of applause. 
She then started telling him about some of the animals she was learning about in school, and a video she had saw about a hippopotamus putting its baby on a group of alligators. She told him how all the alligators froze in fear just because the mom was nearby. She knew she was the boss, and so did they. She asked if he knew that a hippo's jaw can snap an alligator right in half, and that led into a whole conversation of them swapping animal stories. After the third story of Orion's, the one about the monstrous Galifo, Reyna could no longer contain her excitement for all the new kinds of strange creatures she could see in Dezu. She begged to join him when he went out the next day. He reluctantly agreed, but only on the condition that she'd be up early enough to join him before he left. This is where the bird's morning talk show came in handy. However simple the communication, birds talked about the rising sun, argued over ladybirds, and discussed the pursuit of the day's morning goals. This was her cue to get up and pursue her own. She slipped something on and headed down the winding stairs. The king had told her where to meet him if she was up in time. It was down the stairs, through the foyer, past the dining hall, make a right, go down the hall with the tall windows, make a left, and then a quick right. This led to the courtyard, where, once she had traveled through it, led to a pathway that went outside the palace to what the king called a crossover sanctuary. Guards were posted at the door. They grinned at her and let her pass. Reyna wandered through the door to see Orion in the center of the round room looking in her direction. He wore a smile and had his violet crystal in his hand. You made it, he said. Dad has to be to set early when I come with him sometimes. I'm used to it. Reyna stood next to him. Orion's hand glowed a hot yellow as he lit the purple stone in his palm. She watched it burst in bright light before it nearly instantly reduced back to a solid form. Reyna had squinted and blinked, so when she looked around, she wasn't sure if it had worked. It looks the same, she said. It does. I designed them to be pretty uniform, especially on the inside. But we did move. This sanctuary is near a town called Lima, so it's named after it. How can you tell the difference? Orion rocked his head from side to side. There's little things. I mean, first of all, I can count. It usually takes me to each area in the same numerical order. Lima is usually the first one, but if it scrambles it up for some reason, I can usually tell. Plus, I recognize people like Nisi over there. He pointed to the arm of a sanctuary guard he could see the hand of near the doorframe of the sanctuary entrance. Hi, Nisi. The pale green face of a young woman peeked around the corner with a big smile. Good morning, your highness. How's Jen doing today? He asked. Oh, he's doing okay. Still sick, though. He'll get over it, the big baby. Ah, uh, well, send him my regards. I know you'll keep an eye on him. Absolutely. Enjoy the day. Sure will. You too, the king said as the purple stone flashed again. There was a slight crack in the wall just ahead of them. I know I need to have them fix that, he said. But it's a good marker, so I know this is Crossover Sanctuary Wren. And there's Thomas. He gestured to an old man in brown overalls, sweeping leaves out of the entrance of the room and back into the forest outside. Thomas turned around and waved at them before stepping out of the room. Reyna waved back as he disappeared in another purple-hued flash. And this is Sanctuary Mortania, with... Who is that? Orion started heading for the door. Reyna followed him. He looked around the corner to see the face of the guard. Jero! I thought that was you. Orion hugged the gray, mustachioed, middle-aged man who was taken off guard. Oh, my king, I'm sorry, he said over his shoulder in his embrace. I didn't hear you come in. Orion released him, only to hold his shoulders. You're back and you're distracted. It's all right. I know you're thinking of that boy of yours and that new crop he's growing. Jero shook his head and resigned. It's just not going to bring in the money he thinks it will. I already told him about the satin berry. It's so hard to maintain enough yield for each year. He's a good boy. He just took care of you when you were down and out with that knee. He takes good care of his wife and kids. Trust him a little. It'll turn out all right. Jero sighed. 
You're right. I know I'm right, he said, clapping him on his shoulders. The king started to head down the path as Reyna followed. He called back to Jero as he walked away. You just take it easy. I don't need you out again for weeks. Reyna looked back at the man who was waving. You got it, your highness, he said. And don't call me that, came Orion's steadily distancing reply. They walked for about 10 to 15 minutes together, talking all the way, until they reached a series of downed trees to the left of the pathway. Orion got quiet and began stepping over them, indicating for Reyna to follow. They were a ways into the trees before he stopped. Orion held his hand out and knelt down on one knee. He looked at Reyna, nodding his head for her to look at it. As she did, a swirl of flames began rising from his palm. Her eyes widened in its glow as it got bigger and bigger and swirled higher. A thin, spinning pillar of it reached high into the trees and above the treetops. The looming darkness of the morning was chased away by a dazzling display as the pillar became a ceiling of flames that covered the sky beyond the trees that she could see. Droplets of fire began to fall. Raina started to panic when Orion stayed her with his hand. It's okay, just watch. Raina saw the droplets were in shapes. They fell to her feet, but before they hit the ground, disappeared into nothing. Reach out your hand, he said. Raina put her hand out. Three glowing flames fell to her palm and vanished before impact. She could see they were in the quickly dissipating shape of stars. She was awestruck. Her mesmerization was only interrupted when the forest began to rumble. The flames ceased in Orion's hand and the cool light of the morning returned. She looked up to see the trees begin to shake. Something was making its way to them. Something large. She could feel its footfalls thumping towards them. She looked to Orion, who gave her a reassuring look. The trees were parting at their tops, and she could hear their branches snapping off. Finally, the trees directly before them rustled and stopped. A massive fur-covered hand gripped the tree trunk and out stepped a creature of epic proportions. It was over thirty feet tall and stood upright like a man with broad shoulders and a muscular build, even in comparison to its size. It had horns, but its face and fur color were something like that of a lion, with a big black and pink spotted feline nose. But its facial structure, like its powerful looking rounded jawline, was primarily reminiscent of a bull. It was dressed in dark brown hard leather armor, with parts of it, like its knee pads and elbows, plated with metal. The body approached, and Reyna was frozen as its height seemed to increase the closer it got. It reached behind its back and pulled out a terrifying battle axe the size of an SUV. The sheer size of the creature created a glorious prostration as it bowed down with its fists on the ground and laid the axe horizontally before the king. Even his fiery yellow eyes were averted from the king's gaze. Orion nodded in recognition. At ease, General. Only then did the creature's eyes meet his. He leaned back but maintained a respectful kneeling position. His voice came out dark, deep, and smooth. The Daybreak Army awaits your request, my king. Reyna could see his large, jagged teeth as he spoke. You're all right, my friend. It doesn't need to be business right away. How are you and your people? Orion said. The creature looked at him a moment with his mouth slightly open. He glanced briefly at Reyna before speaking. We are doing well, my leash, but I'm not sure... This is Reyna, by the way, said the king. Reyna, this is General Dai. He's a good man. Loyal. To a fault, really. Reyna hadn't been paying attention to her expression as she gawked at the general, but realized she may have had a dumber look on her face than she had meant to. She quickly smiled and held out her hand. Hello? 
She then immediately felt embarrassed due to the notion of giving such a large thing a handshake. She left her hand out, though, not knowing what else to do. Di obliged her and reached out, gingerly taking her palm between two furry fingers. Greetings. Reyna just stared at where her hand used to be until he released. She then noticed he had claws retracted within each finger. She could only imagine how large they really were and what he could do with them. Reyna is my social ambassador today. She wants to meet your people, the king said. Reyna turned to him wide-eyed and shocked at this plan she hadn't heard of until now. General Dai raised his eyebrows and nodded. Orion gestured to the trees the general had come out of. Just follow the path. They're just down the way, Orion said. Reyna did a double take at the dark pathway and back to the king. She then hesitated before heading off. As she reached the spot Dai had appeared from, two more large furry creatures stepped out. They looked a lot like the general, but were dressed a bit differently, and more importantly, were much smaller. And yet they still towered over Reyna. They stood somewhere between six and seven feet tall. They had serious but not necessarily angry looks on their faces as they stood before her. Reyna looked back to the king. He gave her an assuring look. Go ahead. Reyna looked back to them. They were parted and still allowing her to pass. She did and headed deeper into the forest. The two followed not far behind. Dai had been watching her as she left. Once she was gone, he turned back around. Actually, we are still having some troubles. Our You're talking about the Phylorian gangster again? Said Orion. Right, he's been- Listen, this bounty, it's becoming problematic. You and your men will need to mobilize sooner rather than later. How about discussing how you'd like your problems with him handled? We can make that your payment this time around. Dai blinked his large yellow eyes. He quietly nodded. Reyna found herself inside a camp filled with large furry lion men. They were strapped with armaments on their backs and at their sides and wearing dressed down armor. They were soldiers of some kind, clearly in their off time, sharpening weapons and others having breakfast. They had been mostly quietly talking amongst themselves around campfires and huts, but as soon as each of them noticed her, they fell silent and stared. The silence spread until the entire camp had her attention. About a hundred lion men and about two hundred eyes in the quiet morning was too much pressure for Reyna's feet to keep moving. She stopped in the middle of the camp. H hello Reyna heard her voice come out louder than she had wanted. She remembered Orion's words about being nice to people who are different. She spoke up. I'm, um, I'm supposed to get to know you. I'm Reyna, and the king said he wanted me to meet you. She trailed off. She felt like this sounded more stupid the more she talked. One of her trailing escorts stepped forward from behind her. The king called the girl his ambassador. We are to give her our greetings. Several of the lion men turned away, and Reyna could hear the troops sigh and grumble to each other in a language she hadn't heard before. Some started back up with what they were doing before. One of them stepped forward out of the crowd. She could see that he was older and gray on the fur around his cheeks. Hello, young one, he said. We are the Daybreak Army of the Fuja people. My name is Nofudad. Reyna nodded nervously and reached out for his hand. His handshake was much more evenly matched than Dai's, but her hand was still swallowed by his. Feel free to wander our camp and enjoy our morning cakes and roasted stratton meat. Is that like bacon or more like... Well, well my, my dad makes this shredded... She overheard loud arguing in the soldier's language and was caught off guard by its severity. She leaned past Nofu and saw a huge Fuja with jagged metal shoulder pads hunched over and yelling at a smaller companion. His teeth were bared as he spoke. The words she made out were short statements. I don't care. And... He's doing it again! Nofu turned around. Kosh, stop! We have a guest! 
he said. The Fuja he called Kosh turned to him with a look that could burn through walls. He stood erect and began to approach. That's not a guess, that's a slap in the face. He sends a Nam girl into our camp? She's a child, Kosh. She's not hurting anyone. We show our hospitality here. We always have. I'm sorry, said Reyna. The two stopped arguing and looked at her. Reyna realized she hadn't said it in her native tongue. She had said it in theirs. The two had been speaking about her in the language of their people. Reyna had simply responded in kind. The warriors looked at each other and then back at her. Kosh leaned down to address her. Why do you speak, Fujinai? Reyna looked terrified into his orange eyes. It's, uh, I, I guess, uh, I kind of speak everything. Kosh stood tall again. Reyna supposed he had to be about as high as a professional basketball hoop. The girl is a Vincarsi. Why bring another human amongst us, the mind of the man? He turned around and paced away from her. Up close, Reyna noticed Kosh was not only dressed more stylistically than the rest, but on his back she saw he had a round metal plate set rather strangely in place. It was to the left of the wavy sword strapped to him and just above his shoulder blade. It had the mark of a sun etched into it. She's here to spy, he said as he looked into the crowd of men who were gradually beginning to grow attentive to the conversation. It's not enough that we are under his thumb. He wants into our minds, our private thoughts. He was speaking loudly now to get everyone's attention. It worked. All eyes were on him. He turned back to her, a few feet away now. You want something to take back to your king? If you can understand what I say, then hear this, girl. The ruler of the Nam is a king of smoke. At his flaming hand we lost fathers, mothers, daughters, and sons. They went up in that smoke, both during and after the war. Our grieving ceremonies were endless. For this reason he is known to us as the Pyre King. He is a king of death, so we will never belong to him until our dying breath. The shine of metal flashed before them. With a loud thunk, the massive double-edged blade of a battle axe blocked Reyna's view of Kosh. A sound like a strong wind introduced General Dai into her field of vision, reaching for the giant hilt. Kosh, you will be silent. He spoke in Fujinai as he swiftly pulled the axe up. The thirty-five-foot general dwarfed the angry warrior. This small wicked child speaks our tongue, Kosh said. This is not innocent. It's an affront to- You will be speaking out of turn no longer if I- Reyna? It was the voice of Orion. She turned around to see him walking up the pathway into the camp. He looked surprised. Is everything okay? Of course, my king, said Dai. Simply a wild misunderstanding. Orion frowned. I'm glad I got here before it got too out of hand. He looked at Kosh, who wore a stone-cold expression. I hope one day your right hand will learn something other than his mother tongue. I trust then we'll have a much better rapport. I'm sure he will, Dai said. He's been going to the markets a bit more. He'll get there. Sure, Orion said with a nod. He looked to Reyna. Ready to go? She nodded her head with nervous enthusiasm. As they left, Reyna looked back quickly to try and leave the camp with a polite smile. The Fuja leader stood with his axe head down on the ground, resting his hands on its hilt surrounded by the solemn expressions of his troops. Kosh stepped out from behind the giant and his blade to glare at her. She whipped her head back, following Orion quickly on his heels. They were a ways away before Orion cleared his throat to speak. So, how were they? Reyna pressed her lips together. Nice! They were nice. What did they talk to you about? The question hung in the air for a moment. Mostly just... breakfast. 
Ah, well, the Fuja do do it right. They walked for a bit longer. Hey, what was it you said last night? The thing you said about what you liked about hippos? Raina thought for a moment. Um, that they know how to put bullies in their place? Yeah, that was it, said the king with a smile. Yeah, I think I like that too. Chapter 16 The Tribe of the Lake Kyra's head bobbed. He felt water dripping down his face. The warmth of the sun beat down on his forehead. The contrast of warmth cooking his skin for a long period combined with the cool droplets was uncomfortable. Not uncomfortable enough, though, because he had soon dozed off again. He did this a few more times before he felt a very wet and very unforgiving hand slap him repeatedly on the cheek. He opened his eyes to see a face, but it was a face like none he'd seen before. The eyes that stared back at him were deep and bulbous, with dotted reflections in them that sparkled like stars. It was as though he gazed into twin microcosms of a galaxy. Between them was a nose that partially protruded from the face like a lump, only to reveal two slits for nostrils that flared from water tight to wide as they sniffed him. The mouth opened partially to reveal jagged teeth that weren't particularly vicious looking, but certainly looked more formidable than that of a human mouth. The face wasn't snarling or showing much more expression than looking over him methodically. Kyra was frozen for a moment as he recognized the mane of fins that surrounded its face. Before, he couldn't see the face in detail, but it was clear now this was the same creature that had looked down into his room from the roof of the cabin. His memory wouldn't give him much more than that. He had blacked out for some reason. The creature was pulling something that he felt tighten around his chest. He looked down and realized he was tied down. He was strapped firmly against something. It was wooden and curved. A log? His chest and legs were strapped down to it. The rope was strong, but was wet and green. It looked like something not found on land. He was too drowsy to react too much at this point, but he began to notice the prettiness of the face that strapped him down. Its form was aquatic and extreme, but it had an undeniable elegance to it, even beauty. It didn't seem malicious to him. He realized the creature was female. She crawled all around him, pulling at the ropes. They weren't too tight. She just seemed to be making sure they were secure. It was at this point that he noticed her retractable claws that were gripping the wood he was mounted on. The log was a wide stake. He thought maybe ten times his body width. It seemed smooth, which is why the claws suddenly became very noticeable. She moved out of his field of vision to crawl around the back. Now he could see his predicament a bit clearer. He had been hoisted high above water. It was a body of water that was reasonably wide, the edge of which was about 500 feet away, met by large rocky walls that lifted about 50 feet out of the surface. The walls surrounded him in a circle as far as he could see in his field of vision, like he was in some kind of watery arena. At the top of the walls he saw movement. It was more creatures like the one crawling on the stake with him. There were a variety of shapes and sizes, male and female, but clearly all the same species. They lined the tops of the crags, speaking to each other, many of them staring in his direction. He started to feel awake enough to feel the fear swelling inside of him. He began breathing heavily and felt the ropes tighten against his chest with each breath. He felt a hand on his cheek again, gently this time. The female creature guided his face toward the water straight ahead of him. 
His gaze was directed to a group of the aquatic humanoid creatures that were rising up in unison from the water. Their belly and torsos were above the surface, and they were organized in a way that almost looked like an Olympic swim team. They were perfectly spaced apart, and they all turned to face the creatures on the walls. In unison, they extended their arms with their palms face up and bent them at the elbow. They then turned and all looked up to face Cairo. Cairo felt his head hit the wood behind him at the sudden intense gaze of so many strange faces. The group repeated the same arm gesture towards him before receding underwater. The creatures on the walls erupted in a screeching sound like he had never heard. Something like a repetitive clicking mixed with a high-pitched battle cry. They lifted their arms in the air as they did so. Cairo looked around frantically and caught sight of the female creature beside him. She had the claws of her hand and foot dug deeply into the wood next to him as she looked out to the crowd, with her other leg hanging and her other arm lifted to the sky. An unseen chorus began. Cairo looked back to the water as figures began rising from it again. This time, the creatures all had weapons. There were two groups, one with what looked like caked-on blue clay paint and a group that did not. They turned to each other and began to mock battle as Cairo watched, growing increasingly confounded. The ones in blue paint seemed to be winning the battle until the ones without paint began to retreat. Simultaneously, to the right of Cairo's view, he saw a series of thick branches with foliage on them, clearly picked from the trees on the shore. They rose up from the water and moved toward the non-painted group as they retreated from the mock battle and ran in their direction. A forest, he thought. The group went into the makeshift trees that were clearly being held upright underwater by unseen performers. As the unpainted group moved through them, the trees acted like a rolling treadmill. A row of trees would hit an unseen barrier at the left and then uniformly sink before reappearing on the other side of the staged forest. It was clear to Cairo this was symbolizing them traveling through the woods. A new set of performers appeared between the trees, these ones painted in a muddy yellow clay paint. The yellow men fought the unpainted ones, and Mock killed some of them, so the group of the unpainted performers grew smaller and smaller. Eventually, the trees began to create an open circle in the middle, revealing open water. In the center, a stone with green moss on it was lifted up to the surface. The unpainted performers simulated diving into this watery clearing. They came up and again coordinated a dance around the moss-covered stone. The creatures on the edges of the wall began their high-pitched cry and clicking again. Cairo's eyes raised as he began to understand. This was their story. The clearing was the lake and the stone was the island. They were telling him what happened to them? But why? A drumbeat began. It was slow, deep, and methodical. Its intensity calmed the cries of the creatures to a silence. Only it remained now. Cairo looked around to see where it was coming from. He couldn't tell, and his search stopped when the female creature beside him turned his head again by his chin and directed him toward the watery stage. The stone in the center sank to reveal a symbol. It rose from the depth slowly and sat on the surface. It was made of large bones and looked something like the symbol of a star. The trees fell away until only the star symbol remained, with the performers in a circle around it. They all seemed to be trembling. One by one, a performer was lifted up by the group and placed into the top triangular space in the star. He or she would cross his arms over their chest and close their eyes in resignation. They would sink slowly into the dark below. They did this over and over, to the beat of the deep drum. Cairo felt his heart sink deeper with each performer. He became sick with dread. The trees appeared once more to the right, and again the treadmill began. A few rogue performers left the group and started traveling through the trees. 
This act caused the stage to widen and shift to the left. The process of the performers sinking into the star continued as the trees moved in the series of sinking rows closer to the center of the arena. The few performers who had traveled into the trees eventually reached a new creature in yellow paint, rising above the trees. He sat on something that looked like a throne. It was cobbled together with bark and stones from land, but also of many marine debris Cairo couldn't identify. Atop his head was a rudimentary crown made of some kind of seaweed with a bright orange color. The performers pleaded with the man on the high throne, but he shook his head and sent them away with a firm and decisive gesture in the direction of the stage lake. The performers left him, appearing dejected as the treadmill of trees reversed direction. The crowned yellow creature in his throne receded under the surface with the rightmost row of trees. On their simulated trip back to the lake, another creature in yellow wandered aimlessly through the staged forest. The chorus increased in intensity as the performers in the trees stalked him. In a moment, he was hoisted above the heads of the travelers and was flailing wildly. They emerged from the trees as the simulated lake again took center stage. The yellow creature was bound by the arms and legs to stop his flailing. A small stake emerged from the triangular space in the star. Its similarities to the stake Kyra was on was glaringly obvious. The creature painted yellow was strapped to it. He was then lowered carefully into the symbol until the creature's yellow hue could no longer be seen above the water's surface. The drumming stopped. The performers stopped. They uniformly turned to face Cairo. They stared at him in resign. Cairo realized the whole crowd had fallen silent. He looked up. All the creatures on the walls looked at him with eyes of black. In an instant, the performers all sank at once into the water. The drumming began again. Bara bara bum 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 bara bara bum 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 bum. The beat continued as the beautiful female water creature swung herself over Cairo's disconcerted face. Her astronomical eyes looked deep into his and then closed with a softness. She leaned her forehead onto his as she gently put her hand behind his neck. She held this for a moment. Cairo's eyes remained wide open, terrified of her intention. She opened her eyes and lifted her head from his. Her hand moved to caress his cheek. She then let herself fall backwards into the water. He watched her swim with grace and an uncanny swiftness to the stone wall and began to climb. She reached the top to join the other black eyes fixated on his position. Cairo came to the realization that nothing was left in the arena but the symbol of bones in the water and himself on the stake to stare at it. The symbol seemed to stare back at him. He waited tense minute after tense minute. He felt like he was mesmerized by the thing. A low hum of a chorus and the drumbeat growing louder and louder drew him into the mystery. The symbol concealed something. Something he could feel something beyond it, a powerful something, something rising up, something gray, something gray and wide and rows of teeth lining a massive jaw caught the symbol in a pulverizing grip. The symbol rose up with the mouth as the body of an enormous creature rose from the water. The bones bent and then splintered as they buckled in its ferocious craw. In a loud snap, it was all gone at once. The drumming stopped. The chorus fell silent. 
The creature's giant antlered reptilian head lowered its gaze to face the young man bound before it. There, with sheets of water coating and dripping from it, was the same symbol again. This time, hewn with scales and dazzlingly graven on the monster's forehead. Chapter 17 The Ancient of the Lake The ground felt very, very strange. Julian was laying down halfway on his side on a surface that felt somehow squishy. He rubbed it with his palm before opening his eyes. He couldn't wrap his mind around exactly what he was seeing. The floor was a pinkish gray. It felt wet. It also smelled funny. He began to lift himself up when his head and shoulders hit a hard, curved surface above him. Julian blinked hard and really started to make sense of what was around him. It was dim, but he was surrounded by... No, he was contained inside of something. The ceiling above him was warped and rounded and fairly translucent. It looked like misshapen glass. And as a result, he couldn't tell exactly what he was looking at beyond it. He looked down at himself. He was encased by the ceiling over this strange bed he was on. Pink and soft. Like spongy flesh? As the word crept into his fuzzy consciousness, Two elongated tentacles with bulbous ends crept out from the sides of his hips. In a slick and silent motion, the bulbous tips opened to reveal two bulging, suspended eyes about the size of baseballs. Separately, they began surveying his body up and down. Julian screamed. The eyes snapped in his direction and their eyelids folded all the way back, leaving totally naked eyeballs staring at him. As Julian thrashed in a panic, he began to rise inside his capsule along with his new fleshy friend. The lid of his container snapped open. The soft creature dropped with a plop and its tentacled eyes sunk tightly into the pink surface under his legs. He was suddenly covered in light. He rolled out of his strange container onto wet, muddy stone ground, still screaming. He looked back at his squelchy bed and realized it was shaped like a giant open clam. He looked around the room to see yellow glowing orbs functioning as light sources stuck to the stone walls of a cave. As his gaze went around the room, he finally turned and saw Talia standing over him with a palm on fire. Her serious and unamused expression stayed on her face until Julian realized he was still screaming. He stopped. She extinguished her flaming hand, and they stared at each other a moment. I'm claustrophobic, Julian said. Talia frowned. I was heating them open, but it looks like you don't need my help. You need to get us out of here, she said. W me Yes, you. Why me? Talia pointed to a dark pool behind her. Because that's our way out and we can't swim the distance. Out from where? Where we? Talia walked over to the giant clam which had its tentacled eyeballs extended again, watching the two of them talk. Julia noticed a second clam in the room that he hadn't noticed before nearby, but this one was closed. Tully began trying to close the top of the open clam. This is some kind of holding chamber. The guild brought us here in these. I don't know why, and I don't want to find out. She was grunting as she continued trying to push down on the clam, whose eyes had now wandered from Julian to her. They seemed to be trying to figure out what she was doing. They pump water out and air in, so they work for moving people underwater. The eyes suddenly seemed to recognize Talia's efforts and snapped shut of its own accord. 
Talia stumbled forward, tripping over the giant clam, but caught herself. Julian frowned. All right, so bonkers, as usual. But what am I supposed to do? I need you to move this. Tolly was pointing to the clam. Julian raised an eyebrow. He stood up and started walking toward it. No, no, Talia said. I need you to move it through the air, with your mind. Julian smirked. I can't move things with my... Your bed crashed through the roof along with a bunch of other things in your room. You didn't just move yourself, you moved the things around you. I need you to move this. Julian didn't know what to say. You don't... I mean, it's not like that, though. I can't just move stuff around. I fell. I was falling up and around and all over the place. So, make this fall all over the place. Julian looked at the clam. He looked at Talia and then back at the clam. The clam lifted and smacked Talia in the side. She fell over and the clam fell to the ground next to her. Oh, jeez, I'm sorry. Talia got up quickly and brushed herself off. How about you try the ceiling first? Julian refocused. He looked at the ceiling and then at the clam. He went back and forth a few times before the clam began to rise. It fell up and landed above them. Good, she said. Now, back to the floor. Julian took a deep breath. He tried again. The clam fell to the floor. Again, Talia said. Julian repeated a few more times. Talia then had him try it across the room to each wall. While he practiced, the clam's lid cracked open slightly for the two tentacled eyes to get a peek at what was happening. This is, uh, way easier than I thought it would be. Talia nodded. Harper says delinium abilities fuse to you, like you've always had them. It takes practice to learn more complicated techniques, but once you learn them, it sticks. Julian was smiling as he swayed his hand back and forth, guiding the clam to and fro. Yeah, man, it's like muscle memory or something. I'm getting this. The clam was hovering now in the middle of the room as Julian experimented with balancing it between two surfaces. Talia approached it and pushed it to the ground. She lit her hand and rubbed the outer edge of the mouth of the shell. The clam popped open again. Get in. Oh, jeez, no, please, Julian said with a disgusted look on his face. Talia sighed. Do you have to be difficult about everything? Cairo needs you. This is how you help him. How about you tell me what the plan is before I snuggle up again with an oyster? Talia's eyelids fell as the clam's tentacled eyes rose up again and began looking around. She made her way over to the other clam in the room. After you got shot by the seamy seamy dart, I dropped two. I faked sleep to make them think one of them had already shot me. The guild bought it. They carried us both to the clams at the edge of the lake. Talia tried the same fire trick on the other closed clam and it popped open. The tentacled eyes inside blinked like they had just woken up. You can see through the shells, she said as she stepped onto the clam whose eyes now looked confused. So while you were sleeping, I was watching. They took us way too far for us to swim back. You're going to need to move us out of here inside them so we don't drown. She laid down and pulled the clam over herself, this time with ease due to a much more cooperative clam. I'll point us and you float us. She was yelling at him, but it came out muffled. Julian nodded at a blurry version of the girl through the shell of the clam. He went over to his own and reluctantly laid on his squishy bed with curious eyes. He pulled and pulled until the clam understood and closed over him. He looked to Talia. He could still see her through two layers of warped clam shell, even if it was just barely. With intent, he focused, and the two rose up in unison. He carefully moved them to the pool at the other side of the room. In they dropped with a splash, followed by the muffle of dark waters. Sometime later, a pool on the surface of the island began to stir. 
two clams bubbled up. Julian reduced the gravity in both clams so the mussels floated within their shells. They popped open. <laughs> I'm amazing, he said, putting his arms up in the fresh air. The clam tilted with his shift in weight, and Julian flailed as he fell into the water. Ugh, he said between gulps of air as he tried to keep his head above water. It's a friggin' maze down there. Julian waded to the edge of the pool. He looked up to see Talia reaching down to lift him out. A strangely empty maze, she said. Julian stood up next to her on solid ground. How do you consistently manage to make bad things sound worse? The sound of drums came in loud and all at once. The two whipped their head in their direction. We need to hurry, said Talia. She started in the direction of the rhythm. She was walking fast and Julian tried to keep up. What's happening? You know about this? Where's Cairo? The guild are almost a myth. They're rarely seen. People tell a lot of stories, but ultimately everyone knows it's not good what happens on this island. They were weaving through trees and around brush, moving farther inland. Julian was looking around more as he began to notice netted water vine, baskets made of something like wicker hung in the trees, and little wooden effigies that looked like people with fins. Well, that's not surprising. You've successfully pulled off making me not expect good things to happen around here. Talia scoffed. A creature owns this lake, and this island. He has for as long as anyone can remember. Then the guild came to live here. So now he owns them too. She stopped in her tracks. Julian was looking at his feet when he bumped into her. He looked up. Before them stood a beast of a man, and not simply because he looked like a fish. He was a very large guild warrior, draped in a mesh skirt and a shawl of large fish teeth. He held a spear that was double-bladed with serrated ends on each side. His mane of fins were splayed out with eyes like a starry night sky bearing down on them. Talia reached back and pushed Julian behind her. Julian quietly obliged. Talia put her hands out in front of her and made a shape like a house above her head. She then lit her fingertips and drew a large shape like an A the size of her body. The fire kept its form, hovering in the air. She continued to draw until Julian recognized the shape as the star symbol made of bone she had shown him at the cabin. The warrior's eyes widened with concern. Then she began to speak. Julian was taken aback when he realized she was speaking a strange language. She seemed to be gargling and warbling. He watched as the expression on the warrior's faces changed from concern to a serious recognition. As the floating symbol of fire began to fade, Julian realized it was more than just the three of them. Hiding in almost plain sight was a series of guild warriors peering from the trees. Some were up in the canopy, and others peeked around trunks. Still others had actually been standing in front of the trunks, almost blending in. Maybe they had been blending in. He spun around slowly, and realized they had been surrounded, and he didn't know for how long. But he realized it was Talia speaking that was revealing the hidden warriors, and it was her speaking that made the one in front seem to soften more and more. Finally, he looked around and called out to them. The guild gave him their attention and then receded into the trees. The soldier turned around and took off in a run in the direction of the drums. Julian was dumbfounded. Talia turned to him. Let's go. She took off running in the same direction. Julian ran to keep up and called after her. What in the world did you tell them? We're Vincarsi. They didn't know. She called back. I thought you said no one sees these guys. How do you know their language? Feras always said the more languages you speak, the better your odds of talking your way out of a fight. Feras? Talia stopped with her arms out again to stop Julian from moving ahead, but he was already slowing down at the sight ahead of her. 
In mass, the aquatic people were dissipating at the edge of a cliff. They scattered into the trees and ran past them. The warrior who had ran ahead of them was running back. He gave Talia a nod as he passed. But more than the strange crowd of disappearing alien creatures, it was what was beyond them that was most awe-inspiring. Just beyond the cliffs was a large, round body of water. In its center, risen above the surf, was a titanic monster, sporting broad, thin shoulders, with two arms that almost looked like a man's. Its bottom half was octopus-like, churning the water below him with tentacles the girth of sedans. He was facing away toward a huge wooden beam with carvings in it. And just beyond the antlers of the thing, he could see the ropes and the small figure of the young man tied by them. Kai, he whispered. Throw me, said Talia, her arms lit with fire all the way up to her shoulders. What? Julian said, bewildered at the sight before him. Talia called back to him while in full sprint toward the edge of the cliff. Aim for the ropes! Throw me! She took a flying leap. In a desperate gesture to gain control, Julian reached out both of his hands and tightened his fists. To his relief, Talia didn't plummet to the waters below. Her leap held in the air as she began hurtling towards the sacrificial mount. Cairo looked up at the interlocking trap of teeth lining the massive head before him. Water that had been pooled in its bony, skin-covered, and moose-like antlers was still streaming down the creature's face. Its head reared back, and its mouth opened in a movement disturbingly swift for its size. Cairo felt heat. The creature lurched forward, clapping its jaws shut. Cairo felt a gust of dispersed air as it snapped just in front of Cairo's face. Its powerful hand rose from the water and grabbed hold of the stake just below the spot he was strapped to. The wood splintered under the pressure but stayed upright. The hand slid down the pole as the creature dropped into the water, making waves crash up and around the pole. Cairo heard a thud on the wood. He looked up. Talia stood crouching sideways on the pole above his head. You sure know how to show a girl a good time. We just met a local legend. What is that thing? said Cairo. He's called Moss Linga, she said. And you just made me introduce myself by shooting him in the head. Bad first impressions. She reached out the hand of her non-inflamed arm. Get ready. Her flaming hand grabbed hold of the ropes that entangled him. Cairo looked up at her feet set firmly on the wood surface. How, how are you doing that? The ropes began to snap, and Cairo could feel himself sliding as their grip loosened. Julian's getting the hang of things, Talia said with a nod in the direction of the cliffs. Cairo looked out and saw Julian waving his arms. He was pointing at something. Cairo looked down in the direction he was pointing, just as another rope snap made him begin sliding further. Panic on two fronts struck him then. The tingling sensation of falling ran up his spine from his toes. The second was the aquatic antlers and the symbol of a star becoming more visible as they once more rose to the surface of the water below him. Cairo! He looked up to Talia's cries but missed her saving hand as he began flailing towards the rocking waves below. He turned towards where he was falling in time to see the monster's face pass him as it rose up the pole, wrapping arms and tentacles around it. The splash of his plunge and the muffling silence of the water disoriented him. He looked around the myriad of bubbles and white water. As the water cleared, he saw more tentacles. They swirled round and round him, tossing him about as he held his breath. As soon as he could find his orientation, he looked up and swam to the surface. Emerging, he took a deep breath and looked around. Just above, 
encompassing virtually the entirety of his vision, was the massive body of Moss Linga. The beast pushed off the sacrificial pole, snapping it the rest of the way with a crack. In the hang time between the pole snap and the creature hitting the water, a cry rang out. It was Talia. It lingered until the crashing of the waves swallowed it into nothing. The monster and the girl were gone. Chapter 18 Moss Linga From the cliffs, Julian watched without realizing how hard he was pressing both his palms into the sides of his head. When he saw Cairo deliberately dive beneath the waves after the creature, he finally stopped and began to pace frantically. Crap, 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 no, no! He stopped and looked to the ledge. Okay. He shook his hands with his fingers splayed out. He backed up and started to run for the edge. Beneath the surface, Cairo looked around. As his eyes adjusted to the darkness of the waters, he saw the tentacles of the monster propelling it deeper and towards the edge of the pool. As Moslinga's arm stroked the water back, he saw a light in his fist. It was the dim light of a fire engulfed in bubbles. The fist of the sea monster shook until the light went out. He threw a figure farther down into the depths. The figure of a girl. Cairo started frantically trying to swim down, knowing before he even started that he was too far to save her. The monster's octopus-like tentacles propelled him in a wide circle as it began to go around the edge of the pool. Cairo could see the wall of the pool gave way to a deep, dark cavern underneath. The cavern stretched all around the edges of the pool, only discernible from underwater. Cairo swam as hard and as fast as he could toward the shadow of the limp young woman. Her silhouette stirred and began to slowly tread water. Cairo sparked with hope, just as he felt his body begin moving faster through the water. It was much faster than he knew his arms were capable of taking him. He stopped swimming. It felt as though he was falling towards her quickly, like he was being pulled through the water. He looked up and down, until he spotted Julian wading in the water just above him. He was looking down with his arm outstretched. He wasn't reaching out to him, though. He looked like he was guiding him. He turned his head to see Talia, but he caught a glimpse of movement. He froze as he saw the beast of the lake rear its body toward them again. The gaze of Moslinga's ferocious face narrowed on both of the boys. He had an unmistakable shine in his eye. The look of a predator who just spotted prey. Cairo's speed suddenly increased. He looked up to see Julian had seen it too, and was now propelling them both through the water. Cairo looked ahead to Talia, who was treading water and facing them. Cairo could see her face now. She was assessing her surroundings before looking bewildered as she started quickly falling backwards without her control. In a powerful serpentine motion, Mosalinga began his pursuit. Down and down they went with escalating speed. The darkness grew closer and closer. Cairo grew terrified of running out of air. Julian felt the fear of suffocation creeping in too, but he knew something Cairo did not. As the three of them passed through the mouth of the caverns, Julian looked up. There they were. Between broken and intact stalactites, Hundreds of clams were floating on the ceiling of the underwater cave. Julian was soaring through the water with his arms out to his side. He spun like a propeller to get visual on three specific clams. In the same motion, 
He changed their polarity from the ceiling so that each clam gravitated towards them. One for Cairo, one for Talia, and one for him. Julian's powers were starting to feel like muscles he could stretch. He held the three of them now, along with the three clams. This made six objects at once. It didn't feel like he was maxing himself out, either. So now, it was time to try his clam-popping trick, and hopefully not pop his friends at the same time. The clams grew closer to each of them, nearly colliding. In unison, they snapped open. Cairo's eyes widened as the clam he just noticed in his peripheral came at him with its jaws wide. In an instant, Cairo was enclosed inside. He let air out of his lungs in a panic. When fresh air pushed water out of the shell, he was almost scared to breathe it. He finally relented. As his eyes adjusted to the translucent shell, he heard a powerful rumble. Just outside, a pillar had shattered. Several stones rained down to the cave floor. Julian, still at the back of the line, looked back to see a disturbingly close Moslinga opening his mouth. As he did, a force emanating from his jaws, manifesting as a ball of water, could be seen tearing through the stone columns around them. It traveled past the three of them in their clamshells and disappeared in the water ahead. Talia, the farthest in front, could see a light at the end of the tunnel just before the force of the displaced water spun them out of control. In the swirling confusion, Julian lost control of everyone's gravity, but managed to catch some of the falling stones and reverse their polarity in the direction of the sea monster. He temporarily slowed his pursuit as he was pelted. As they slowly rose to the ceiling of the cave, they all got a sense of the shape of their surroundings. The cave was a pathway. It was a size large enough for the creature of the lake to move from the lake to the center of the island and back again. They were traveling the hall to his sacrifice. From the ceiling between stalactites, Julian looked down to see Moslinga shake his head and look around for them. Kara was beginning to realize how helpless he was without Julian carrying them through the water. Talia was measuring the distance to the surface in her head to see if she'd be able to make it if she burned her way out of the clam. Moslinga searched all around his tunnel and then looked up at the ceiling. Julian held his breath. Moslinga kept staring with reflective eyes the size of manhole covers, glistening with the light of the exit they were so close to. He seemed to be looking right at them, but he wasn't. He realized the creature's predicament. The ceiling was covered in floating air-filled clams. The three of them were just new additions to the pile. The monster floated up to the ceiling and shook the cave as his claws dug into the stone. He was right behind them, sniffing the mass of clams. Julian watched in horror as the creature grabbed one in his mouth and with a snap that rippled through the water, cracked open the clam shell. His fat tongue snaked out and licked the large muscle out of its home. Cairo watched as the empty shell sank slowly to the cave floor. Moslinga repeated the process again and again, sniffing, cracking, and slurping his way closer and closer to the three of them. Cairo couldn't see from his position where Julian was, but when he looked ahead, he could see Talia. He had watched where she had floated up to when they had stopped falling toward the cave exit. He couldn't be sure how close the monster's gnashing teeth were to his friend, and he probably wouldn't until it was too late. The beast drew closer and closer, his movement shaking all the clams together in a dance with each burrowing clutch of his powerful clawed hands. Kyra was watching to see if his friend had slipped out of any of the clams to be swallowed up by the hungry mouth. He couldn't tell. His heart sank, and the pit in his stomach grew. Suddenly, the beast stopped 
and looked in Cairo's direction. He froze. Could he see him? Did he finally spot him in the clear shell? No. It looked like the monster's eyes were looking through him. He almost didn't dare take his eyes off him to look where he was looking, but he finally did. There, swimming just ahead, was Talia. She was waving her arms frantically to get the monster's attention. It was working. Cairo looked back to see Maslinga's face form a look that he could only recognize as fury. The sea monster pushed itself off of the cave ceiling. No, Cairo thought. She can't. He wasn't going to sit by and watch this happen. He couldn't. He put both his hands on the sides of the clam. Ice filled the chamber around him. Water started to flow in as the shell began to open. The clam began to react and move as ice started to creep from the inside to the outside of the shell. Moss Linga spotted it with a mouthful of large, shredded muscle hanging from his mouth. With a thud, he stopped short and landed back on the ceiling. He put his face over the squirming thing and watched ice crystals form larger and larger on it. His looming jaws came down with a bite. No crack. In fact, Moslinga's teeth didn't feel a shell at all. He felt his mouth begin to fill, cold and hard. The ice was pushing his jaws open. He bit down harder, but it was so wide, so fast, he was losing leverage for his jaw. He let go of the ceiling. Just then, a cylinder of ice came shooting out of his mouth. Moslinga grabbed at his teeth with his claws, trying to dig the thing out. It was wedged tight and frozen to his gums. He watched as the tube of ice extended from his mouth like a straw and headed toward his swimming prey. It engulfed her and exited the underwater cave. On the surface, just outside the island, the ice cylinder popped out with a splash and shot two figures out of its mouth. Cairo and Talia were flying across the water through the air. Ice extended around the ice tube across the water's surface. A sheet spread quickly across the water below them. Cairo extended his hands. Ice shot from them and froze more of the lake as their bodies came falling toward it. The speed of their flight sent them sliding across it as fast as they collided, yet Cairo's ice kept up. They slid dozens of feet on the slick surface, the momentum and lack of friction subduing their fall. Cairo rolled up and onto his feet as he slid. He tried to steady himself and immediately came to a stop on the ice. His hands were out to his sides as he stood still. It was abnormal. He had stopped on a dime. As he looked puzzled down at the ice, he caught a glimpse of Talia zipping past him. He spun around with his hand out, extending the ice further for her. She wasn't stopping. With a slight curve of his wrist, the ice path that froze the surface curved upward. A frozen wave curled up into the air, sliding Talia up with it. She went hurtling back through the air in Cairo's direction. She was understandably screaming now. Cairo put both his hands out and made a tube again, this time in midair that caught the flying girl. He formed it so it went up and over him. Cairo called to mind the jungle gym slides he used to ride in the kids' area in his recreation center down the street. The ice slide curved to his side, and from its open mouth popped a bewildered Talia, landing neatly into his arms. He flashed a quick half-smile before looking up, and realizing the slide he made was coming down. Like he was pulled by an unknown force, his feet slid them effortlessly and nearly instantaneously across the ice sheet and out of the way of the crashing ice structure that had been suspended in midair. It broke into large chunks as the two of them stared. Kyra was stunned. Talia turned and looked up at his dark and confused eyes, still figuring out what he'd done. She was sure he was still nearly unaware of holding her. She gave him two gentle slaps on the cheek. Good job. Put me down. 
Cairo shook his head and almost dropped her as he suddenly felt her body in his arms. She was very firm, and yet very soft. He kept it together as he placed her feet first on the ice. Talia was trying to settle how slick the ground was when it began to move. She balanced herself as she looked down. The outline of massive moose-like antlers waited under them. A slithering body of arms and tentacles pushed the ice up as he slid just beneath their tiny frozen island. Talia slipped and almost fell as the ice cracked between the two of them. No, actually, pick me up. She grabbed Cairo's arm and swung herself onto his back. Go, go, go! She yelled in his ear as she wrapped her legs around his waist. Oh, whoa! Cairo said as the ice started to rock and break apart. Make more go! Cairo looked around as the ice pieces got farther and farther apart, splashing water up to them. He put his arms out. A sheet of ice started forming rapidly, linking the pieces back together. Hang, hang on, he said as he took a running stance. Cairo took off. He moved across the ice, not running, but jetting across it with a speed he could never have imagined. He felt like videos he'd seen of expert figure skaters, only his feet had a power to them. Not like something from muscles, but an energy. Something coursing through his body that impelled him across the ice. He felt both exhilarated and terrified, as all at once he saw the crystal sheets forming ahead of him and heard the sound of shattering behind. A roar echoed across the water. A sound like a guttural churning of an engine mixed with the sound of a high-pitched rage-induced scream. Kyra was moving fast, but the nearness of the sound made him worry he wasn't moving fast enough. The edge of the lake was perhaps two to three miles off, and even moving at what he thought could be close to a car on a city street, there was no guarantee he'd make it that far in enough time. He began to turn his head back when he felt Talia's hand grab his jaw and force him forward. She leaned into his ear to talk with wind blowing past them. You drive. I'll handle the back view. My rear view mirror, he said, his eyes and hands forming ice as fast as he could make them. What? She said. Never mind. Talia looked back and decided what she had told him was definitely the right call. Rising above the surface were the aquatic bony moose antlers with the furious eyes of Moslinga. Rushing water and chunks of ice streamed past his scaly face. He was biting through the ice sheets and massive lurches forward. Talia could see some of his tentacles peek above and between his antlers as they partially left the water behind him to propel him forward. With each powerful lurch, he got closer and closer. Can you go faster? Talia asked. Her tone was calm. It was meant not to disturb Cairo's focus, but it only made him more agitated as he could tell what she was doing. I just got these powers! I don't know what I'm doing! His legs began moving in a skating motion in an attempt to speed them up, but his body moved faster than his legs were carrying him. Talia took note that his leg movement was more doing a show of speed rather than getting them to the shore any quicker. Talia unwrapped her arms from Cairo and tightened her legs around his waist. She leaned her torso backwards until she was facing upside down. Putting her hands together, she formed orbs of flame the size of beach balls, lobbing them at the face of her pursuer. Moss Linga closed his eyes as the orb struck his face. She had shot him four times when he had finally had enough. With a final snap and shattering of ice, he and his antlers receded underwater, leaving the ice road undisturbed. Talia hung upside down for a moment, watching. The lake was quiet behind them. She leaned up and wrapped her arms around Kyra again, who had not let up his speed. You got him? he said. Suddenly a hole in the ice burst open next to them. The reveal was a monstrous arm and the crazed eye of the creature peeking up at them before it quickly sunk down again. 
Within seconds, it happened again, but this time ahead and to the right of them. Cairo curved left quickly and kept moving. No, said Talia. I think I just gave him better ideas. Moss Linga slipped back under again. In seconds, his arm emerged right in front of them. When Cairo zigged to the right, a second arm emerged. Antlers and a star broke through the ice ahead and out rose the beast. He violently swung his arms around as he rose high enough for his tentacles to start snaking through sheets of ice themselves. Cairo slid to a stop and began sliding quickly left and right, just trying to stay out of their way. He couldn't see the shore past the wicked body of the ruler of the lake. He was stumbling and struggling to keep his balance as the ice churned and was ground up under the tenacious lumberings of the monster's appendages. Talia started to slip. He started to panic and grabbed her arms to hold her up. It was no use. She slipped from his fingers before he could get a good grip. He almost fell before he turned around. Water and ice sloshed around him, but no Talia. Talia! He yelled as loud as he could. Talia, no! The sheet he was on began to lift. Cairo turned around to the curve of a rising tentacle raising him up and out of the water. He fell forward toward the sheet of ice slanting towards him. A hand found a grip on the slippery ice with just the tips of his fingers. It was no use, though. He was in the sky now. The tentacle had thrown the ice sheet with Cairo attached. He soared through the air, his pose like a cat with its fur raised and its claws in the carpet. He was pitched high and far into the sky. Really high. Too high. Cairo turned around. There in the light of the sun was the silhouette of someone. It was too bright to see. He was getting closer to them. Someone that was... Floating? You can let go now. Julian was smiling with both his arms slightly out in front of him. So you can just fly now? Said Cairo. Julian's eyebrows jumped. Anti-gravity, baby. His tone sounded very confident, but then his face changed and he looked off to the side contemplatively. Well, you know what? Maybe not. Yeah, no, I think that's what this is. I can't just fly. This is way harder than it should be. He looked up and then looked down. You know, I can't think about it too much right now. It's kind of like that OCD thing you had when we were kids, when you could breathe fine and then you thought too much about breathing and then you had to think about breathing and then you started to panic because, where's Talia? Cairo cried as he looked down towards the water. He tossed the ice sheet to the side and then immediately regretted it as he watched it plummet to the water below. He felt nakedness and horror at how high up they were. He started waving his arms and legs, trying to grasp at something. She's right here, said Julian. Cairo turned to see Talia rise up next to Julian and look down at him. Hey, she said with a partial smile. Cairo started to stammer. I thought you were... He was... You thought I just fell off your back? I, uh... <laughs> Kyra recalled her earlier acrobatic monster fighting. Well, technically she did fall, said Julian. If I'm understanding my powers right, I'm like... the fall guy. Cairo shook his head and looked down as Julian laughed at his own joke. He was cut short by the loud sound of bursting water and a sizzle. Cairo looked back to see a cloud of steam next to a startled Julian. As they tried to figure out what had just happened, a body fell slumped from the cloud. Talia! Cairo screamed. As she dropped down from them, something was rising up. It looked like a very large and very fast approaching ball of water. Julian dropped them both down and the water ball missed them both but not without leaving them with the intense sensation of passing heat. It was boiling hot. Julian looked frantically to find Talia's falling body, but was distracted by a sudden upwards hailstorm of boiling water balls the size of doghouses. 
Julian spun Cairo and himself all around, trying to dodge one after another. Julian felt hopeless to catch Talia when amongst the spinning he caught the sight of the light of flames. There she was, tumbling down and shooting water balls out of the air as she went. She was also returning fire at the source. Moss Linga had his eyes darting towards all of them, aiming and shooting from his toothy jaws. Talia was nearly to the monster's level, still risen out of the water, when Julian caught her and her fall slowed. Reaching the level of his face, a floating Talia formed wide fire rings at her sides, extended a few feet from her outstretched hands. She spun them like blades at the monster, waving her arms and striking him across the head and chest. Moslinga began covering his face to block the heat of the strikes. That girl is, uh, durable, said Julian. Cairo and Julian floated a ways up from the fight, watching Moslinga start to let himself sink a little from the jabs. Cairo looked on, a bit slack-jawed before clearing his throat. Dude, she is... something else. You just think she's hot, said Julian. Cairo whipped his head over to look at him. She is hot! By definition, the girl is literally on fire right now. Look! A fainted battle cry rang up to them as a flaming Talia increased the size of the rings and force of her swings. Julian put his arms out and started flying her around the monster so she could hit him at different angles. You're just into her because she saved your butt and she acts like she knows everything. She saved your butt too! Like, a lot already! Yeah, but I don't have that whole dude bro and distress thing that you've got. You like a girl in shining armor. Cairo frowned. I like capable women, and I'm not ashamed of that. Yeah, like your ex, Miss Cuddly is barbed wire. Dude, Cairo said with his hand up, we are not getting into that right now. Julian laughed as he watched Moslinga flail at Talia like a fly with a flamethrower. This right here? This is better than video games. Cairo's nostrils flared as he looked down at the chaotic scene. Kate, well, don't forget that's a real girl and not an avatar. You've only got one actual life against this boss. No, I don't, said Julian. Cairo looked at him with a raised eyebrow. Julian took his eyes away from the fight for a split second to give him a smirk. I've got two. Cairo felt himself rotating horizontally like a missile being loaded for a shot. Jules? No. Come on, man. Ante up, ice boy. Cairo didn't know what it was like to be shot from a cannon. He used to think about how the inside of a human cannon couldn't have had gunpowder, right? Was it spring-loaded? Surely a human couldn't withstand that kind of speed or an explosion under their feet. But the sheer sudden velocity at which Julian had shot him made Cairo reconsider how this mechanism probably could have worked, and whether or not he should still have a relationship with his best friend if he survived this. The laughing he had heard the split second before his launch hadn't helped either. As he approached, the monster's eyes lifted from a fire-swirling Talia to an already terrified Cairo. His toothy trap of a mouth snapped open, and a heavy stream of boiling water went straight up in his direction. Cairo put his arms out. The boiling water almost immediately started to solidify. Cairo kept his hands out as he was now careening toward a solid cylinder of ice. As if it were listening to his thoughts, a hole formed down the center, turning the solid shape into a tube. Cairo tumbled into the tube and found himself sliding perilously into the monster's open throat. From outside, Talia watched as the beast gnawed at the protuberance coming from his mouth like a crazed dog. He was beginning to choke. As Cairo tumbled, displaced ice created sharp protrusions that followed him on the outside of the icy straw. Talia watched Moslinga's crazed eyes widen as the icicle prying open his jaws grew spikes that advanced closer and closer to his face. He grabbed at it with his claws, only to have them relentlessly driven through. A fleshy squelch, signaled Cairo, had reached the back of the throat.
Chapter 19, Roots. So, what do you think? Raina was rolling it around in her mouth. It was very strange. It had the consistency that she was used to, as well as the sweetness, but not the cold temperature. It really wasn't cold at all. Orion was talking with his mouth full under his dark maroon hood. It's one of my favorites now. I can get ice cream, like the real thing. It's not impossible, but this is much easier to find, and now it's part of me since I grew up here. The large woman behind the stand with dreaded green hair and pink skin finished with another customer in line and then turned to them again. Good? she asked. Raina thought she reminded her of a watermelon starburst. I don't know yet. She still won't tell me, the king said. I love the way you make it, Miss Peepo. You know yours is my favorite. The pink woman's cheeks got even more pink, if that were possible, and she bashfully waved off the compliment. Oh, stop it, you. Raina took another bite. She shook her head. Overall, I think I still miss ice cream, she said. Orion nodded. Yeah, it's hard to top the real thing. Ice cream was one of my few joys as a kid on the other side. But Tanook is made of the cream of the Gorna tree and the ground-up nut butter of the Mitu seeds. It comes together really well. Then, of course, they add different fruits and things for different flavors. He turned to Miss Peepo. And you had better never stop making your family's recipe. As he spoke, he slipped a large coin out of his loose sleeve and slid it onto the edge of her stand. Her eyes got wide as she picked it up and quickly held it to her chest. Bless you, your majesty. She had tears in her eyes. Orion put his fingers to his lips and darted his eyes over to the new customers approaching. Oh! As she turned around to tend to her patrons, Orion gave Reyna a tap on the arm to indicate they needed to take their leave. The two slipped back into the bustling crowd. It was a busy day at this town Orion had called practice. He said they were preparing to celebrate the annual Festival of Tomasi. Orion told her he often visited towns while keeping a low profile, but he particularly loved to visit before and if possible during festivals. But this time he had another reason to be there. You didn't get to ask her about the doctor, said Reyna. I know, he said. I think we could find someone more in the know about him, though. Mallard doesn't always run in the market social circles. Honestly, he really doesn't run in any social circles. Rena saw a little girl holding a small furry animal close to her chest. She was looking around frantically at the faces above her. Relief washed over her face as she reached the nearby hand of a young man in the crowd. So, you're sure you trust the people you sent to find Kai and Julian? Raina asked. Orion kept her hand as they weaved through a tightly bunched group of people. Definitely. My people are close. You'll be with them again in no time. Raina was quiet until they reached another stand. Orion greeted the neon yellow man with bright green eyes, whose face nearly lit up immediately with recognition. She looked at her feet, standing still in the bustling shuffle of the feet around her with places to go. Aren't you worried or anything? She said. Huh? Orion said, turning back to her as the man at the stand went to retrieve something. You said they got taken by someone dangerous, but you think they're still okay? Sure, little one. He knelt down and looked her in the eye from under his hood. I'm not worried in the slightest, and neither should you. Rena's face was doubtful. The neon yellow man came back and got the king's attention again. Rena was too consumed in her own concerns to hear them. Orion smiled, and Rena caught him pulling another large, shiny coin to lay on the stand in front of the man. A look of intense gratitude washed over his face, too, as he quickly slipped it from the stand and into his pocket. The king grabbed his hand and brought him in for an embrace over the table, and then headed back into the crowd with Reyna. What do you keep giving them? Reyna asked. Oh, it's a volan. It's about a week's wage for most merchants. 
Oh, Raina said. That's nice. What did he tell you? He gave me a tip, the king said. They were making their way past a group of market patrons who had formed a circle. In the center, two large blue and orange feathered birds the size of ostriches with long curved beaks danced back and forth with riders on their backs. Raina thought they were fighting at first, but then realized it looked more like play fighting. What's that? she asked. It's an old tradition for Tomasi. It's a little bit like a play that acts out part of a story. Orion gently nudged her back to keep her moving as he spoke. What's the story? she asked. It's kind of a long one, plus we're already here, the king said as he gestured to a rather solid-looking cabin just ahead of them. It had gray wood paneling and a black door with a guard posted out front. He was large but looked young with his chest puffed out. Raina thought he looked like he was taking his job very seriously. Orion waved to him as they approached and stroked his goatee. The guard's serious and furrowed brow loosened in surprise as he realized who he was. He stood at attention and smiled as he stepped aside. Orion stood in front of the door a moment. The young man nearly jumped as he started frantically grabbing for his keys. He fumbled trying to unlock the door before opening it quickly with a creak. Orion patted him on the shoulder as he headed in. Raina followed him into a dimly lit series of rooms. It looked like a really small hotel hallway with creaky wooden floors and only a few rooms. Orion went two doors down to his right and knocked. Mallard, he called. Mallard, it's me. Raina could hear rustling behind the door. It's me, came the muffled voice from the other side. The door cracked open. It's me. It's you! It was a middle-aged man with turquoise skin and a full head of black hair that sloped to the side. It's, yes, Mallard, me. The turquoise man dropped his head as he looked his cloaked figure up and down. He didn't say anything as he stared in his face for a second. Orion raised an eyebrow. Oh, right, right. He stepped aside to let the king in. Raina looked up at him as she passed, and Mallard gave her a puzzled look. The girl? Who is, uh... She's an associate, Mallard. To business. What happened? Orion said. Yes, well, uh, the touches I made to the experiments weren't enough. The thing responded, like you said. I, I didn't want to damage it irreparably, so I leaned on the side of... You're in a safe house, Mallard. Let's address that first, the king said. What happened? Raina sat on a small stool in the corner of the dimly lit room. There wasn't much inside the small quarters. There were several candles sitting on hanging shelves on the walls, the stool with a small table in the corner where Raina sat, and a bed. A few books lined the walls in stacks with some knickknacks and tools strewn about. There were no windows, which Raina thought was odd. Orion sat on the bed as Mallard looked away. He went to the door to make sure it was locked before speaking. He turned around with round eyes to the king. It wasn't safe with it. I wasn't. It just wasn't safe. Orion motioned to him. Do you at least have it with you? Mallard gave a quick sigh and went to the side of his bed. He pulled up a wide canvas bag and reached in it with both of his arms. Gently, he began wedging his hands back and forth, pulling something out. It took a moment before he produced a large spherical ball. Raina leaned forward to let her eyes adjust to the light a bit more. It was dark brown and looked like a large entangled ball of soot-mired roots. Orion stood and carefully lifted it from Mallard's hands. He peered into it like he was looking for something. It looks good, he said softly. Uh, sure, said Mallard. I refuse to risk any kind of disfigurement at all, like I said, and I was thorough. But this thing, I can't make heads or tails of it. I mean, it's a mechanism of some kind. You referred to it as a weapon? And if it is, then all I can deduce is that it's a lever for that weapon. A lever that, when pulled, makes something somewhere do something. 
but I simply don't have enough information, not enough responses to stimulus to observe before the hunting started. Hunting? The king asked. Mallard nodded. I'm being hunted, your highness. Orion's countenance fell. How do you know? Raina's ears and nose caught a sound and a scent that both distracted and disturbed her. She looked down and around on the floor until she spotted movement in the corner. She got up to get a closer look. Ants. It was a trickling of them coming through a crack in the wall. The trickling became a current as more and more started coming through. She traced the trim around the room and noticed more separate streams coming in through the bottoms of the walls. She looked to the corners and saw more. Then, along with the ants, she noticed more. A worm managed its way out of the floorboard next to Orion's foot, while the two men were still deep in conversation. A beetle started crawling its way up the leg of the small table. The creeping things were silent and odorless to most anyone else, but to Reyna... She was overwhelmed by the essence of the creature's expressions. It was fear. Excuse... She started to say to the men. Excuse me. Mallard was still talking. The sounds in the night, I thought they were just the heaving of the older foundations, but... Raina put her arm on Orion's shoulder. Excuse me, please, she said as the king turned his attention to her. There's something... They all felt the increase of a vibration under their feet. Orion looked around the room and stood up. Out. Now. Mallard stammered and looked around at his things. Raina ran to the door and undid the bolt lock. She opened the door with Orion close behind. They ran down the hallway and heard a scream from one of the other rooms to their right. As they went outside into the sunlight, Raina looked back and noticed Orion still clutching the root ball, tucking it carefully and securely under his arm. The guard was gone. No, Reyna saw he was just ahead of them. He had his weapon drawn. It was a curved blade with a straight ribbed hilt. He was out in the crowd of running and panic people, attempting to usher them in an orderly fashion. A man riding one of the large beaked colorful birds came bounding up to her. It squawked in terror and gained air as it leapt itself and its rider over her. Her gaze followed it up and over her head before it landed and melded into the crowd. As more hurried people passed, Rena saw the young guard just ahead lose his footing. He fell as he tried to turn back around in Rena's direction. His face was of horror as the ground beneath him cracked and gave way. He reached out to her and the king before he was sucked underground. No! Orion cried, running just ahead of her. He was reaching for where the guard had disappeared when a loud crack rang out behind them. They both whipped around to see the safe house they had just left beginning to lurch backwards. The back of the structure began sinking into the open ground. The face of the house was angled up like a head trying to keep its mouth above water. Reyna felt herself get whisked around by the shoulders until she was facing the king again. Take this, he said. He handed her the root sphere. His eyes were intense and pleading. Promise me you'll guard this with your life and leave the walls. I need to make sure this village isn't lost. I promise, said Reyna, eyes shimmering in fear. The king removed his cloak and turned toward the crowd. As it fell to the ground, Reyna could see on the back of his coal gray sleeveless vest was the stitched embroidery of a bull with horns on its head and horns where its nostrils should be. As Orion leapt into the air, she felt a rush of heat under his feet as his body propelled him higher. A few stopped as they caught a glimpse of him. A ripple of voices could be heard crying out amongst the panic. Orion? Was that the king? Reyna turned and started running with the root ball held in her arms before she could see where he landed. She didn't look back, although the commotion increased. Loud popping and booming could be heard with more scraping of dirt. People were screaming. The ball in her hands seemed firm and also somehow fragile. She was scared, but she didn't dare squeeze it too hard. 
She followed the path as best she could through the town as she dodged people and animals and carts being rushed around and out of the village walls. She soon found a stream of people heading out, which she blended herself into. Raina knew how to follow instructions. As much guff as she often gave her dad, she knew sometimes you had to listen. He had taught her that. She resented him sometimes for always telling her what to do, but he set the example. On set, she often saw him listening very carefully to his directors, no matter how frustrating they seemed to be. He told her, nobody is their own boss all the time, and you can't go through life pretending like you are. So as she reached the gate of the city marked practice, she decided now was a really good time to listen, even if she didn't know what was going on. She felt the ground rumble underneath her, like a current was just beneath her feet. It was so distinct that she turned around as it left her. She saw a man's donkey stomp hooves in reaction to the vibration that had just slinked under him. She noticed the cracks in the ground here, too, were oozing little creatures of the earth. She kept her pace outside the city a ways on the main road. It quivered with slinking rumbles. It wasn't like an earthquake, exactly, but it was disturbing and kept people on the road still startled and in a panic. Some leaving the city were talking about what they had seen before they left. It was massive, covered in dirt, said a young girl. Did you see him? He pounded the ground with fire, said a pointy-eared teenage boy. Our protector even still, sighed a middle-aged mother to her strikingly green-eyed child. Raina went into the forest once she had decided the main road was too crowded and too risky with whatever the danger seemed to be. She didn't know where to go as she wandered through the trees, and finally slowed down once she felt she was far enough away from the noise and commotion. There was no rumbling here in this clearing, with a large, flat brown stone surrounded by a very green, leafy carpet. She sat down to look at the object she carried. She held it up to her face and noticed it looked like it was burning. Not a full flame, but a smolder, creeping up specific thin strands. It looked like quick-burning thin kindling that she'd seen in fireplaces, but the smolders were light yellow glows coating and burning up the small roots. It wasn't the whole ball, just little parts of it. There was no heat, even as she lightly brushed her fingers against it to check. It looked almost pretty, decorated in smoldering and flickering glows that appeared and disappeared, and then reappeared elsewhere on the ball. Then she felt something strange as she gazed into it. It looked pretty, but the whole thing started to make her feel sick. She didn't know why. It was a pit in her stomach sick. Like she had done something wrong and needed to tell on herself to clear her conscience. But there was nothing to tell. It was just the feeling. It laid on her chest like a brick and sat on her stomach like a stone. After a moment, she felt her eyes start to well up with tears. What was this thing? What was happening? She was so caught up in it that she didn't notice the forest around her grow still. A tension grew in the air. Raina felt eyes on her. This feeling was secondary to the strange sadness and guilt she felt, and for a moment, the sensation felt blended in with this whole strange experience. She wouldn't have snapped out of her focus if it weren't for the sound of a loud and angry chuff. Raina looked past the tangled, flickering roots. There, at the edge of the clearing, were two large eyes glaring at her with a fury she had never seen. They were on either side of the wide head of a bull, yet its long, sharp horns on its head were matched with a second set protruding from where its nostrils should be. Instead, its actual nostrils were slits like a reptile on the front of its face, just above the bottom set of horns. They flared in anger as it chuffed again. The beast was a deep navy blue, with high raised shoulders and a beautiful dark blue mane that ran down the length of its back. 
its tail whipped in irritation. Reyna was frozen. Her mind raced for options as the beast scraped the ground with its hoof. The moment felt like a surreal nightmare. The thing was about to charge her. It was all happening so fast. Suddenly, she felt something like a mental and emotional sink with the animal. She lowered the ball of roots from her face and made a low rumble in her throat. The alien-looking bull stopped scraping the ground. Its powerful legs stood firm. Rena rumbled again. The thing's eyes began to soften. Rena stood up and put her arm out. She made a call to it that started out low, then went high briefly, then low again. The bull lost the anger in its eyes, but stayed in position. It then lifted its head and made a deep warbling vocalization. Reyna was about to back up, but then recognized the sound. She was safe. That was when she felt a warm hand on her shoulder. Get back, Reyna. It was Orion's voice. The bull lowered its head, and its eyes filled with fury again. No, no! Reyna whispered urgently. I know your power, but it's a sovereign bull. There's no reasoning with it. He yanked her back behind him. She saw his armor was seared and scraped with mud and dirt. Please, I almost had him! A guttural bellow rang out from the bull as it reared back. Leave! Now! Rena stumbled back as Orion reached his hand back to push her. She saw Orion hurl a magnificent stream of flame at the charging beast. She turned and ran into the trees. She wasn't far before she felt the unforgiving heat of the battle behind her. She ran behind a large boulder still clutching the root ball. Over the top and to the side of it, she saw the trees bend to the heat and ignite. A loud swirl of flames was tearing at the tops of the branches above her and trying to wrap itself around the boulder. She was protected, but the heat was almost unbearable. Through it all, she could hear the bellow of the Savern Bull continue unabated, in chorus with the desperate cries of the king. Finally, the heat stopped, and the flames were literally sucked from the branches above her, leaving them burnt, but not smoldering. She heard the bellow continue, and the king's cries were getting more and more reduced. He was in agony. Slowly, he became silent, and the bellow of the bull became grunts mixed with heavy stomps to the ground. It wasn't long before she heard the gallop of the creature receding into the woods beyond. Reyna stepped out from behind the boulder and made her way back to where she had left the king. On the other side of the now burnt and charred clearing was a mangled and gored Orion. Reyna screamed and ran to him. She dropped to her knees over his punctured and broken chest. No! No! Orion, no! Through bloody teeth, he tried to comfort her. Shh, shh, he said. Get, get, I'm going to be fine. His breath was labored and wheezing. Reyna's tears wet his face. What do I do? Is, is there something? Listen, listen, he said in a hushed tone. The weapon you have? The ball. Reyna looked down at the thing tucked under her arm as he spoke. It's important, Reyna. It's critical to... He grunted as he tried to shift his weight. My people, they need you to find out what it is. To protect them. I need you to protect them. No, Orion, I don't know what to do. You can't die. Don't die. She cried. Orion winced as he released a weak chuckle. No one is going to die, little one, he said. Thankfully, there are more secrets here than you know. Chapter 20 The Tafferties
The icicle rotated and grew thicker before it split into four identical pieces. Then, like a kaleidoscope, the four rotated, creating a spinning circle that defied the laws attempting to pull it to the forest floor. Cairo had his hands out trying to mimic the movements he was creating. It was easier somehow to help his mind visualize the motions before they were rendered. Julian floated down behind him with a bounce in his step as his feet hit the ground. Whoa, bro, he said as he spotted the floating ice design. Right? said Cairo. I'm like Iceman now. Well, I mean, you're more like Frozone. Cairo turned to look back at him. Dude, why are you like this? What? Is that racist again? Yes. Cairo looked back at what he was doing. Huh. Julian put his hands on his hips as he continued to look at the spinning shard. So it just comes out of the air? At least partially, I think so. The more humid, the better, I think. When you were flying us here, the air seemed thinner. And not just for breathing, but something about the moisture? I was way more aware of it. Julian stood next to him as he watched Cairo create a second set of icicles and floated into the first, creating a sphere. I bet you never thought your straight A's in science were preparing you for this. Cairo smiled. <laughs> and I bet you regret sneaking the copy off me instead of learning about gravity. Julian scoffed. You were very good at making sure I never got away with that. Cairo laughed and shook his head. I'm serious, man, said Julian. We were little, and you were a tiny little goody two-shoes. Wouldn't let me copy off your work to find out what two plus three was. Because you needed to learn it yourself, Cairo said. Yeah, and I hated you. You finished your test early and brought it to the teacher, and I was still slumped over trying to figure it out. They both laughed. Cairo combined the rotating icicles into one large one and started separating it into tiny ice cubes. He rotated the ice cubes, creating a shifting abstract sculpture. And I would have kept hating you if you hadn't done what you did next. You remember? Cairo laughed to himself. Julian had a funny habit of telling the same stories over and over again. It was an old man trait in a young man's body. This one was one of Julian's favorites. It obviously meant a lot to him, so we let him continue. What happened? He asked. Julian smirked. You leaned over to my desk when the teacher wasn't looking, and I just knew you were going to give in and give me the answers. But you still didn't. You remember what you did? Cairo started slowly forming the floating ice cubes into a shape like a rudimentary cloud with an animal head on it. I made you count the sheep. You made me count the sheep, Julian said, throwing his arms up. There were five sheep next to the problem that I could have counted the whole time, and you made me count them to put two and three together. Cairo kept silently laughing. He always told the story with the same pun. After my grades went up, my mom never wanted me to stay over anyone else's house but yours. I'm sorry, man, Cairo said, dropping the cubes from their sheep shape and stacking them on the ground like a Jenga tower. I'm not, said Julian, because even though you were a goody good, you weren't a snob about it. That's why you were cool enough to hang out with me. Cairo nodded sarcastically. Thanks, bruh. Yep, don't mention it. He said, shaking him by the shoulder. I really won't, Cairo said as a snowball formed in his hand. Cairo turned to him and Julian returned a smile with his tongue between his teeth. He was greeted with a face full of powder. That's ridiculous, Julian said. Year-round snowball fights? Cairo dropped his cubes and the small pillar fell as he started lobbing more snowballs at him. Julian backed up and put his hand out. The snowball stopped its acceleration and shot back towards Cairo. This time it was him with a face full of snow. No. No way. He said in disbelief. Hey man, you can move ice. I can move that and everything else too. Nah man, I'm not losing a snowball fight with ice powers. 
Kyra started a hail of white shots at him over and over as he chased him through the trees. Julian kept trying to catch each one and reverse their momentum with gravity. Kyra made a ball so large he could barely palm it and launched it at his friend. Julian ducked and it struck Talia in the face. Julian stumbled upright and Cairo covered his mouth. The snow quickly dissolved into a steam on Talia's cheeks. She raised her eyebrows. Thanks for that. Talia, I am so sorry. I found them. It's this way. She started heading down a thin trail. The boys followed quickly behind. Shortly, they found themselves in a small camp comprised of a tent and several makeshift stations for washing and cooking. Next to the campfire sat a young man. He was on a log seat, leaning over with something in his hands. He hardly noticed them come out of the trees. Corliss? Talia said. The young man looked up. He was pale-skinned with ears that looked a bit more narrow and sharp than Cairo and Julian were used to seeing. His eyes were glistening in the light of the fire. He sniffed. Talia? Corliss had not spoke. It was the voice of a woman. The three looked up to see someone in a functional yet fine black dress emerge from the tent. The woman looked to be in her forties. Her skin was also pale, but she had sharper pointed ears. Her face broke up and tears soaked her blue freckles as she saw Talia and ran to her. Talia rushed to meet her and embraced her tightly. I'm so sorry, Lena. The woman sobbed onto her shoulders as Julian and Cairo approached, but stopped just short of the fire. The young man looked up at them. Cairo nodded and gave a soft and sympathetic smile. Julian gave a quick, awkward nod. The young man just gazed at them a moment before looking back into the flames. The sobs of the woman filled the air. If he's... I know he can't be. I can't imagine what he must have felt, what he was thinking when... Talia held her close again, and she released her muffled cries into her shirt. The boys continued to stare at the young man, unsure of what to say or do. The cries quieted down, and Talia stepped over the log to sit next to him. The young man she had called Corliss was turning something white over and over in his hands. Talia rubbed his back. Hey, big guy, she said softly. Corliss continued to look at the figure. Cairo glanced up briefly to the woman in the black dress who had her hand over her mouth, staring at Corliss. Her tears were still quietly coming. It's okay to cry, Talia said. You need to. This is what they're for. Corliss looked at her. His expression was blank. Then slowly, his face broke up the longer he looked into her eyes. She held him as he leaned into her and wept profusely. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, Talia whispered. No, Corliss said with a sniff. You can't be everywhere. He leaned up and his expression quickly changed. He looked with intensity again into the fire like he was keeping it lit with his stare alone. It was him. It was always going to be him, he said. Talia leaned over and reached for his hands. She brought them to her lap and opened them to reveal a white wooden figure, expertly carved with fur detail and a ferocious snarl across his face. I found it near the burnt-up wagon, he said. The box, it was burned on top, too, but the inside was okay. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a folded-up piece of paper. He handed it to Talia, who unfolded it and started to read. We had fought last time we talked, said Corliss. It was over something stupid. He wiped his face with his shirt sleeve. It's so much like him to get me something like this to make things better. He carefully took the figure from her and started to turn it over again, but thoughtfully this time as he was inspecting it. When I was little, my favorite bedtime story was about the Battle of Moonlight. 
Only Dad would call him the Great White Wolf instead of a shadow dog. Moonlight was always the hero. He made up some story about him being the most special shadow pup in the litter and how he grew up to meet his final challenge against Orion. All the other kids in all the other towns knew the story and its ending. For them, it was about victory. But since my hero was Moonlight, it always had a sad ending. One where the wolf couldn't finish the job. Talia had rested her hand with the note in her lap. Corliss took it from her and put it back in his pocket. An ending where my family had to live in fear. Kyra could see Corliss' knuckles turning white as he squeezed the body of the white figurine. He doesn't deserve the air he breathes, he said, looking to Talia again. You make sure he pays for what he did. You know I can only fly half as fast as my father, and it's no use against him. If you ever find a way, like you said you would, if you find a way, you burn his lungs from his chest. You hear me? Talia solemnly nodded. Corliss pointed to himself. You do it for me. You do it for Mom. You do it for my dad and everyone else he's taken away. I will, she said. Corliss stared at her before nodding. Good. He looked down at the figure. Maybe then I can tell my kids bedtime stories about you. Ones where they don't go to sleep afraid. They were all quiet again for a while before Corliss returned to weeping. Talia rubbed the back of his hair before pulling him close. Kyra realized he hadn't seen this side of Talia yet. Corliss couldn't be more than 14 or 15. It seemed to be the kind of affection you give to a little brother. She had seemed so hard on the outside. It started to make more sense. He could see the person that was helping them. After Moslinga crashed beneath the lake's surface from his injuries, Talia had insisted Julian fly them to this side of the lake before continuing their journey to the palace. She said she didn't know the exact spot and opted to go on foot so she could track her destination the rest of the way. It was all just to find these two. Following the tears, Talia let the family know she had better and more hidden accommodations for them not far from their location another safe house courtesy of Harbor and Harper. Julian assisted in floating some of the family's things once they were packed up. Lena and Corliss were clearly accustomed to moving around quickly and frequently due to the speed at which they were able to break down and store their camp, though Corliss remarked how much easier these things used to be to transport on his father's cart. The boys got to know the Tafferties on the way. Lena had met her husband after he had established himself as a renowned merchant. He had awakened in her the itch to travel and see the land after she had heard the stories he would tell the locals whenever he would visit. He was always good at holding a crowd. She got to know this merchant and storyteller on a personal level and was always excited when his route would bring him back to her village. She had fallen for him long before she knew it herself. It was her parents who basically pushed her out of the house to marry him, knowing their daughter was never happier than when he came around. Micah left a good impression. He was a crowd pleaser, but not arrogant. A salesman, but no swindler. His integrity was clear, and they knew wherever he traveled they would often see their daughter again. She didn't know he was human until after she finally admitted how she felt, it was only then that he let her in. He had jumped at the opportunity to be with her when she finally told him. When he had told her his secret, it was clear why he hadn't made the first move. He hadn't wanted to volunteer for a life on the run. Micah's philosophy was to hide in plain sight. No Vin Carsey would make himself so known to the world the way he did. Even still, if they married, it was on the condition that no one besides her parents ever knew he had a family, not even after they had a son. It had worked for many years. Micah had been smart. 
He saw the danger before it was clear to most of the Vincarsi population. He worked hard to maintain his secret. The cover story for Lena and Corliss was that they were separate vendors who sold clothing dye, a reasonably substantial part of the family's inventory. They came into towns early to sell, and then Micah would follow shortly after. They also left at staggered times, too. Usually no one noticed, but if they were ever seen together, usually in travel, the cover was that Lena and Corliss were his sister and nephew. Corliss had grown up understanding the importance of staying hidden. It was just at the cost of not having close friendships with kids his age. The safe house looked essentially the same as the one Cairo and Julian had abandoned, save for a few minor differences. When they arrived, Julian carefully floated the family's things inside. Afterwards, they enjoyed some of the food in the safe house's stores along with the thank you meal prepared by Lena. Cairo enjoyed hearing the stories from the Tafferty's, but Julian seemed to be growing more and more uneasy as the sun started to go down. Even Talia noticed. She insisted they not put the family out as they only had two beds and they needed to get settled in their new home. Tolly went into the safe house closet and collected some very sturdy tree hammocks. Harper always kept them stowed away in the same spot in every house. Tolly had promised she would bring them back in the morning. After saying their goodbyes and lighting the family's torches for the night, Talia led the three of them into the forest a ways until she found a very tall and wide tree with thick and strong-looking branches. Julian floated them up into its canopy at Talia's request. She went to work showing them the safest and most comfortable spots to suspend themselves and how to safely secure their hammocks. Kairos ended up lower in the canopy, right next to Julian on his right. Talia was to his left, but a bit farther away and just above him. She had picked a spot where it was easy to walk and climb between each hammock just in case. Their sacks were hanging near each of their sleeping spots. After they had all settled, Cairo found himself staring down at the ground below. He could see the scattered glow of the spinning ribbon creatures on the forest floor. There were several large tree limbs below him, but it was still a daunting prospect to fall. What do you think? We're like 20 to 25 feet up? He whispered to Julian. Probably, he said, looking up through the branches above him. I probably shouldn't be looking. She said not to look. Can't look down too much in a hammock. I'm going to flip out of this thing. Mm Mm-hmm, he said. Cairo leaned up and looked over at him. What, you aren't afraid of heights now? Just because you're a gravity master? Something like that, Julian said, still looking up. Cairo scoffed. All right, what's up, man? You got superpowers yesterday and you're crazy bummed out all of a sudden. Julian turned over and looked at his friend. Isn't it super weird, he whispered, that we spent a whole day moving some random family? Cairo frowned. Um, I mean, kinda, I guess. Shouldn't we be on our way to get Reyna? She's wasting our time. I can fly us there now. She just has to tell us where to go. She made us come here and do superhero U-Haul. Cairo's eyebrows lowered. Dude, that's pretty messed up. Corliss just lost his dad. You didn't even know Corliss until half a day ago. Or are we helping him instead of your cousin? Cairo frowned again and didn't say anything. Just keep an eye on her, man. Julian whispered. I know you're into her, but we don't know what her deal is. Cairo scoffed before shooting a look in the direction of Talia to see if she heard. She was busy fiddling with something on her hammock in the dark. He looked back at Julian. I am not. I mean, I'm... Bro, you know I know every girl you're into, you're into her. Julian started to adjust to lay on his side. Just don't let it blind you. He said as he turned over and away from him. Cairo sat looking at the back of his friend's head. He thought about his words. He had grown accustomed to the dark being lit only by the moon and the stars, so when he saw a yellow light begin to glow over his shoulder, he was startled. He turned around to see Talia with a flickering flame floating just above her between her face and her hands, which were actively working on something. Cairo squinted. 
What is that? He asked. Talia stopped and looked over at him. She raised her eyebrows and then lifted it for him to see. It was a face mask. It was hard to make out its colors in the dark, but it looked to reflect the colors of the flame that lit it. It was shaped like the face of a cat, and along with the color of flames, it also had the artistic flourish of fire. Cairo couldn't be sure, but it looked like it also had spots. You going to a fancy ball or something? Cairo said. It came out as a joke, but then he realized he didn't know anything about this place. Perhaps they actually did have masquerade balls. No, Talia said with a smile as she went back to messing with it. It's my night dweller mask. The strap on it is giving me some trouble again. Cairo raised his eyebrow. Night dweller? Talia nodded, still focused on the strap. They were old heroes, people who risked their lives in the night to take care of travelers on the roads before the torches in the walls of the cities went up. She shrugged. They were warriors during certain conflicts, too, but I lean more toward the life-saving variety. Hmm, said Cairo. So you're saying you protect people at night? Yeah, if I see them, she said. There are certain spots I patrol some nights, long stretches between towns where travelers sometimes get lost or stuck. I just make sure they don't get overtaken in the dark. Wow said Cairo. You're actually playing superhero. Playing what? She asked. A superhero, like a... Cairo could see she was focused and stuck trying to thread something that was particularly stubborn. Do, uh... So did night dwellers wear masks? Talia smiled and gave a small chuckle. No, no, that's just me. I caused too much trouble to show my face. If I'm saving people, I don't want them to be able to point me out at the markets. It gets to be pretty obvious you're a Vincarsi when you start fighting off shadow dogs in the dark. Cairo nodded. So, why a cat? Talia put the mask down and gave him a curious look. Why do you want to know all this? Cairo shrugged. I mean, how could I not? You're incredibly interesting. Talia gave him a soft smile, embedded in steadily reddening cheeks. I'm really not. Cairo looked skeptical. How can you say that? You're a fire-powered travel guide night watcher, or whatever. It doesn't get more interesting than that. Talia shook her head. Things here have me beat. This world is full of far more interesting things to explore. Cairo leaned his head to the side. Well, right now, I'm exploring you. Talia looked at him a moment, her soft smile still on her face before turning back to work on the mask. It's from an old story my mother used to tell me. A true story from our history. It's about a knight and a maiden far away. There was a flaming fire cat that was burning the maiden's village. The knight came to stop it. Oh, said Cairo. How does it go? Talia shook her head as she seemed to finish her work on the mask. She leaned forward and started to open up the cloth bag she had hanging on a branch at the end of her hammock. My mom always told it better, and we need to sleep tonight if we want to travel tomorrow. She slipped it in and laid back down. But suffice it to say, I relate to the cat. I'm burning this place down, and I'm not letting anyone stop me. The hovering flame above her bed went out with a sweep of her hand. Good night, Cairo, she said before turning over and settling. Cairo had trouble sleeping that night, and it wasn't just the scurrying of what he knew must have been several very hungry shadow dogs on the ground below him. He was adding up a few things in his head. Julian had told him not to be blind. He was trying to keep his eyes and his ears open when it came to Talia, and he couldn't get one of the last things she had said out of his mind. Why did she call it our history? And why was a mother from Earth telling her daughter stories from Dezu?
Chapter 21 Caddock Raina was cold. She was looking up at the quickly hardening mucus suspension that was holding the steadily forming cocoon. The colorfully bulbous and human-sized larva was wrapping itself very carefully and deliberately around its prospective meal. Raina had interacted with it when she had reached this dark stone-walled room that Caddock had called the Kodamoth Clinic. It was a coda pillar, and he was actually very nice to talk to. Caddock said it was perfectly safe. More than safe, really. He said that in the wild, a caterpillar will find injured animals and cocoon itself with them. Once inside, they secrete a thick liquid substance that has healing properties. As far as Caddock knew, the caterpillar ate a kind of foam that was left over from secretions and the healing injuries. It repeated this process until the creature it cocooned is healed. Afterwards, it releases it, sometimes healthier than before. Reyna wasn't overly squeamish, but even she thought eating healing foam sounded pretty gross. But as she looked up at a passed-out Orion secured to a suspended bed and being slowly wrapped up by the friendly, pulsating grub, she felt a sense of relief. After he was gored, Orion had instructed her to pull the purple crystal out of his coat pocket. She placed it in his hand, and despite his failing strength, he managed to light it. They ended up shuffling through sanctuary after sanctuary on their way back to the castle. Reyna encountered several panicked faces of guards as they caught a glimpse of the injured king on the sanctuary floor before he disappeared again. Once they reached the palace sanctuary, the king's men came running in and carried him away on a stretcher. Reyna followed closely and could see Orion fading in and out of consciousness as he lost blood. Before he passed out one final time, Orion managed to look in her direction and mouth the words, It will be okay, before succumbing to his trauma. Caddock put his arm on Raina's shoulder. She looked away from the caterpillar's work to look up at his violet-hued face. Let's go, he said. He wouldn't want you to have to watch him like this. It's going to take some time anyway. Raina looked at him once more before she went to a table at the corner of the wall and picked up the root ball she'd been given. It looked like it didn't have any glowing embers on it anymore. How long? she asked. It should be a few days, Caddock said with a nod, judging by his injuries. He started leading her to the door. A sovereign bull is not a creature to fool with. For anyone. Not him. Maybe especially not him. He said. I couldn't see everything, but it didn't seem like his fire did anything. She said. Caddock nodded as he opened the door for her. It is not a beast that can be phased by fire. But more than that, it holds a special place in Orion's life. Raina looked up at him questioningly as he walked down the hall. It was when he first got here, he said. He's recounted the story to me many times. He came into this world scared and alone. He thought he had died. He said it was just a bright light and then trees, and just ahead was the face of a savern. Oh my gosh, Raina said under her breath. How old was he? Just a boy, seven years old, and small, skinny, too skinny for his age. What did he do? Caddock shook his head. Nothing. There was nothing to do. The bull just stared at him. No anger, no sign of friendliness, just stared. Raina frowned as she considered her own interaction with the bull. There was definitely anger at least at first. The stories felt very similar, though. Orion always said he felt like the beast was judging him, looking deep into his heart, like it could read it, like it knew. Knew what? She said. Everything. 
who he was, where he came from, where he was going, like the bull was giving him a chance, a chance at a new life. But the gaze was also a warning, a warning to do good with what had been given. That's a lot, Raina said. No offense to him, but I don't think it knows about all that. I got some weird senses from him, but nothing like that. Yeah, Kadok said. The Sabrin Bull is powerful and mysterious in many ways. But after knowing Orion for as long as I have, I think there's a lot he believes about the world that comes from the inside out, not from the outside in. Kadok frowned. I'm very sorry that you had to go through all that today. Rena looked down at the root ball. He saved me and then gave me this. He said to take care of it with my life. Kadok looked at the ball too as they headed up a set of stairs and into a corridor. That's a lot of pressure for a young girl, he said. Raina continued to look down at her strange assignment in silence. You know, Kadok said, it's dinner time and my family is hosting a fine and brave young girl this evening. Raina looked up again. You wouldn't disregard my invitation if I offered, now would you? Raina shook her head with a sad smile. It had been a frightful day in a strange land, and she still didn't know when she was going to see Cairo again. But on the way through the halls, Prince found her and scrambled up her pant leg to her shoulder. He squeaked something about how hungry he'd been all day before affectionately nosing her cheek. Also, there is something comforting about the sights, sounds, and smells of Kadok's living quarters. It was a home within the palace, almost like a medieval-looking apartment that was attached to the north side of the castle. Kadok's two twin sons were roughhousing in the living room while his pearlescent-skinned wife prepared something spicy and deeply fragrant in the kitchen. He came up behind her and kissed her on the cheek before making the boys calm down and stand at attention for their new guest. Kadok introduced his wife as Geneva and his twins as Moffat and Polo. They didn't seem to know what to make of Raina at first. But once the boys caught sight of Prince and how he was completely devoted to her, they were enamored. Geneva's food was incredible. She didn't know the meat that was in it, but it seemed like a type of beef in a milky red broth with spices. It had a puffy, thick grain as its starch base, and it was impossibly tasty. Judging by that look on your face, my dinner did you some good, Geneva said. Rena smiled with her mouth full and then swallowed. She extended her little belly full of food the best she could and spoke in her best deep voice, imitating a pseudo-European accent. You want to eat a lot? Go to Geneva's, she said with a smack of her midsection. Kadok laughed. <laughs> what is that? Rena shook her head. It's a thing my dad says, or I guess we say it. It's our joke. Except the place was called Camille's. We asked a guy at a gas station on a road trip together where a good place to eat was, and that's what he said, with the belly slap and everything. He's an actor, and he got a kick out of it, and we do it whenever something is delicious. She looked at Geneva. It's a weird compliment. I'm sorry. It was very good. Geneva laughed. It's the first time I've gotten that one after I made something. Since it's special to you, then it's special to me. Thank you. Raina gave a stilted, toothy grin. Did you say an actor? Said Kadok. Yeah, said Raina. He's pretty famous, too, so he likes to go on road trips and stop in small towns with me so we can feel more normal. He says it's not good for me to not be like other kids, so he tries to do things to help me see what it's like. Hmm said Kadok. You seem very close to him. Yeah, she said. He's my best friend, but he also is kind of controlling. He treats me like a kid. I mean, of course, I am a kid, but I'm not like other kids. I'm smarter than most kids my age, but my dad acts like I don't know anything. 
Kadok nodded his head thoughtfully. Geneva stood up and started clearing everyone's dishes, including the messy, unattended plate of the twins. The boys had left for their room to play with Prince. Reyna had first assured the rat that the boys were friendly. Unbeknownst to them, she had also convinced them that they had food in order to seal his cooperation. This appeared to leave them in awe when they saw how eagerly the rodent followed them into the other room. It sounds like you've led a very different life than most children. Certainly than me. I didn't do much traveling growing up. You mean you didn't do much traveling until Orion became prince? Geneva said. Kadok conceded. That's true. I did a lot of traveling then. Huh? Said Reyna. Oh, nothing. <laughs> Kadok said. I've just served in this palace my whole life. Not much traveling here unless I was sent out. Orion changed that, though. Rena's eyebrows came together in pondering. Wasn't Orion a servant, too? Yes, Kadok said. We served together for many years. We grew up together. Then he became the prince, and life changed a lot for me. For the whole kingdom, really. So you were there for the whole white wolf thing? She said. White shadow dog, he said. Wolf is a word for the human world. A species over there that stays smaller and run in packs. But yes, I knew him then. He changed the way things were with Vincarsi after that day. Slowly but surely. And now you rarely see them. <sighs> Orion told me what a Vincarsi was. It's what they call humans here, right? Because we have powers? Yes and no, he said. It's a term with broader meaning than that. Vincarsi can be human, but they can also be half-human, or have human in their bloodline. There's a much more rare type who are born with powers. Harper explained that it had something to do with the latent human genetics and the greater Nam bloodline, or something like that. Who's Harper? Raina asked. Kadok sighed and leaned back in his chair. He's an old friend, a human one. Very, very intelligent. So much knowledge he gifted to this kingdom. Can I meet him? It would be nice to meet someone else from Earth. All I know is Orion. Kadok leaned his head from side to side. He's not exactly easy to get a hold of. He's supposed to have gone home like the rest of the people from Earth. Like you're supposed to once you find your kin and his friend. But Harper doesn't seem to be interested in leaving. Why not? Raina asked. He's not very trusting of Orion. He thinks he hates humans. Thinks Orion is trying to do them harm. Humans? said Raina. Why? He likes me. We hang out all the time. He just saved me and almost died. Kadok shook his head. I know. It makes you wonder. How can he be so brilliant and believe such a thing? Geneva spoke from washing the dishes in the sink. All the humans in Dezu believe it. It's true, Kadok said. After Orion discovered a way to send the humans back, Harper just vanished. He'd given us so much. He helped improve the plumbing systems throughout the palace and in parts all through the kingdom. He brought us countless new victories in the sciences. And of course, that's what a lot of humans have done throughout our history. But he was this generation's savant. I couldn't believe when he, of all people, took sides against the king. He was the one who helped them develop the technology to send them back. He created the conveyance stone, the purple one that the king uses to hop from portal to portal. Wow, he sounds great. And also crazy? Rena paused and frowned. So why hasn't Orion gone home? He can send everyone else back. Why can't he go home, too? He's the king, Geneva said with a chuckle over a plate she was scrubbing. Right, said Kadok. But he also feels an obligation. He wants to protect the people like he promised Erasmus he would do, and he can't do that if he goes home. Humans have caused a lot of strife in the kingdom over the years. Immediate power like that can really change people. He feels it's better if they go home rather than stay. 
That's why all the crossover sanctuaries are over every portal from Earth to here. He even had a plan to teach us all how to send humans home when he's gone. He's told me many times that he hopes to be the last human to stay in Dezu. Certainly the last to rule. Prince ran squeaking into the room. The twins followed like a tornado into the kitchen, falling over each other and calling out to him. Prince ran up Reyna's leg under the table until he got to her shoulder. What did you boys do to that poor thing? Geneva said, turning from the sink. It's okay, Reyna said, stroking the back of her agitated shoulder passenger. I need to get him food before he figures out that I lied to him. I left some in my room, and I'd better get to sleep anyway. I have to figure out that ball thing in the morning. Kadok smiled and nodded as he got up to retrieve the root ball from the living room. He handed it to her after she shook Geneva's hand and thanked her again for dinner. Rena said her goodbyes to the boys. Don't be overly concerned about tomorrow, Kadok said as he was heading out the door. The king will get better, and until then you and I will work on solving that little puzzle he gave you. Reyna lifted the root ball to her face and closed one eye to look inside it. On Earth, puzzles do not look like this. Kadok chuckled. They don't usually in Dezu, either. Just come find me when you wake up. I'll be tending to things, as always. Ask any of the servants if you can't find me. I am their boss, after all. Reyna thanked him and walked out of the open door. She looked around and saw a couple servants finishing up their nightly duties. Prince scurried down her arm and found a hole in the floor near a corner wall before the hallway. The walls were stone, but the floor here was wood paneling. Floors like this were often where you could find entrances and exits to the hidden pathways through the castle that no one except the rats seemed to know about. Misshapen and seemingly coincidental holes formed from indentations in the wood were usually code for someone in the know that they could put their finger in and lift to reveal a trap door. Usually she would have followed Prince, but as she still wasn't sure how taboo her little secret was, she didn't want to reveal to the servants her classified pathways. She made a high-pitched chirp to him. Prince stopped circling the spot on the floor and looked at her, he protested a bit, and she ignored him and began walking down the hall. Prince considered going into the hole, but he often scurried alone in the walls and tended to enjoy Reyna's company more. Before he could decide, his little nose caught a strange scent. A black root seeped out of the hole. It was followed by several more, growing and moving in strange convulsions as they protruded from the floor, overtaking the small opening. As they snaked outside of it and lapped at the edges to find tiny holds in the wooden slats, Prince took off in Reyna's direction. He decided that his decision to follow her had been made for him. Chapter 22 The Fuja The four legged reptilian creature was about the size of a small dog. He climbed up a rough stone with his claws extended into the crevices and then stopped. He looked around. He had heard a sound, an odd one, but he saw nothing. He was about to continue his travel when a burst of heat cut through the forest air. The lizard fell to the ground. It was in two pieces now. The head lay on one side of a tree root and its body lay on the other. Talia appeared in a moment to lift its body out of the brush. She looked at the severed neck. It was a pretty perfect cut. She didn't know what she was calling it. The move had transformed over time. She could now concentrate the heat in such a way that it was like a blade through the air. A fire slice? A fire razor? A flame arrow? No, because it wasn't an arrow. It took a lot of practice and concentration to get the fire and heat condensed like that, and it was another challenge entirely to keep it intact as it shot through the air. 
at least enough to cut through things and not just burn them. She was getting better at it. She had told Cairo and Julian yesterday that the meat they had had after their fight with Masalinka was from a lizard called a kernan. She had flame-broiled it with spices and gave it to them on a stick. Julian was disgusted by the very notion, but ate it anyway. She could tell he liked it, but was pretending not to. Cairo, on the other hand, had sung her praises. He was open-minded. She liked that. And the way he looked at her after tasting her cooking had produced in her a flutter that she hadn't expected. She figured it'd be a good breakfast, and a hot meal contrasted from the dry foods in their packs and in the safe house stores that Harper provided. She didn't want to put Lena and Corliss out, even though she knew Lena would have happily fed them. She had gotten up early to have the three of them be on their way with something warm in their belly shortly after the two woke up. She hadn't gone too far out from the tree and had waited until the sun had broke through the darkness enough to scare most of the shadow dogs away. She collected her spoils by the tail and went around the boulder and beyond a few trees where she had left her hunting supplies. She strapped the fresh kernin up to bleed out, placing it high enough that the average opportunistic predator couldn't get to it. Afterwards, she set off back into the trees. She thought she had seen a smattering of leafy foliage nearby that looked like leeks. As she turned a corner, she saw a sight that stopped her in her tracks. In the light of daybreak, she saw the turquoise wisps of the creature wafting about in the morning air. It hadn't seen her yet. Its face was down in a patch of grass, pulling and yanking up its own morning meal with her teeth. Her tall, muscular haunches and hooved legs were smoking in steady clouds of the colorful mist that matched the shade of her thin, shiny coat. It was a bispin. Her mother had talked a lot about these. She always said it was her favorite Dazuian animal. The bispin, she had said, cares for no rider. They are the steed most sought after and the rarest to be ridden. That's because the Bispin knows what it means to be free. Tully was frozen as she stared at it. Its mane of turquoise smoke was still puffing peacefully from the back of its neck. It hadn't noticed her yet. Which was a good thing for two reasons. First, she knew Bispin were omnivorous, and were not above eating a person or anything else it could manage. It certainly had the teeth to manage it. But secondly, a bispin on its own was hard to find, but a bispin with a saddle on its back? That could only mean one thing, and it was not good for any of them. She slipped silently behind the tree she had just walked out from. She leaned her back against the trunk and breathed as silently as she could. The bispin lifted her head. She looked around with her slightly iridescent white eyes. The trot of its investigation made it to Talia's ears. Talia looked up and jumped towards the low-hanging branch above her head. The rattling leaves as she pulled herself up was too much. The bispin turned the corner and looked up the trunk at the young woman clinging with her arms and legs wrapped around the branch above. The creature bared its glowing white teeth in a snarl that Talia found disturbing in its strange silence. To her surprise, the elegant and suddenly fearsome-looking creature turned from her and trotted away, leaving its colorful mist behind. Talia cursed herself, feeling like a fool. Whenever climbing trees didn't work as a strategy, she often felt like a little girl simply climbing trees. But this is what she had been taught for her survival, and it did usually work, but not this time. Not with the cleverness of a bispin. The thing had seen her and run with a saddle on its back. This wasn't the move of an animal operating purely on instinct. This was an animal trained. And whoever trained it, Tolly was sure it had gone to them just now to consult. She dropped from the tree and quickly began to run. The crack of splintering wood rang out through the forest. Talia burst through the trees just in time to see the tree the three of them had slept in overnight slowly begin to tilt and fall. Then it stopped. 
She saw the hammocks of Cairo and Julian rock to the side as they moved to match gravity in the sideways tree. A massive furry hand was wrapped around the tree trunk. He held it like he was in the middle of dipping a woman in a dance. She knew him immediately. His horned head turned in her direction with his blazing yellow eyes and a blank and deliberate stare. His wide and freshly swung battle axe held in repose at his side. It was Di. The king neglected to include you in the details, Huntress. He said in his smooth and bass-filled voice. I regret that. The weight in Julian's hammock was revealed to be gone in an instant as she saw a flash of a figure fly up above the trees. Dai's big yellow eyes glanced upwards at the movement just as Cairo tumbled out of his hammock. He clumsily fell onto a sheet of ice he formed haphazardly to break his fall with a slide. When the slick ice sheet stopped in the dirt in an incline, Cairo's feet stumbled and he tripped over himself onto the ground. He was a pitiful sight laying in the dirt near Dai's feet. Dai looked down at him a moment. Kyra pushed himself up, clearly with the wind knocked out of him, and struggled to stand. He looked back quickly at the sight of the general and then hobbled over in Talia's direction. Dai released the tree. Wood cracked as the severed pieces of the trunk scraped against each other and the branches broke apart as they hit the ground. Kyra made it to Talia just as the tree settled in its fall, Dai's eyes were on them both. What is this now? Cairo said to Talia. Talia kept her eyes locked to the glowing yellow bulbs in Dai's face. I need you to run into the trees again. Got it, yeah. Cairo said, turning from her. He ran forward, forming a sheet ahead of him as he went and stepped onto it. Fire lit up the ground in front of him and he quickly stepped back as the flames lapped up the sheet he had started. The flames went out. He turned around to look at Talia. Stop. She said quietly. Cairo looked at her confused for a moment. He looked back at the thirty-foot fur-covered warrior. His face looked resigned. Not like he was happy at what she had done, but it was clear the two had an understanding. Kyra didn't know how to feel about it. Talia turned to see a ten-foot Fuja emerging from the trees west of where the tree they had slept in formerly stood. It was exactly the direction she had hoped he wouldn't have come from. The hilts of his blades peeked over his shoulder. He smiled at her. Night Huntress, protector of the Nam, he said but lesser known as the protector of hidden Vincarsi. He leaned his head back in the direction he'd come from. We found some friends of yours. Talia's expression was like poison. Kosh, I swear on my mother's life, you will- Hey, hey. He put his arms up in defense. Far be it from me to challenge the mighty night warrior. He reached behind him and whipped the blades from his back. They were curved and wide, clearly made for brutal hacking. Unless she asked, he said with a sinister smile. Dai turned to him and boomed like his voice was in a cavern. Brother, I won't tolerate this again. You will put your weapons down. The girl has surrendered. Talia lit her arms on fire. Not if you or your men have done anything to Corliss and Lena. Kasha's eyebrows went up. So that's their names. Thank you. That's two more bounties to add. Talia's nostrils flared. All bets will be off. Then a new wager, Kosh roared, that your blood will be shed before mine. Fire doesn't shed blood, little prince. It burns it. I am a warrior, the next general. I'm no- You will be the next nothing if you don't put your weapons down. Dai roared. Kosh looked to him with jagged, gritted teeth. He placed the blades back on his back. He spoke Fujinai. Brother, you are blind. Why would we submit to the wishes of a Vincarsi? We have four bounties here, five if we take her. 
the Huntress stays. Di said. And if you live long enough not to be the fool you are now, someday you'll know that today I saved you from fiery death. Kosh snarled and folded his arms, like a ten-foot warrior child. Dai turned to Talia with a solemn expression, briefly before looking to the sky. With his height, his gaze could reach above the treetops at an angle. He gave a loud, deep, guttural sound. Cairo covered his ears. He had remembered seeing a video once of a koala bear's surprisingly deep and fearsome bellow. This reminded him of that though it sounded a tad more melodious. A new, higher-pitched bellow, something more akin to a bird, heralded the new arrival before it was seen. Bursting from the trees above in a glorious plume of smoke came a bispin and its fur-covered warrior rider. A Fuja soldier holding the bispin's reins tight in one hand and a large bola in the other came down in a gliding gallop with the creature until it landed lightly in front of them. Cairo was dumbfounded. He'd never seen such a creature. The Fuja were new, of course, but the dazzling beauty and ferocity of the Bispin was what left him speechless. It had sharp teeth that it bared, but its body was mostly like that of a horse, and its misty glow, even now in the morning sun, was something of dreams, or nightmares, depending on which side the Bispin was taking. He supposed now it was the latter. Show me your commitment, Huntress, said Di. Your other friends aren't on our list, but your willingness to help us gather the one who is will go a long way. We will not hunt the boy and his mother again for some time once we let them go. Talia shook her head and frustrated resign. She ran toward the rider and leapt onto the saddle behind the Fuja. With a flick of the reins, the Bispin bellowed again and ran forward. As it did, Cairo saw its legs go into a floating gallop as it lifted up into the air. The smoke almost looking like a strange form of propulsion. In a moment, it was gone with its rider and Talia holding tight. Julian was in the air doing his best to hover around the area where he'd come from. He'd seen the three fall below him as he escaped into the sky. He kept debating if it was a good idea to go back, or if he should save himself for now and regroup. The image of the fearsome face that had woken him out of sleep was still seared in his mind. He could still see it like an afterimage when he closed his eyes tight. What was that? Those sharp teeth were the stuff of nightmares. And the head was so big! Had it eaten Cairo? Was he a bad friend? It had all happened so fast. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw something. Something approaching in the sky toward him. He turned to see an image that was complicated to parcel out at the speed it was coming at him. He started to fall backwards, still facing it. Was it a blue horse? With something on its back? Smoke streaming through the air? And hair flying in the wind? It was a girl behind something else. Something very large and furry riding the glowing horse. It was Talia. She was waving. His momentum slowed and he allowed the strange ensemble of disparate elements to approach. As it got closer, he could make out the look of the rider. It looked like a much smaller version of what had woken him up. Smaller than ginormous, anyway. It was spinning something over its head. A rope? He was too focused on that to see Talia's reaction as the strange rider sent the thing hurling towards him. Julian spun around to fly away. This didn't seem right. But it was too late. The rope wrapped around him with heavy weights at either end. His arms strapped to his sides, tight. The weighted balls whirled around him, and he felt himself begin to fall, obeying the laws of normal gravity. A clawed hand wrenched him up by the bola tied around him. He looked up to see the strange, furry, armor-clad warrior smiling. The Bispin snarled at him. Talia looked into his bewildered face only for a moment. Then she looked away. Through her windswept hair, Julian had seen shame in her eyes.
The Bispin trotted gracefully to the ground in front of Cairo. Though it hadn't been long, he had been terrified, having been left alone with the two large Fuja just staring at him the whole time. The smaller, more talkative one hadn't even said anything. He just glared and slowly turned his head from side to side, like he was inspecting him. Julian was dropped to the floor in ropes on the other side of the Bispin, so Cairo only saw him once he'd hit the ground. Jules, he said. Talia slid off the back of the Bispin without a word. Julian scowled at her with his cheek in the dirt. Then he shot a glance at Cairo as he struggled with his bonds. Cairo stepped forward to help him when he felt something grip his arm from behind. He only partially turned around before he felt the sensation of something clamp around his neck with a rattle. No, spoke the voice of the general. Non-lethal capture only. We cannot kill them by mistake. Cairo was whipped around by the arm to face a large Fuja, about a foot taller than him. The creature put both his hands around his neck and unlatched the strange rattling collar. Cairo got to see it as it was lifted from him and saw the strange dagger-like teeth it had. It was put away, and in a brief moment the Fuja produced a second round collar, this one a bit smaller than the one that went around his neck. It looked like a tambourine without a drumhead, but instead of brass jingles, it had sharpened stones fixed to the inside. The Fuja parted it and knelt down. The cuff snapped to his ankle with another rattle. Cairo looked down at it. It hurt, or was at least very uncomfortable. The points were sharp, and all pressed into his tendons just above his ankle in a tight circle. But they weren't quite sharp enough to break through his skin. He looked up just in time to see more Fuja coming seemingly from nowhere, snapping both Talia and Julian with braces in the same place. Julian was being lifted from the ground as they did. After it was done, they unraveled him from the bola, and he just stood there, looking at it, and then looking around. Dai spoke again. You, Vincarsi, are prisoners of the Daybreak Army. Your bounty has been set by King Orion of Dezu. You will be escorted to the king for final judgment. Afuja approached with black chained cuffs and strapped them to Cairo. They did the same to the other two as Cairo spoke up. What are the crimes? What did we do? Kosh laughed. Dai looked to Cairo. You have been charged with the willful endangerment of the people of Dezu. For this crime, you shall be brought in. The Nam people, specifically, said Kosh. Dai looked over at him with irritation. But how? Why? When did we do that? said Cairo. Kosh smirked and raised an eyebrow. He's an idiot, he said to Dai, and then to Cairo. You're an idiot. Your crime is that you simply exist. Cairo felt himself being lifted up and thrown backwards. His back hit flat metal bars with a thud as he landed on wooden slats, making up the floor of a cage. Before he knew what was happening, the barred door was being latched in front of him. Two more thuds, and Cairo looked to his left and right to see two other cages. In one slumped Talia, and in the other Julian grunted on impact and grabbed hold of his spike-cuffed ankle. Oh, jeez! Kosh approached the metal bars, and Cairo finally got a real sense of his size. He loomed over the cage before he knelt down with his hand on the cage door. I usually don't like to tell Ben Carsey this last bit, just in case they want to fight back first and find out for themselves, he said. But those are Kleinstone cuffs. Do you know what Kleinstone is? To his sides, the Fuja were latching and locking the other two cages. Cairo just looked up at Kosh's mouth moving with his sharp, glistening teeth. He'd only ever seen a creature like this talk in movies. Up close, this was all becoming much more surreal. Of course you don't, Kosh said. Here's all you really need to know. Do you like your right foot? Cairo swallowed and nodded. Well, the Kleinstones like it too, because it's pulsing with all that Vincarsi blood you have pumping through you. If you try to activate your Vincarsi powers, the Kleinstones get real excited about that. 
They might like your foot a little too much. Maybe even enough to take it off you. You understand? Cairo slowly nodded again. Kosh smiled a sharp, toothy smile. <laughs> Good. A large garrison of Fuja gradually came out from their search in the trees, as all the soldiers realized the bounties had been caught. They were large and fearsome-looking warriors, and as their numbers increased, the more hopeless the situation seemed. They gradually organized themselves and moved out with them in the cages. It was a litter held up by Fuja, with carrying poles at four corners of the back and front. The cages looked to be adaptable and latched together with metal clasps at the sides. With Cairo in the center and Talia and Julian at his left and right, the walking vehicle seemed very steady as they marched along. Ahead of them were two Bispin riders following the lead of a towering General Dai and his brother. The rest of the Fuja followed at the sides and behind them, mostly on foot, but some on Bispin and horseback. It was a long first hour of the three of them in silence. Talia wouldn't even look at Cairo or Julian, but instead sat looking to her left out of the cage bars. Her right leg was bent at the knee to keep the pressure off of the spiked Klein stones. Cairo kept looking at her to see if he could get her attention, but he couldn't. Julian was looking straight ahead, glaring with his arms folded. Cairo didn't want to get his attention, even though he knew he could. He already knew what he was thinking. The Fuja had been relatively quiet at first, too, but after a while they started up conversations with each other. Cairo had been worried about muttering to his friends and drawing attention, but now that there was a low hum of socializing, Cairo felt comfortable whispering to the young woman next to him. Talia, he said under his breath. Talia, what do we do? She still wouldn't look back at him. He saw her black hair gently lift in the wind. What are you asking her for? Came Julian's voice on the other side of him. He wasn't whispering. If she was planning something else, she would have done it already. This is the plan. Kyra looked over at him with a look of dismay. He glanced over at the Fuja who were carrying the cages. The one at Julian's front corner had his ear turned towards them. Kyra whispered, Can you not- You know what? This is so you, trusting everyone, all the time. You always think everyone has your best interest at heart, and I followed you, even though I knew. <sighs> Julian shook his head and looked away. This is so stupid. Cairo looked back to his left. Talia, what do you think? He whispered. Maybe since we're going to the castle or the king's palace or whatever, then Randall will be there, right? She'll be okay, like you said, and then we can get... You aren't making it to Muldoon, came a voice from ahead of them. Cairo looked up. Kosh's yellow eyes were looking back at them. The king's palace. He'll never let you see it. Cairo turned forward and swallowed. Uh, wh why not? Dai looked back at them briefly as he walked with heavy steps that were still surprisingly quiet. He looked ahead again, letting his smaller brother talk. Because the king doesn't need a council to judge Vincarsi. He'll make his decree after we deliver you. If he were here now, he'd sentence you with the punishment for willful endangerment. It's a capital punishment. A swirl of fire, and you're gone. I've seen it myself. Kosh... What do you get out of this? Said Dai in a somehow passive rumble. Here's the catch, though. If he makes his decree for the same crime on a Vincarsi near a crossover sanctuary, it's a different sentence. Banishment to the other side. You get to go home. He had wide eyes and an almost cheerful tone as he said it. Then he squinted an eye in consideration. Only... I've seen that sentence carried out, too, and somehow it all looks the same to me. He stared at them like he was meditative, trying to sort it out. Then a smile crept across his face. He faced forward again. Kyra was staring at the back of Kosh's horned head and hardly breathing. 
He leaned back in his cage and looked down at his Kleinstone brace. He was extremely still as he tried to just barely produce a few tiny crystals of ice on his fingertips. The Kleinstone daggers buried themselves into Cairo's skin, threatening to puncture through. He jumped as he stopped and gritted his teeth. It was no bluff. Kleinstones worked as advertised. He looked over to Talia. She was looking at him. Her head was leaning on her knee as her eyes met his. He saw them shimmer with tears before she blinked them away. Then she turned her head back to the other side, and Cairo saw her hair fall all the way down to her own cuff. Below it, small droplets of blood were just starting to soak her shoe. Chapter 23 The Red Room Raina sat at the counter in the servants' dining hall. She kept seeing the root ball disappearing and reappearing in her vision as she was going round and round on her shiny dark wooden stool. There was someone tending to things and cleaning behind the bar that hadn't been up front long enough to strike up a conversation. He was one amongst several other Nam servants doing various cleaning duties in the hall. They had breakfast there, and just recently had finished up and scattered about for the day. Raina was trying to see how fast she could go without stopping. The dining hall was quite large, and she could see Kadok inquiring about something with a waiter from across the hallway. She watched in dizzying rotations as Kadok turned his attention to her and started heading her way. You're a very busy young lady, aren't you? He said, once in earshot. Raina started to slow herself down. She felt the room continue to spin. You have spinny chairs, she said, rocking her head back and forth. We do, said Kadok. Another gift from the world on your side. Someone else who crossed over likes spinny chairs, too. Why did he ask me to do this? I can't do this, Raina said as she faced the root ball that, in her dizzied eyes, seemed to be trying to spin off the counter. It rarely seemed to sparkle anymore like she had seen in the forest with the Savern Bull. It just looked like a really tightly knotted, dirt-covered tumbleweed. If I know Orion, he must know something about what that is. He also must know something about you. You must be the lady for the job. Raina threw her head back. Ugh, but I don't want to do it. I want to find Cairo and Julian. Kadok nodded. I'm sure he has his best people on it. If the king is looking, he is sure to find. It's hard for anyone to hide from him. Raina folded her arms and frowned at the thing. How about I help you to get started with this? He said. What do you know about it? That it's sometimes pretty but it's mostly gross, she said. Kadok chuckled. Okay, and what else? Raina frowned. It makes me sad. Sad? Kadok asked. Yeah, it makes me sad when I look at it sometimes. Sometimes it seems happy, and other times, or most of the time, it seems sad. Kadok tilted his head. You mean like it's a person? Or an animal? I guess, said Reyna. When the pieces were glowing in the woods, it made me really sad. Like I was losing someone. Losing someone? Yeah, like maybe someone died. Hmm. Kadok's brow furrowed. So it seemed like it was talking to you, telling you something sad? Yeah, I think so, she said. It was a little like talking to Prince, except I can understand what he says better. But this, it's like I can only get an idea of how it feels. 
and it feels too many things at once. Rena made a face like she was a bit surprised at herself. Huh. That sounds weird, huh? Kadok looked up and to the side. No, not really. I've known Vincarsi of all sorts. They're capable of great things. Much greater than Nam. I've seen them read minds, talk to animals like you. I've even seen them help the sick by talking to the... What did Harper call them? Miniature... Mi micro... The small creatures inside a person that cause disease. Bacteria? Raina said. Sure, I think Harper called them that. I'm sure if you try and go with what comes natural, then things will start to make sense. Hmm. Raina said, looking at the ball. Why don't you enjoy the castle like you always do, and just take it with you? He said. See if it says anything else. I'm going to name him Ugly Ramen, she said. Ugly Ramen? <laughs> said Kadok. I might shorten it, said Reyna. But for now, yeah, it's Ugly Ramen, because it looks like Ugly Ramen. And it makes me feel better if it's going to keep trying to make me sad. Kadok grinned. <laughs> I'm not sure what Ramen is, but that sounds good to me. Sometime later in the day, Reyna was wandering the halls with Prince. She carried Ugly Ramen under her arm. She had started carrying it with a bit less reverence than she had when she was first tasked with its safekeeping, but it didn't seem to be damaged. The roots seemed brittle, sometimes, but were surprisingly flexible and didn't seem to break under careless strain. Several times, Reyna had tried to talk to some of the servant kids, but while they worked, they seemed fairly focused on whatever their task was. That's not to say they weren't friendly. It was just clear that they had been taught by their parents to focus on whatever work they had been given. Reyna caught sight of one little pointy-eared girl with the skin color of a pear that she saw laughing as she followed her mother. She thought this was surprising because she was very small, perhaps five or six, and she was struggling to carry something. It was brown and gray and whiter than the small girl's body as she wrapped her arms around it as best she could. The object looked almost like a scaly stone. But if it was a stone, there's no way a girl her size could be carrying it. She trailed behind her mother, who seemed to have made it into some kind of game. She was also carrying scaly stones, two in each arm and one balanced between them. She was feigning like she was going to drop them with a smile. Reyna followed them at a distance for some time, until they reached a door she hadn't seen before. It was almost at the edge of a hallway in a dark corner, strangely placed for where a room ought to be. The pear-skinned mother, who Reyna noticed did not have pointy ears like her daughter, balanced all three scaly stones on one arm and reached into a pocket to produce a set of keys. She unlocked the door, and her daughter happily went inside. Her mother held the door open with her foot and backed in with her arms full. She saw Reyna over her load of stacked goods and gave her a smile as she went in, the door closing behind her. Reyna walked over to the door and hesitated. Then she tried the handle. It was locked. Reyna had seen many doors like this in the castle. She had tried a lot of handles. Some opened and she could wander and explore, while others were locked. She hadn't really been told to stay out of any particular room or area. The doors seemed to dictate this for her. This one seemed to have automatically locked. She didn't think the woman had enough time to have locked it behind her. She looked around and spotted exactly what she had been looking for. Whenever she encountered doors like this, she wanted to know if her secret passageways could get her behind them. She just had to find a nearby earmark for a secret entrance. And there it was. At the edge of the hallway, very close, was a familiar misshapen indentation in the wood. Prince continued to balance on Raina's shoulder as she slipped down into the dark passageway under the floor. Lighting was always interesting in the passages. It was always dark with just enough light streaming in from somewhere. 
It could be a part in the wood slats with light entering from a room to the side, or above, or even sometimes below. At night, many of the rooms often had torches or lamps lighting them, so ultimately there was always just enough light to get around. It was like they were designed that way. It quickly became clear the hallway was not going to take her where she wanted to go. Prince ran down her arm and scouted ahead, turning a corner that led away from the direction she imagined the locked room would be. She huffed as she turned the corner after Prince and saw something move. She froze. It was a ways down the corridor, but something had definitely moved. Hello? She whispered. Silence. Hello? She said, a bit louder this time. She couldn't be too loud. She didn't want anyone to find out she was in the walls. I can see you. She said. She couldn't. There wasn't any more movement. No shapes. But she was pretty sure she saw something. She looked to Prince, who was sniffing the air. She asked him through a short, high squeak if he'd seen anything, though the question was much more simplified. Prince said nothing back and ventured farther. She followed him, confident in her small friend. The corridor had stairs that went down a short ways, followed by several turns. She approached a fork where she could head left or right. Prince took a left ahead of her, and she looked in his direction as he scampered toward a soft light coming in from a room down the way. She looked right and saw... something. It was at the end of the hallway. The wall. Was it... painted? Maybe it was cracked. Really cracked. It looked like giant black splotches that expanded outwards toward the wall's edges. Raina walked forward. That couldn't be a crater, right? Wall damage would be the same color as the wall, which was an off-white. Maybe the cracks weren't indentations at all. Was it raised? She kept stepping slowly towards it as her eyes kept trying to adjust and make it out in the dim light. The large black splotch trembled. A shiver went down her spine. She watched as it shifted and animated like crayon scribbles on a toddler's piece of paper that had sprung to life. She could only glimpse the shape of it for a moment. In a slinking motion, it disappeared around the corner. Light from the hall had caught it for a split second. She could see the surface of it was a soot gray black. The shape was made visible. An arm? An elbow, perhaps? Maybe. Made not of skin, but something wiry. Spindly. Her breath caught in her throat. She turned around and started to sprint. Prince was on his hind legs again, sniffing in her direction. When he saw the girl coming towards him, he turned and darted in the same direction. Raina pulled the root ball out from under her arm and held it in front of her as she ran. Her footfalls made the floorboards creak. She didn't care who heard her now. She was about to scream. Something was in her secret place. No one knew she was in here. She didn't even know how many people knew about the passages. How would they find her? Would she be caught in the walls forever? Would they even find her body? She passed the light coming in through the slats in the hallway. She looked down at Prince running faster at her feet and saw the straight lines of the slats get interrupted by a square shadow before they turned into lines again. She passed it and saw the same shadow cast on her legs. A door, a side door. She almost slid to a stop and squeaked quickly at Prince before turning back around. She was terrified to look back down the hall. She expected to see something chasing her. There wasn't. But she kept her eyes on the end of the hall where the thing had turned the corner just in case it came back. She grabbed at the wall, trying to find a way to open it. The secret doors on the side walls were tricky. They always had a latch on them, but they also were camouflaged, 
So you had to get your fingers into the wood indentation and figure out how the shape unfolded into a handle that you could turn and pull. She scrambled for it, looking over her shoulder again and again at the end of the hall. With a click of the latch and a shove, Raina fell into the light, the root ball rolling from her hands and into the center of the room. The door opened upwards and destabilized something above her. Prince shot through the corner of the exit and jumped out of the way as something fell. Raina scrambled herself and tucked her feet in so nothing could grab them. She slammed the door behind her and latched it shut. Panting, she leaned back on her elbows and shimmied backwards from the door until she hit something on the floor. Ow! She turned around. She squinted at the light coming from the small window above. The room was small, but tall. It had red walls that were covered in... Pictures of black velvet? Portraits wrapped in black velvet? She stood up. What was this room? She looked down and saw Prince sniffing the thing her elbow had just smacked. It was a portrait, face down on the floor. She must have knocked it down when she came in. She leaned over and picked it up. It was a little over half the length of her body, but the frame wasn't too heavy. The black drape slid from it and fell to the ground on the prince, who squeaked. Raina pulled it off of him and put her hand out for him to climb up. He made his way to her shoulder as she flipped the frame around. Raina's eyebrows furrowed. Her eyes slowly widened as she dropped the frame involuntarily. It scared Prince and he ran behind her neck before exiting to the other shoulder. She knelt down and picked the frame up again. She stared. She couldn't stop staring. It was enough that somehow she forgot all about her fear in the passageways. She forgot, despite the fact that at that moment, inside the wall behind her, something slid past in the dimly lit corridor. Chapter 24 The Portrait Raina sat outside the door, leaning her back against the wall and bouncing her foot nervously. The portrait was leaning next to her. She could hear muffled conversation before the large door to the king's room opened. Kadok came out. He looked stressed. The door closed with a soft thud behind him. He looked over at the young girl looking up at him. Kadok smiled. I know I said days, but he's too stubborn to stay down. Same as he ever was. He needs to rest a bit more. Can you try to convince him of that for me? Raina nodded. Kadok nodded back before making his way down the torch-lit hallway. Raina stood up, facing the closed door. She looked at the portrait that was still leaning face-first against the wall. She reached for it, and then stopped. She straightened her dress. She reached for it again. She stopped again. She looked at the door. Her hand lifted to knock. She paused. She looked at the back of the leaning portrait again. With a sigh, she finally rapped on the door four times. Come in, came the muffled response. Raina pushed the door open with a creak. There the king sat at his desk. A blanket wrapped around his shoulders as he hunched over, scribbling something down furiously before he looked back at her. He smiled at the image of the girl as she walked in. <coughs> Raina! He turned to face her in his chair and laced his fingers together between his legs. He looked a bit wet. Are you shivering? she asked. Orion's smile was clattering. How does that work? she said. The king chuckled. The caterpillar is a funny thing, he said. It makes you feel a deep 
cold. Or maybe it's a fever. In any case, it tends to give you chills. Seems like a bad thing, but it just means it's working. Reyna was looking skeptical. Orion cleared his throat. <clears throat> so, what did... He was chattering again. Did you discover anything with that little item I tasked you with? Reyna frowned. His name is Ugly Ramen, and no, he is very complicated, and I don't know where to start. But I... You named him, though, huh? Like your mouse? That's something. You think it's a he? You think it's a life? Reyna was disheartened. No, I, I mean, maybe. I was trying to... Kadok told me you felt something from it. Something like different moods. Can you tell me about that? I'm not here to... Because if you've had a breakthrough like that, you're already operating better than the lead scientist I've had working on it so far. He trailed off as he saw Reyna march out of the room. She came back around the corner with a portrait. She turned it around to face him. Who is this? She said. She had a firmness to her voice. Orion stared at the picture in the frame. Looking back at him was the haunting face of a woman. A stunningly beautiful woman. She was Asian, with green to hazel eyes, and a bright smile that somehow seemed the slightest bit sad. She wore a silver crown that matched her silver satin gloves. She wore a dress of bright white with curved stripes of silver gray. The room was quiet while the eyes held the king captive. Where did you get this? The king said after a long silence. Tell me who this is, said Reyna softly. Where did you get this, Reyna? The king sounded more forceful now his eyes still not leaving the portrait. Tell me who it is, she shot back. I need to know who showed you this right now. I found a room. It was in a room, okay? Now tell me. The king looked up at her with hurt disbelief in his eyes. You weren't allowed in that room. How did you get in? No one is allowed in there. I need to know who is in this picture, Reyna said flatly. Why? Because I'm in this picture! Orion froze and stared at her. That's me! She leaned the frame towards herself so she could point. There in the delicately decorated hands of the woman was a carefully wrapped newborn infant. Its eyes were barely opened with nothing showing through the coverings but a face looking so contented you could almost see it smile. That's my white and gray striped blanket, said Reyna. It's soft and it's fluffy and it's still on the rock my dad found me on as a baby. I sleepwalk to it every night. Orion moved his palms to his knees gripping them tightly. He looked at the picture. His breathing was heavy, but silent. My dad found me on an island when he was young, she said. He had just starred in his first big movie. Islands were cheaper than he thought, and he wanted to impress his friends, so he bought one. It was empty, and too small to have anyone else living there other than him. While he was exploring it to decide where to build his summer home, he said he thought he was losing his mind when he heard a baby crying. Rena's eyes welled up with tears. She looked at the painting and pointed again. I was wrapped up and I was alone and I was in this fluffy blanket. It's even in my baby pictures. Rena got behind the picture frame and held it at its top corners. So if that's me, she moved her finger slowly to the woman's red-hued lips. Then who is this? Orion stared at the face she pointed to. The hazel eyes seemed to insist the answer to the question. He looked up at Reyna. Silently, 
Tears were streaming down her face. The king looked down. He sighed and shook his head. Rena watched as he slowly stood and walked up to her. She felt his arms wrap around her over the picture frame. Orion squeezed her to his still shivering chest. His next words she felt in his bosom with one ear and heard them with the other. That is my wife. As he dropped to his knees in front of her, his eyes met hers before they roved about her face. And against all odds, you... You are my perfect little piece of her that's come back to me. Rena's shoulders bounced in sobs as she found herself falling back into his arms. They both held each other and wept there, Orion on his knees and the portrait of the past between them. Orion's lips kissed the top of Rena's forehead. As he did, the memories he so resisted came rushing back. He remembered kissing the smooth crown of his newborn baby girl all those years ago. End of the Cinders of Dezu. If you have enjoyed this story to the end, I cannot express the depth of my gratitude to you for listening to the Cinders of Dezu. Thank you for joining me on this journey through a perilous world. If you are worried about Cairo, Talia, or Julian, or want to know how things end up with Reyna and Orion, don't worry, the story will continue. Like, subscribe, and follow me at Tonic Torrance on Instagram and Facebook. Support this book and my continued writing through Patreon, or buy me a coffee. More tales are coming, so stay subscribed and stick around. I have more stories to tell you. <laughs>